Section Zero of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Servasi. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part One, by August Escoffier, translated by James B. Herndon Jr. Preface. If the art of cookery in all its branches were not undergoing a process of evolution, and if its canons could be once and forever fixed, as are those of certain scientific operations and mathematical procedures, the present work would have no raison d'etre, inasmuch as there already exist several excellent culinary textbooks in the English language. But everything is so unstable in these times of progress at any cost, and social customs and methods of life alter so rapidly that a few years now suffice to change completely the face of usages which at their inception bade fair to outlive the age, so enthusiastically were they welcomed by the public. In regard to the traditions of the festal board, it is but twenty years ago since the ancestral English customs began to make way before the newer methods, and we must look to the great impetus given to traveling by steam traction and navigation in order to account for the gradual but unquestionable revolution. In the wake of the demand came the supply. Palatial hotels were built. Sumptuous restaurants were opened, both of which offered their customers luxuries undreamt of theretofore in such establishments. Modern society contracted the habit of partaking of light suppers in these places, after the theatres of the metropolis had closed, and the well-to-do began to flock to them on Sundays, in order to give their servants the required weekly rest. And since restaurants allow of observing, and of being observed, since they are eminently adapted to the exhibiting of magnificent dresses, it was not long before they entered into the life of fortune's favorites." But these new-fangled habits had to be met by novel methods of cookery, better adapted to the particular environment which they were to be practiced. The admirable productions popularized by the old masters of the culinary art of the preceding century did not become the light and more frivolous atmosphere of restaurants, were, in fact, ill-suited to the brisk waiters and their customers who only had eyes for one another." The pompous splendor of those bygone dinners, served in the majestic dining halls of manors and palaces by liveried footmen, was part and parcel of the etiquette of courts and lordly mansions. It is eminently suited to state dinners, which are in sooth veritable ceremonies, possessing their ritual, traditions, and one might even say their high priests. But it is a mere hindrance to the modern rapid service. The complicated and sometimes heavy menus would be unwelcome to the hypercritical appetites so common nowadays. Hence the need of a radical change not only in the culinary preparations themselves, but in the arrangements of the menus and the service. Circumstances ordained that I should be one of the movers in this revolution, and that I should manage the kitchens of two establishments which have done most to bring it about. I therefore venture to suppose that a book containing a record of all the changes which have come into being in kitchen work, changes whereof I am in a great part author, may have some chance of a good reception at the hands of the public, i.e., at the hands of those very members of it who have profited by the changes I refer to. For it was only with the view of meeting the many and persistent demands for such a record that the present volume was written. I had at first contemplated the possibility of including only new recipes in this formulary, but it should be borne in mind that the changes that have transformed kitchen procedure during the last twenty-five years could not all be classed under the head of new recipes. For, apart from the fundamental principles of the science, which we owe to Karam, and which will last as long as cooking itself. 
scarcely one old-fashioned method has escaped the necessary new moulding required by modern demands for fear of giving my work an incomplete appearance therefore i had to refer to these old-fashioned practices and to include among my new recipes those of the former which most deserved to survive but it should not be forgotten that in a few years judging from the rate at which things are going the publication of a fresh selection of recipes may become necessary i hope to live long enough to see this accomplished in order that i may follow the evolution started in my time and add a few more original creations to those i have already had the pleasure of seeing adopted despite the fact that the discovery of new dishes grows daily more difficult but novelty is the universal cry novelty by hook or by crook it is an exceedingly common mania among people of inordinate wealth to exact incessantly new or so-called new dishes sometimes the demand comes from a host whose luxurious table has exhausted all the resources of the modern cook's repertory and who having partaken of every delicacy and often had too much of good things anxiously seeks new sensations for his blasé palate anon we have a hostess anxious to outshine friends with whom she has been invited to dine and whom she afterwards invites to dine with her novelty it is the prevailing cry it is imperiously demanded by every one for all that the number of alimentary substances is comparatively small the number of their combinations is not infinite and the amount of raw material placed either by art or by nature at the disposal of a cook does not grow in proportion to the whims of the public what feats of ingenuity have we not been forced to perform at times in order to meet our customers wishes those only who have had charge of a large modern kitchen can tell the tale personally I have ceased counting the nights spent in the attempt to discover new combinations when, completely broken with the fatigue of a heavy day, my body ought to have been at rest. Yet, the chef who has had the felicity to succeed in turning out an original and skillful preparation approved by his public and producing a vogue cannot, even for a time, claim the monopoly of his secret discovery or derive any profit therefrom the painter sculptor writer and musician are protected by law so are inventors but the chef has absolutely no redress for plagiarism on his work on the contrary the more the latter is liked and appreciated the more will people clamor for his recipes many hours of hard work perhaps underlie his latest creation if it have reached the desired degree of perfection he may have forfeited his recreation and even his night's rest and have labored without a break over his combination and as a reward he finds himself compelled morally at least to convey the result of his study to the first person who asks and who very often subsequently claims the invention of the recipe to the detriment of the real author's chances and reputation this frantic love of novelty is also responsible for many of the difficulties attending the arrangement of menus for very few people know what an arduous task the composing of a perfect menu represents the majority even of those who are accustomed to receptions and the giving of dinners suppose that a certain routine alone is necessary together with some culinary practice, in order to write a menu, and few imagine that a good deal more is needed than the mere inscription of courses upon a slip of pasteboard. In reality, the planning of these elementary programs is among the most difficult problems of our art, and it is in this very matter that perfection is so rarely reached. In the course of more than forty years' experience as a chef, I have been responsible for thousands of menus, some of which have since become classical and have ranked among the finest served in modern times, and I can safely say 
that in spite of the familiarity such a period of time ought to give one with the work, the setting up of a presentable menu is rarely accomplished without lengthy labor and much thought, and for all that the result is not always to my satisfaction. From this it may be seen how slender are the claims of those who, without any knowledge of our art, and quite unaware of the various properties belonging to the substances we use, pretend to arrange a proper menu. However difficult the elaboration of a menu may be, it is but the first, and by no means the only difficulty, which results from the rapidity with which meals are served nowadays. The number of dishes set before the diners being considerably reduced, and the dishes themselves having been deprived of all the advantages which their sumptuous decorations formerly lent them, they must recover, by means of perfection and delicacy, sufficient in the way of quality to compensate for their diminished bulk and reduced splendor. They must be faultless in regard to quality. They must be savory and light. The choice of the raw material, therefore, is a matter demanding vast experience on the part of the chef, for the old French adage which says that la sauce va passer le poisson has long since ceased to be true, and if one do not wish to court disapprobation, often well earned, the fish should not be in the slightest degree inferior to its accompanying sauce. While on the subject of raw material, I should like, en passant, to call attention to a misguided policy which seems to be spreading in private houses and even in some commercial establishments. I refer to the custom which, arising as it doubtless does from a mistaken idea of economy, consists of entrusting the choice of kitchen provisions to people unacquainted with the profession, and who, never having used the goods which they have to buy, are able to judge only very superficially of their quality or real value, and cannot form any estimate of their probable worth after the cooking process. If economy were verily the result of such a policy, none would object to it. But the case is exactly the reverse, for in the matter of provisions, as in all commercial matters, the cheapest is the dearest in the end. To obtain good results, good material in a sufficient quantity must be used, and in order to obtain good material, the latter should be selected by the person who is going to use it, and who knows its qualities and properties. Amphitryons, who set aside these essential principles, may hope in vain to found a reputation for their tables. It will be seen that the greater part of the titles in this work have been left in French. I introduced, or rather, promulgated this system because, since it is growing every day more customary to write menus in French, it will allow those who are unacquainted with the language to accomplish the task with greater ease. Moreover, many of the titles, especially those of recent creations, are quite untranslatable. As the index, however, is in English, and in every case the order number of each recipe accompanies the number of the page where it is to be found, no confusion can possibly arise. I have also allowed certain French technical terms, for which there exist no English equivalents, to remain in their original form, and these will be found explained in a glossary at the end of the book. I preferred to do this rather than strain the meaning of certain English words, in order to fit them to a slightly unusual application, and in so doing I only followed a precedent which has been established on a more or less large scale by such authors of English books on French cooking as Francatelli, Goffet, Ranhofer, etc. But the example for such verbal adoptions was set long ago in France, where sporting and other terms, for which no suitable native words could be found, were borrowed wholesale from the English language and gallicized. It is therefore not unreasonable to apply the principle to terms in cookery which, though plentiful and varied in France, are scarce in this country. 
to facilitate the reading of the recipes, all the words which are not in common use and of which the explanation will be found in the glossary are italicized in the text. In concluding this preface, which, I fear, has already overreached the bounds I intended for it, I should like to thank those of my lady clients as well as many English epicures whose kind appreciation has been conducive to the writing of this work. I trust they will favor the latter with the generous consideration of which they have so frequently given the author valuable proofs, and for which he is glad of an opportunity of expressing his deep gratitude. End of section zero. Recording by Marion Servasi. Section number one of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janie Speaks. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part One, by August Escoffier. Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Part One Fundamental Elements of Cooking. Chapter One Fond de Cuisine. Before undertaking the description of the different kinds of dishes whose recipes I purpose giving in this work, it will be necessary to reveal the groundwork whereon these recipes are built. And although this has already been done again and again, and is wearisome in the extreme, a textbook on cooking that did not include it would be not only incomplete, but in many cases incomprehensible. Notwithstanding the fact that it is the usual procedure in matters culinary to insist upon the importance of the part played by stock, I feel compelled to refer to it at the outset of this work and to lay even further stress upon what has already been written on the subject. Indeed, stock is everything in cooking, at least in French cooking. Without it, nothing can be done. If one's stock is good, what remains of the work is easy. If, on the other hand, it is bad or merely mediocre, it is quite hopeless to expect anything approaching a satisfactory result. The workman, mindful of success, therefore, will naturally direct his attention to the faultless preparation of his stock, and in order to achieve this result, he will find it necessary not merely to make use of the freshest and finest goods, but also to exercise the most scrupulous care in their preparation, for, in cooking, care is half the battle. Unfortunately, no theories, no formulae, and no recipes, however well written, can take the place of practical experience in the acquisition of a full knowledge concerning this part of the work, the most important, the most essential, and certainly the most difficult part. In the matter of stock, it is, above all, necessary to have a sufficient quantity of the finest materials at one's disposal. The master or mistress of a house who stints in this respect thereby deliberately forfeits his or her right to make any remark whatsoever to the chef concerning his work, for let the talent or merits of the latter be what they may, they are crippled by insufficient or inferior material. It is just as absurd to exact excellent cooking from a chef whom one provides with defective or scanty goods, as to hope to obtain wine from a bottled decoction of logwood. The principal kinds of fond de cuisine, foundation sauces, and stocks. The principal kinds of fond de cuisine are 1. Ordinary and clarified consommes. 2. The browned stock, or estouffade, game stocks, the bases of thickened gravies, and of brown sauces. 
3. White stock. Basis of white sauces. 4. Fish stock. 5. The various essences of poultry, game, fish, etc. The complements of small sauces. 6. The various glazes for meat, game, and poultry. 7. The basic sauces. Espagnol, velouté, bechamel, tomato, and hollandaise. 8. The savory jellies or aspects of old-fashioned cooking. To these kinds of stock, which, in short, represent the buttresses of the culinary edifice, must now be added the following preparations, which are, in a measure, the auxiliaries of the above. 1. The roux, the cohering element in sauces. 2. The mirepoix and matignon, aromatic and flavoring elements. 3. The court bouillon and the blancs. 4. The various stuffings. 5. The marinades. 6. The various garnishes for soups, for relevés, for entrees, etc. Duxelle, Duchesse, Dauphine, Pâté à choux, Frying batters, Various salpicons, Profiteroles, Royal Zeuf, Filets, Diablotti, Paste, etc. 1. Ordinary or White Consomme. Quantities for making 4 quarts 3 pounds of shin of beef, 3 pounds of lean beef, 1 and a half pounds of fowl's carcasses. 1 pound of carrots, a half a pound of turnips, 3 quarter pound of leeks and 1 stick of celery, a quarter pound of parsnips, 1 medium sized onion with a clove stuck in it. Preparation Put the meat into a stock pot of suitable dimensions after having previously strung it together. Add the poultry carcass, five quarts of water, and one half ounce of gray salt. Place the stock pot on a moderate fire in such a manner that it may not boil too quickly, and remember to stir the meat from time to time. Under the influence of the heat, the water gradually reaches the interior of the meat, where, after having dissolved the liquid portions, it duly combines with them. These liquid portions contain a large proportion of albumen, and as the temperature of the water rises, this substance has a tendency to coagulate. It also increases in volume and, by virtue of its lightness, escapes from the water and accumulates on the surface in the form of scum. Carefully remove this scum as it forms and occasionally add a little cold water before the boil is reached in order that, the latter being retarded, a complete expulsion of the scum may be effected. The clearness of the consomme largely depends upon the manner in which this skimming has been carried out. Then the vegetable garnishing is added. The scum from these is removed, as in the previous case, and the edge of the stock pot should be carefully wiped to the level of the fluid so as to free it from the deposit which has been formed there. The stock pot is then moved to a corner of the fire where it may continue cooking slowly for four or five hours. At the end of this time, it should be taken right away from the fire, and, after a half a pint of cold water has been added to its contents, it should be left to rest a few minutes, with a view to allowing the grease to accumulate on the surface of the liquid, whence it must be carefully removed before the consomme is strained. 
This last operation is effected by a means of a very fine strainer placed on top of a white tureen, clean and wide, which should then be placed in a draft to hasten the cooling of the consomme. The tureen should not on any account be covered, and this more particularly in summer, when rapid cooling is a precautionary measure against fermentation. Remarks upon the different causes which combine to influence the quality of a consomme. It will be seen that I have not made any mention in the above formula of the meat and the vegetables which have helped to make the consomme, my reason being that it is preferable to remove them from the stock pot only after the broth has been strained so as not to run the risk of disturbing the latter. The quality of the meat goes a long way towards settling the quality of the consomme. In order that the latter be perfect, it is essential that the meat used should be that of comparatively old animals whose flesh is well set and rich in flavor. This is a sine qua non, and the lack of meat coming from old animals in England accounts for the difficulty attaching to the making of good consomme and savory sauces in this country. Cattle in England are killed at an age varying from three to four years at the most. The meat thus obtained has no equal for the purpose of roasts and grills, and anything approaching it is rarely met with on the continent. But when this same meat is used for boiling or braising, it does not contain enough juice or flavor to yield a satisfactory result. This shortcoming is furthermore aggravated by a fault that many commit who are employed in the making of consommes and stock. The fault in question consists in cooking the bones simultaneously with the meat. Now to extract that gelatinous element from bone which produces the mellowness characteristic of all good consommes, it is necessary that the gelatinous bodies should be cooked for twelve hours at least, and even after that time has elapsed they are still not entirely spent. On the continent the quality of the meat easily compensates for this technical error, but such is certainly not the case in England, where five hours stewing only results in a flat and insipid consomme. I therefore believe that, in the case of either consomme or stock, the formulae of which I shall give later, it would be advisable for the bones to stew at least twelve hours, and this only after they have been well broken up, while the quantity of water used should be so calculated as to suffice exactly for the immersion of the meat that must follow. The contents of this first stock pot should include half of the vegetables mentioned, and the consomme thus obtained, after having been strained and cooled, will take the place of the water in the recipe in accordance with the directions I have given above. The Uses of White Consomme White consomme is used in the preparation of clarified consommes, in which case it undergoes a process of clarifying, the directions for which will be given later. It also serves as the liqueur for thick soups, poached fowls, etc. It must be limpid, as colorless as possible, and very slightly salted, for whatever the use may be for which it is intended, it has to undergo a process of concentration. 2. The preparation of clarified consomme for clear soups. Quantities for making 4 quarts. 5 quarts of ordinary consomme, 1 and 1 half pounds of very lean beef, the white of an egg, 1 fowl's carcass, roasted if possible. First, mince the beef and pound it in a mortar with the fowl's carcass and the white of an egg, adding a little cold white consomme. 
put the whole into a tall, narrow, and thick-bottomed stewpan. Then gradually add the cold white broth from which all grease has been removed, that the whole may be well mixed. Then the stewpan may be put on the fire and its contents thoroughly stirred for fear of their burning at the bottom. When boiling point is reached, move the stew pan to a corner of the fire so that the soup may only simmer, for anything approaching the boil would disturb the contents. A good hour should be enough to properly finish the consomme, and any longer time on the fire would be rather prejudicial than the reverse, as it would probably impair the flavor of the preparation. Now, Carefully remove what little grease may have collected on the surface of the consomme and strain the latter through muslin into another clean stew pan. It is now ready for the addition of the garnishes that are to form part of it, which I shall enumerate in due course. Remarks upon clarifications. For clarified consommes, even more than for the ordinary kind, it is eminently advisable that the meat should be that of old animals. Indeed, it is safe to say that one pound of meat coming from an animal of eight years will yield much better consomme than two pounds would coming from a fattened animal of about three or four years. The consomme will be stronger mellower and certainly more tasty as the flesh of young animals has absolutely no richness of flavor it will be seen that i do not refer to any vegetable for the clarification if the white consomme has been well carried out it should be able to dispense with all supplementary flavoring and the customary error of cooks being rather to overdo the quantity of vegetables, even to the extent of disguising the natural aroma of the consomme, I prefer to entirely abandon the idea of vegetable garnishes in clarifications, and thus avoid a common stumbling block. 3. Chicken Consomme White chicken consomme is prepared in exactly the same way as ordinary white consomme. There need only be added to the meat, the quantity of which may be lessened, an old hen or a cock, slightly colored on the spit or in the oven. For the clarification, the quantity of roast fowl carcasses used may be increased, provided the latter be not too fat. The process, however, is the same as in the clarification of ordinary consommes. The color of chicken consomme should be lighter than that of the ordinary kind, namely a light amber-yellow, limpid and warm. 4. Fish consomme these consommes are rarely used, for Lenten soups with a fish basis are generally thick soups, for the preparation of which the fish fumet, whereof I shall give the formula later, formula number 11, should avail. Whenever there is no definite reason for the use of an absolutely Lenten consomme, it would be advisable to resort to one of the ordinary kind, and to finish off the same by means of a good fish essence extracted from the bones of a sole or whiting. An excellent consomme is thus obtained, more palatable and less flat than the plain fish consomme. If, however, one were obliged to make a plain fish consomme, the following procedure should be adopted. Clarification of Fish Consomme Quantities for making four quarts Four and one-half quarts of ordinary fish fumet having a decided taste. 
one half pound of good fresh caviar or pressed caviar. Mode of procedure. Pound the caviar and mix the resulting pulp with the cold fish fumet. Put the whole into a saucepan, place it on the open fire, and stir with a spatula until the contents reach the boil. Then move the saucepan to a corner of the fire and let the consomme simmer gently for twenty minutes, after which strain it through muslin with great caution and keep it well covered and in the warmth so as to prevent the formation of a gelatinous film on the surface. Fish consommés are greatly improved by the addition of such aromatics as saffron or curry, both of which considerably add to their quality. 5. Game consommé The necks, breasts, and shoulders of venison and of hare old wild rabbits old pheasants and old partridges may be used in the production of game consommes an ordinary consomme may likewise be made in which half the beef can be replaced by veal and to which may be added while clarifying a succulent game essence this last method is even preferable when dealing with feathered game but in either case it is essential that the meat used should be half roasted beforehand in order to strengthen the fumet. The formula that I give below must therefore only be looked upon as a model, necessarily alterable according to the resources at one's disposal, the circumstances, and the end in view. Quantities for making four quarts of plain game consomme. Three pounds of neck, shoulder, or breast of venison. One and a half pounds of hair trimmings. One old pheasant or two partridges. Four ounces of sliced carrots browned in butter. Half a pound of mushrooms likewise browned in butter, one medium-sized leek and two sticks of celery, one bunch of herbs with extra thyme and bay leaves, one onion, oven browned, with two cloves stuck into it, liquor, five and one-half quarts of water, seasoning, one ounce of salt, and a few peppercorns, these to be added ten minutes previous to straining the consomme. Time allowed for cooking, three hours. Mode of procedure, proceed in exactly the same way as for ordinary consommes, taking care only to half roast the meat, as I pointed out above, before putting it in the stew pan. The Clarification of Game Consommes The constituents of the clarification of game consommes vary according to the kind of consomme desired. If it is to have a partridge flavor, one partridge should be allowed for each quart of the consomme, whereas if its flavor is to be that of the pheasant, half an old pheasant will be required per each quart of the liquid. Lastly, in the case of plain game consommes, one pound of lean venison, hare, or wild rabbit should be allowed for each quart of the required consomme. Mode of Procedure Whatever be the kind of game used, the latter must be thoroughly boned and the meat well pounded together with the white of an egg per four quarts of consomme. About two ounces per quart of dried mushrooms should now be added if they can be procured, 
while the bones and the remains or carcasses of game should be browned in the oven and completely drained of all grease the whole can now be mixed with the cold game consomme the clarification is then put over an open fire stirring incessantly the while and as soon as the boil is reached the saucepan must be moved to a corner of the fire where its contents may gently boil for three quarters of an hour the fat should then be removed and the consomme strained through muslin after which cover up until wanted six special consommes for suppers the consommes whose formulae i have just given are intended more particularly for dinners they are always finished off by some kind of garnish which besides lending them an additional touch of flavor gives them their special and definite character when they are served up in the diner's plate but the case is otherwise with the consommes served for suppers these being only served in cups either hot or cold do not allow of any garnishing since they are to be drunk at table they must therefore be perfect in themselves delicate and quite clear these special consommes are made in a similar manner to the others though it is needful to slightly increase the quantity of meat used for the clarification and to add to that clarification the particular flavor mentioned on the menu to wit a few stalks of celery if the consomme is a celery one a small quantity of curry if the consomme is given as a l'indienne or a few old roast partridges if it is to be termed consomme au fumé de perdreau and so on the means by which one may vary the aroma of consommes are legion but it is highly important what aroma soever be used that the latter be not too pronounced it ought only to lend a distinctive and at the same time subtle finish to the consomme which besides sharpening the latter should increase its succulence when the consomme is served cold it ought to have the qualities of an extremely light and easily melting jelly barely firm but when it is too liquid it rarely gives that sensation of perfection and succulence to the palate of the consumer which the latter expects when too firm and too gelatinous it is positively disagreeable therefore if it is to be relished it should be just right in respect of consistency end of section one recording by Janie Speaks, who can be found at janiespeaks.com. Section number two of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janie Speaks. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part One, by Auguste Escoffier, translated by James B. Herndon Jr. Seven, brown stock or estouffade. Four pounds of shin of beef, flesh and bone. 4 pounds of shin of veal, flesh and bone, half a pound of lean raw ham, half a pound of fresh pork rind rinsed in tepid water, three quarter pound of minced carrots browned in butter, three quarter pound of minced onions browned in butter, 
one faggot containing a little parsley, a stick of celery, a small sprig of thyme, and a bay leaf. Preparation Bone and string the meat and keep it in readiness for the morrow. Break the bones as finely as possible, and, after having besprinkled them with a little stock fat, brown them in an oven. Also, stir them repeatedly. When they are slightly browned, put them in a conveniently large saucepan with the carrots, the onions, and the faggot. Add five quarts of cold water, and put the saucepan on an open fire to boil. As soon as the boil is reached, skim carefully. Wipe the edge of the saucepan, put the lid half on, and allow the stock to cook gently for twelve hours. Then roughly remove the fat, pass the liquid through a sieve, and let it cool. This being done, Put the meat in a saucepan, just large enough to hold it. Brown it a little in some stock fat, and clear it entirely of the latter. Add half a pint of the prepared stock, cover the saucepan, and let the meat simmer on the side of the fire until the stock is almost entirely reduced. Meanwhile, the meat should have been repeatedly turned that it may be equally affected throughout. Now pour the remainder of the stock, prepared from bones, into the saucepan, bring the whole to the boil, and then move the saucepan to a corner of the fire for the boiling to continue very slowly and regularly with the lid off. As soon as the meat is well cooked, the fat should be removed from the stock, and the latter should be strained or rubbed through a sieve, after which it should be put aside to be used when required. Remarks Relative to the Making of Brown Stock Instead of stringing the meat after having boned it, if time presses, it may be cut into large cubes before browning. In this case, one hour and a half would suffice to cook it and to extract all of its juice. Whether brown or white, stock should never be salted, because it is never served in its original state. It is either reduced in order to make glazes or sauces, in which case the concentration answers the purpose of seasoning, or else it is used to cook meat, which must be salted before being cooked, and which, therefore, imparts the necessary salt to its surrounding liquor. Brown stock ought to be the color of fine burnt amber, and it must be transparent. It is used in making meat glazes after reduction, also to moisten meat for braising, and to prepare brown sauces. 8. Brown Game Stock There is no difference between the game consommes and game stock, or, otherwise stated, ordinary game consomme and brown game stock are one and the same thing. The distinction lies in the ultimate use of this preparation. It is clarified, as we have shown, Formula 5, if it be intended for a clear soup, and it is used in its original state if it is to be used for a thick game soup, for a sauce, or for reducing. 9. Brown veal stock. Brown veal stock requires the same quantities of shin and trimmings of veal as white veal stock. Formula 10. The time allowed for cooking is, however, a little shorter, and this operation may be completed within eight hours. This stock is mostly used as the liqueur for poultry and poelled game, while it may also serve in the preparation of thickened veal stock. 
Being quite neutral in taste, it lends itself to all purposes, and readily takes up the aroma of the meat with which it may happen to be combined. It is admirably suited to the poaching of quails, and nothing can supplant it in this particular. 10. White Stock, Veal, and Poultry Stock Quantities for making four quarts. Eight pounds of shin of veal, or lean and fresh veal trimmings. One or two fowl's carcasses, raw if they are handy. Twelve ounces of carrots. Six ounces of onions stuck with a clove. Five and one-half quarts of cold water. 4 ounces of leeks strung with a stick of celery, 1 faggot including 1 ounce of parsley and 1 bay leaf. Preparation Bone the shins, string the meat, break up the bones as small as possible, and put them in a stew pan with the water. Place on an open fire, allow to boil, Skim carefully, and then move to a side of the fire to cook very gently for five hours. At the end of this time, put the stock into another stew pan, add the meat and the vegetables, add water if necessary to keep the quantity of liquid at five quarts. Let it boil and allow it to cook slowly for another three hours after which remove all grease from the stock, pass the latter through a fine strainer or a colander, and put it aside until wanted. Remarks upon white stock One should contrive to make this stock as gelatinous as possible. It is therefore an indispensable measure that the bones be well broken up and cooked for at least eight hours. Veal never yields such clear stock as beef. Nevertheless, the consomme obtained from veal should not be turbid. It must, on the contrary, be kept as clear and as white as possible. Poultry stock is made by adding two old fowls to the above veal stock, and these should be put into the liquor with the meat. Fish Stock 11. White Fish Stock Quantities for making four quarts. Four pounds of trimmings and bones of sole or whiting half a pound of sliced blanched onions, two ounces of parsley, root or stalks, half a bottle of white wine. Preparation Butter the bottom of a thick, tall stewpan, put in the blanched onions and the parsley stalks, and upon these aromatics lay the fish remains. Add the juice of a lemon, cover the stew pan, put it on the fire, and allow the fish to exude its essence, jerking the pan at intervals. Moisten in the first place with the white wine. Then, with the lid off, reduce the liquid to about half. Now add four quarts of cold water, Bring to the boil, skim, and then leave to cook for 20 minutes only on a moderate fire. The time allowed is ample for the purpose of extracting the aromatic and gelatinous properties contained in the bones, and a more protracted stewing would only impair the savor of the stock. Remarks upon white fish stock the formula which I give above diverges considerably from that commonly used, 
for, as a rule, fish stock is diluted far too much and is stewed for much too long a time. I have observed that fish stock may be greatly improved by rapid cooking, and it was this consideration that led me to dilute it scantily so as to avoid prolonged reduction. It is likewise necessary to remember that in order to make perfect fish stock, only the sole or whiting should be used. In a case of emergency, however, i.e., if the supply of the latter were to run short, a quarter of their weight of brill bones might be added to them, but all other kinds of fish should be avoided in the preparation. 12. Fish Stock with Red Wine this stock is comparatively rarely used because, in practice, it is naturally obtained in the cooking of the fish itself, as, for instance, in the case of the matelotes. Be this as it may, with the recent incursion of a custom which seems to demand ever more and more the serving of fish without bones, the following formula will be worthy of interest, as it is likely that its need will henceforth be felt with increasing urgency. Fish fumé with red wine may be prepared from all fresh water fish, as well as from the remains of sole, whiting, chicken turbo, and brill. It is generally better, however, to have recourse to the bones and remains of that fish which happens to be constituting the dish, that is to say, the bones and trimmings of sole in a stock for fillet of sole, the bones and trimmings of a chicken turbo in a fumé for chicken turbo, and so on. The preparatory formula remains the same, whatever the kind of fish used may be. Quantities for making four quarts of fumé with red wine. Four pounds of bones, heads, and trimmings of the fish to be served. Three quarters pound of minced white onions. Three ounces of parsley stalks. Two bay leaves four small sprigs of thyme, and four cloves of garlic, two bottles of red wine, and five pints of water. Mode of Procedure Put all the above-mentioned ingredients in a thick and tall stew pan, boil, skim carefully, and allow to cook 20 to 30 minutes on a moderate fire. Then strain the stock through a colander into a tureen to be used when required. Remarks upon fish stock with red wine. This stock stands reduction far better than white fish stock. Nevertheless, I urge the advisability of trying to obtain the required quantity without reduction. In its preparation, one may use some mushroom pairings, as in the case of white stock, if these are handy, and they will be found to lend an agreeable flavor to the fish fumé. 13. Various Essences as their name implies, essences are stock which hold a large proportion of a substance's aroma in a concentrated form. They are, in fact, ordinary stock, only less diluted, with the idea of intensifying the flavor of the treated ingredients. Hence, their utility is nil if the stock which they are intended to finish has been reasonably and judiciously treated. 
It is infinitely simpler to make savory and succulent stock in the first place than to produce a mediocre stock and finally complete it by a specially prepared essence. The result in the first instance is better, and there is economy of time and material. The most one can do is to recommend, in certain circumstances, the use of essences extracted from particularly well-flavored products, as, for instance, mushrooms, truffles, morels, and celery. But it would be well to remember that, nine times out of ten, it is preferable to add the product itself to the stock during the preparation of the same than to prepare essences. For this reason, I do not think it necessary to dilate upon the subject of essences, the need of which should not be felt in good cooking. 14. Various Glazes the various glazes of meat, fowl, game, and fish are merely stock, reduced to the point of viscosity. Their uses are legion. Occasionally they serve in decking dishes with a brilliant and unctuous coating which makes them sightly. At other times they may help to strengthen the consistence of a sauce or other culinary preparation, while again they may be used as sauces proper after they have been correctly creamed or buttered. Glazes are distinguished from essences by the fact that the latter are only prepared with the object of extracting all the flavor of the product under treatment, whereas the former are, on the contrary, constituted by the whole base of the substance itself. They therefore have not only its savor, but also its succulence and mellowness, whereby they are superior to the essences, and cooking can but be improved by substituting them for the latter. Nevertheless, many chefs of the old school do not permit the use of glazes in culinary preparations or rather they are of the opinion that each cooking operation should produce them on its own account, and thus be sufficient unto itself. Certainly the theory is correct when neither time nor cost is limited, but nowadays the establishments are scarce where these theories may be applied, and indeed, if one does not make an abuse of glazes, and if they be prepared with care, their use gives excellent results, while they lend themselves admirably to the very complex demands of modern customs. 15. Meat Glaze Meat glaze is made by reducing brown stock, Formula 7, in a large stew pan upon an open fire. As often as the stock is appreciably reduced during ebullition, it may be transferred to smaller stew pans, taking care to strain it through muslin at each change of stew pan. The glaze may be considered sufficiently reduced when it evenly veneers a withdrawn spoon. The fire used for reducing should gradually wane as the concentration progresses, and the last phase must be effected slowly and on a moderate fire. When it is necessary to obtain a lighter and clearer glaze, the brown veal stock, formula number 9, should be reduced instead of the estafade. 16. Poultry Glaze Reduce the poultry base indicated in Formula 10 and proceed in exactly the same way as for Meat Glaze, Formula 15. 17. Game Glaze Use the game base, Formula 8, and proceed as for Meat Glaze, 
Formula 9. 18. Fish Glaze This glaze is used less often than the preceding ones. As it is only used to intensify the savor of sauces, it is sufficient for this purpose to prepare a white fish stock, Formula 11, which may be diluted with the stock already prepared, and which may be reduced according to the requirements. The name of fish fumet, or fish essence, is given to this preparation. Its flavor is more delicate than that of fish glaze, which it replaces with advantage. End of section number two. Recording by Janie Speaks, who can be found at janiespeaks.com. Section 3 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1 by Auguste Descoffier. Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 2. The Leading Warm Sources warm sauces are of two kinds the leading sauces also called mother sauces and the small sauces which are usually derived from the first named and are generally only modified forms thereof cooking stock only includes the leading sauces but i shall refer to the small hot sauces and the cold sauces at the end of the auxiliary stock experience which plays such an important part in culinary work is nowhere so necessary as in the preparation of sauces for not only must the latter flatter the palate but they must also vary in savour consistence and viscosity in accordance with the dishes they accompany by this means in a well-ordered dinner each dish differs from the preceding ones and from those that follow furthermore sauces must through the perfection of their preparation obey the general laws of a rational hygiene wherefore they should be served and combined in such wise as to allow of easy digestion by the frequently disordered stomachs of their consumers carême was quite justified in pluming himself upon the fact that during his stay at the english court his master the prince regent had assured him that he Carême was the only one among those who had served his highness whose cooking had been at all easy of digestion Carême had grasped the essential truth that the richer the cooking is the more speedily do the stomach and palate tire of it and indeed it is a great mistake to suppose that in order to do good cooking it is necessary to be prodigal in one's use of all things in reality practice dictates fixed and regular quantities and from these one cannot diverge without upsetting the hygienic and sapid equilibrium on which the value of a sauce depends the requisite quantities of each ingredient must of course be used but neither more nor less as there are objections to either extreme any sauce whatsoever should be smooth light without being liquid glossy to the eye and decided in taste when these conditions are fulfilled it is always easy to digest even for tired stomachs an essential point in the making of sauces is the seasoning and it would be impossible for me to lay sufficient stress on the importance of not indulging in any excess in this respect it too often happens that the insipidness of a badly made sauce is corrected by excessive seasoning this is an absolutely deplorable practice seasoning should be so calculated as to be merely a complementary factor which though it must throw the savour of dishes into relief may not form a recognisable part of them if it be excessive it modifies and even destroys the taste peculiar to every dish to the great detriment of the latter and of the consumer's health it is therefore desirable that each sauce should possess its own special flavour well defined 
the result of the combined flavours of all its ingredients if in the making of sauces one allowed oneself to be guided by those principles which are the very foundation of good cookery the general denunciation of sauces by the medical faculty would be averted and this denunciation no sauce deserves if it be carefully prepared conformably with the laws prescribed by practice and its resulting experience the roux the roux being the cohering element of leading sauces it is necessary to reveal its preparation and constituents before giving one's attention to the latter three kinds of roux are used namely brown roux for brown sauces pale roux for velouté or cream sauces and white roux for white sauces and bechamel nineteen brown roux quantities for making about one pound eight ounces of clarified butter nine ounces of best quality flour preparation mix the flour and butter in a very thick stewpan and put it on the side of the fire or in a moderate oven stir the mixture repeatedly so that the heat may be evenly distributed throughout the whole of its volume the time allowed for the cooking of brown roux cannot be precisely determined as it depends upon the degree of heat employed the more intense the latter the speedier will be the cooking while the stirring will of necessity be more rapid brown roux is known to be cooked when it has acquired a fine light brown colour and when it exudes a scent resembling that of the hazelnut characteristic of baked flour it is very important that brown roux should not be cooked too rapidly as a matter of fact among the various constituent elements of flour the starch alone acts as the cohering principle this starch is contained in little cells which tightly constrain it but which are sufficiently porous to permit the percolation of liquid and fatty substances under the influence of moderate heat and the infiltered butter the cells burst through the swelling of the starch and the latter thereupon completely combines with the butter to form a mass capable of absorbing six times its own weight of liquid when cooked when the cooking takes place with a very high initial heat the starch gets burned within its shrivelled cells and swelling is then possible only in those parts which have been least burned the cohering principle is thus destroyed and double or treble the quantity of roux becomes necessary in order to obtain the required consistency but this excess of roux in the sauce chokes it up without binding it and prevents it from despumating or becoming clear at the same time the cellulose and the burnt starch lend a bitterness to the sauce of which no subsequent treatment can rid it from the above it follows that starch being the only one from among the different constituents of flour which really affects the coherence of sauces there would be considerable advantage in preparing roux either from a pure form of it or from substances with kindred properties such as fecula arrowroot etc it is only habit that causes flour to be still used as the cohering element of roux and indeed the hour is not so far distant when the advantages of the changes i propose will be better understood changes which have been already recommended by favre in his dictionary with a roux well made from the purest starch in which case the volume of starch and butter would equal about half that of the flour and butter of the old method and with strong and succulent brown stock a spanish sauce or espagnole may be made in one hour and this sauce will be clearer more brilliant and better than that of the old processes which needed three days at least to despumate twenty pale roux the quantities are the same as for brown roux but cooking must cease as soon as the colour of the roux begins to change and before the appearance of any colouring whatsoever the observations i made relative to brown roux concerning the cohering element apply also to pale roux twenty one white roux 
same quantities as for brown and pale roux but the time of cooking is limited to a few minutes as it is only needful in this case to do away with the disagreeable taste of raw flour which is typical of those sauces whose roux has not been sufficiently cooked twenty two brown sauce or espagnole quantities required for four quarts one pound of brown roux dissolved in a tall thick saucepan with six quarts of brown stock or estouffade put the saucepan on an open fire and stir the sauce with a spatula or a whisk and do not leave it until it begins to boil then remove the spatula and put the saucepan on a corner of the fire letting it lean slightly to one side with the help of a wedge so that boiling may only take place at one point and that the inert principles thrown out by the sauce during despumation may accumulate high up in the saucepan whence they can be easily removed as they collect it is advisable during despumation to change saucepans twice or even three times straining every time and adding a quart of brown stock to replace what has evaporated at length when the sauce begins to get lighter and about two hours before finally straining it two pounds of fresh tomatoes roughly cut up should be added or an equivalent quantity of tomato puree and about one pound of mirepoix prepared according to formula number two hundred and twenty eight the sauce is then reduced so as to measure four quarts when strained after which it is poured into a wide tureen and must be kept in motion until quite cool lest a skin should form on its surface the time required for the despumation of an espagnole varies according to the quality of the stock and roux we saw above that one hour sufficed for a concentrated stock and starch roux in which case the mirepoix and the tomato are inserted from the first but much more time is required if one is dealing with a roux whose base is flour in the latter case six hours should be allowed provided one have excellent stock and well-made roux more often than not this work is done in two stages thus after having despumated the espagnole for six or eight hours the first day it is put on the fire the next day with half its volume of stock and it is left to despumate a few hours more before it is finally strained summing up my opinion on this subject i can only give my colleagues the following advice based upon long experience one only use strong clear stock with a decided taste two be scrupulously careful of the roux however it may be made by following these two rules a clear brilliant and consistent espagnole will always be obtained in a fairly short time twenty three half glaze this is the espagnole sauce having reached the limit of perfection by final despumation it is obtained by reducing one quart of espagnole and one quart of first-class brown stock until its volume is reduced to nine-tenths of a quart it is then put through a strainer into a bain-marie of convenient dimensions and it is finished away from the fire with one-tenth of a quart of excellent sherry cover the bain-marie or slightly butter the top to avoid the formation of a skin this sauce is the base of all the smaller brown sauces twenty four lenten espagnole practical men are not agreed as to the need of lenten espagnole the ordinary espagnole being really a neutral sauce in flavour it is quite simple to give it the necessary flavour by the addition of the required quantity of fish fumé it is only therefore when one wishes to conform with the demands of a genuine lent sauce that a fish espagnole is needed and certainly in this case nothing can take its place the preparation of this espagnole does not differ from that of the ordinary kind except that the bacon is replaced by mushroom parings in the mirepoix and that the sauce must be despumated for only one hour this sauce takes the place of the ordinary espagnole for lenten preparations in every case where the latter is generally used 
in Gratta, in the Genevoise sauce, etc. 25. Ordinary Velouté Sauce Quantities required for four quarts. One pound of pale roux, formula 20. Five quarts of white veal stock, formula 10. Dissolve the roux in the cold white veal stock and put the saucepan containing this mixture on an open fire, stirring the sauce with a spatula or whisk so as to avoid its burning at the bottom. Add one ounce of table salt, a pinch of nutmeg and white powdered pepper, together with one quarter pound of nice white mushroom parings if these are handy. Now boil and move to a corner of the fire to despumate slowly for one and a half hours, at the same time observing the precautions advised for ordinary espagnol. Formula 22. Strain through muslin into a smaller saucepan, add one pint of white stock, and despumate for another half hour. Strain it again through a tammy or a sieve into a wide tureen and keep moving it with a spatula until it is quite cold. I am not partial to garnishing velouté sauce with carrots, an onion with a clove stuck into it and a faggot, as many do. The stock should be sufficiently fragrant of itself without requiring the addition of anything beyond the usual condiments. The only exception I should make would be for mushroom parings, even though it is preferable when possible to replace these by mushroom liquor but this is always scarce in kitchens where it is used for other purposes wherefore it is often imperative to have recourse to parings in its stead the latter may not however be added to the stock itself as they would blacken it hence i advise their addition to the velouté during its preparation twenty six Velouté de volaille. This is identical with ordinary velouté, except that instead of having white veal stock for its liquor, it is diluted with white poultry stock. The mode of procedure and the time allowed for cooking are the same. 26a. Fish velouté. Velouté is the base of various fish sauces whose recipes will be given in part two. Prepare it in precisely the same way as poultry velouté, but instead of using poultry stock, use very clear fish fumé, and let it despumate for twenty minutes only. See fish fumé number 11. 27. Allemande sauce or thickened velouté Allemande sauce is not, strictly speaking, a basic sauce. However, it is so often resorted to in the preparation of other sauces that I think it necessary to give it after the velouté from which it is derived. Quantities required for one quart. The yolks of five eggs, one pint of cold white stock, one quart of velouté, well despumated, half the juice of a lemon, quarter of a pint of mushroom liquor. Mode of procedure. Put the various ingredients in a thick-bottomed sauté pan and mix them carefully. Then put the pan on an open fire and stir the sauce with a metal spatula, lest it burn at the bottom. When the sauce has been reduced to about one quart, add one third pint of fresh cream to it and reduce further for a few minutes. It should then be passed through a fine strainer into a tureen and kept moving until quite cold. Prepared thus, the allemande sauce is ready for the preparation of the smaller sauces. Butter must only be added at the very last moment, for if it were buttered any earlier it would most surely turn. The same injunction holds good with this sauce when it is to be served in its original state. It should then receive a small addition of cream and be buttered so that it may attain its required delicacy but this addition of butter and cream ought only to be made at the last moment and away from the fire. When a thick sauce has any fat substance added to it, it cannot be exposed to a higher temperature than 140 degrees Fahrenheit without risking decomposition. 28. Béchamel sauce Quantities required for four quarts. One pound of white roux. Four and a half quarts of boiling milk, 
half a pound of lean veal, two thirds of an ounce of salt, one pinch of mignonette and grated nutmeg, and a small sprig of thyme, one minced onion. Preparation Pour the boiling milk on the roux, which should be almost cold, and whisk it well so as to avoid lumps. Let it boil, then cook on the side of the fire. Meanwhile, the lean veal should have been cut into small cubes and fried with butter in a saucepan, together with the minced onion. When the veal has stiffened without becoming coloured, it is added to the bechamel, together with salt and the other aromatics. Let the sauce stew for about one hour in all, and then pass it through a tammy into a tureen. Butter the top lest a crust should form. When bechamel is intended for Lenten preparations, the veal must be omitted. There is another way of making the sauce. After having boiled the milk, the seasoning and aromatics should be added. The saucepan is then covered and placed on a corner of the stove so as to ensure a thorough infusion. The boiling milk must now be poured onto the roux which has been separately prepared and the sauce should then cook for one quarter of an hour only. 29. Tomato sauce. Quantities required for four quarts. Five ounces of salted breast of pork, rather fat. Six ounces of carrots cut into cubes. Six ounces of onions cut into cubes. One bay leaf and one small sprig of thyme. Five ounces of flour. Two ounces of butter, half an ounce of salt, one ounce of sugar, a pinch of pepper. Ten pounds of raw tomatoes, or four quarts of same, mashed. Two quarts of white stock. Preparation. Fry the pork with the butter in a tall, thick-bottomed saucepan. When the pork is nearly melted, add the carrots, onions and aromatics. Cook and stir the vegetables, then add the flour, which should be allowed to cook until it begins to brown. Now put in the tomatoes and white stock, mix the whole well, and set to boil on an open fire. At this point add the seasoning and a crushed clove of garlic, cover the saucepan and place in a moderate oven, where it may cook for one and a half hours. At the end of this time, the sauce should be passed through a sieve or tammy, and it should boil while being stirred. Finally, pour it into a tureen and butter its surface to avoid the formation of a skin. Remarks A puree of tomatoes is also used in cookery. It is prepared in precisely the same fashion, except that the flour is omitted and only one pint of white stock is added. 30. Hollandaise sauce. Quantities required for one quart. One and a half pounds of butter, the yolks of six eggs, one pinch of mignonette pepper and one quarter ounce of salt, three tablespoonfuls of good vinegar. Preparation. Put the salt, the mignonette, the vinegar and as much water in a small saucepan and reduce by three quarters on the fire. Move the saucepan to a corner of the fire or into a bain-marie, and add a spoonful of fresh water and the yolks. Work the whole with a whisk until the yolks thicken and have the consistence of cream. Then remove the saucepan to a tepid place and gradually pour the butter on the yolks while briskly stirring the sauce. When the butter is absorbed, the sauce ought to be thick and firm. It is brought to the correct consistence with a little water, which also lightens it slightly, but the addition of water is optional. The sauce is completed by a drop of lemon juice, and it is rubbed through a tammy. Remarks The consistence of sauces whose processes are identical with those of the Hollandaise may be varied at will. For instance, the number of yolks may be increased if a very thick sauce is desired, and it may be lessened in the reverse case. Also, similar results may be obtained by cooking the eggs either more or less. As a rule, if a thick sauce be required, the yolks ought to be well cooked and the sauce kept almost cold in the making. 
experience alone, the fruit of long practice, can teach the various devices which enable the skilled worker to obtain different results from the same kind and quality of material. End of section 3 Section 4 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1 by Auguste Escoffier. Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 3, Part 1 The Small Compound Sauces In order that the classification of the small sauces should be clear and methodical, I divide them into three parts. The first part includes the small brown sauces, the second deals with the small white sauces, and those suited to this part of the classification, while the third is concerned with the English sauces. The small brown sauces, 31. Sauce Bigarade. This sauce is principally used to accompany braised and poiled ducklings. In the first case, the duckling's braising stock, being thickened, constitutes a sauce. In the second case, the stock is clear, and the procedure in both cases is as follows. 1. After having strained the braising stock, completely remove its grease, and reduce until it is very dense. Strain it once more through muslin, twisting the latter. Then, in order to bring the sauce to its normal consistence, add the juice of six oranges and one lemon per quart of sauce. Finish with a small piece of lemon and orange rind, cut regularly and finely, julienne fashion, and scalded for five minutes. 2. Strain the poiling stock for duck or ducks through linen. Entirely remove the grease and add four pieces of caramel sugar dissolved in one tablespoonful of vinegar per one-half pint of stock. The juice of the oranges and the lemon and the julienne of rinds, as for the braised duckling sauce indicated above. 32. Sauce Bartolais Put into a vegetable pan two ounces of very finely minced shallots, one half pint of good red wine, a pinch of mignonette pepper, and bits of thyme and bay. Reduce the wine by three quarters and add one half pint of half glaze. Keep the sauce simmering for half an hour. Despumate it from time to time and strain it through linen or a sieve. When dishing it up, finish it with two tablespoonfuls of dissolved meat glaze, a few drops of lemon juice, and four ounces of beef marrow, cut into slices or cubes, and poached in slightly salted boiling water. This sauce may be buttered to the extent of about three ounces per pint which makes it smoother, but less clear. It is especially suitable for grilled butcher's meat. 33. Chasseur sauce, Escoffier's method. Peel and mince six medium-sized mushrooms. Heat one-half ounce of butter and as much olive oil in a vegetable pan. Put in the mushrooms and fry the latter quickly until they are slightly browned. Now add a coffee spoonful of minced shallots and immediately remove half the butter. Pour one half pint of white wine and one glass of liqueur brandy into the stew pan. Reduce this liquid to half and finish the sauce with one half pint of half glaze one quarter pint of tomato sauce, 
and one tablespoonful of meat glaze. Set to boil for five minutes more, and complete with a teaspoonful of chopped parsley. 34. Brown Chaufroise Sauce Put one quart of half glaze into a sauté pan with one-fifth pint of truffle essence. Put the pan on an open fire and reduce its contents. While making same, absorb one and one-half pints of jelly, the latter being added to the sauce in small quantities. The degree of reduction in this sauce is a good third, but to be quite certain, a test of its consistence may be made by allowing it to cool a little. After the reduction, carefully taste and rectify the seasoning if necessary. Mix a little Madeira or port with the sauce away from the fire and strain through muslin or, preferably, through a Venetian hair sieve. Stir the sauce now and then while it cools until it is sufficiently liquid and at the same time consistent enough to coat immersed solids evenly with a film of sauce. Its use will be explained among the formulae of the different kinds of chauffeur. 35. Varieties of the chauffeur sauce. For ducks. Prepare the sauces above, adding to it, for the prescribed quantity, one half pint of duck fumet obtained from the carcasses and remains of roast duckling and finish it away from the fire with the juice of four oranges and a heaped tablespoonful of orange rind cut finely julienne fashion and scalded for five minutes for feathered game treat the chauffeur sauce as indicated in number thirty four adding one half pint of the fumet of the game constituting the dish in order to lend it that game's characteristic taste. Observe the same precaution for the cooling. For fish, proceed as in number 34, but 1. Substitute the espanol of fish for the half glaze. 2. Intensify the first espanol with one half pint of very clear fish essence. 3. Use Lenten jelly instead of meat jelly. Remarks upon the use of chauffeur sauces. The chauffeur sauce may be prepared beforehand, and when it is wanted, it need only be gently melted without heating it in the least. It ought simply to be made sufficiently liquid to give a good coating to substances immersed in it. 36. Devil Sauce Put in a vegetable pan two ounces of sliced shallots and one-third pint of white wine. Reduce the latter to two-thirds, add one-half pint of half-glaze, reduce to two-thirds, season strongly with cayenne pepper, and strain through muslin. This sauce may be served with grilled fowls or pigeons. It also forms an excellent accompaniment to redished meat, which needs a spicy sauce. It also forms an excellent accompaniment to redished meat, which needs a spicy sauce. 37. Escoffier Deviled Sauce This sauce, which may be bought ready-made, is admirably fitted to accompany grilled fish and grills in general. In order to make it ready, all that is needed is to add its own volume of fresh butter to it, the latter being previously well softened so as to ensure its perfect mixture with the sauce. 38. Genevoise Sauce Heat two ounces of butter in a stew pan. Insert one pound of mirepoix, number 228, without bacon. Slightly brown, add two pounds of head of salmon and remains or bones of fish, and stew with lid on for twenty minutes. 
Let the stew pan lean slightly to one side so that the butter may be drained. Moisten with one bottle of excellent red wine. Reduce the latter by half. Add one pint of Lenten Espanol and allow to cook gently for half an hour. Rub the sauce through a sieve, pressing it so as to extract all the essence. Let it rest a while. Carefully remove the fat which has risen to the surface and add one liqueur glass of burnt brandy, one half pint of red wine, and as much fish fumet. Boil again, then move stew pan to the side of fire to despumate for one and a half hours. Frequently remove what the ebullition causes to rise to the surface, the second period of cooking being only to ensure the purification of the sauce. If the ebullition has been well affected, the sauce should reach the proper degree of reduction and despumation at the same moment of time. It is then strained through muslin or tammy, and it is finished at the last minute with a few drops of anchovy essence and four ounces of butter per quart of sauce. Nota bene. The Genevoise sauce, like all red wine sauces, may be served without being buttered. It is thus clearer and more slightly in color, but the addition of butter in small quantities makes it mellower and more palatable. 38a. Remarks on Red Wine Sauces in the general repertory of cooking, we also have, in the way of red wine sauces, the bourguignon, matelot, and red wine sauces, which are closely allied to the genevoise and only differ from it in details of procedure. The bourguignon sauce is composed of red wine accompanied by aromatics and reduced by half. In accordance with ordinary principles, it is thickened by means of three ounces of mannied butter per quart of reduced wine. This sauce is buttered with four ounces of butter per quart, and is especially regarded as a domestic preparation for poached, molded, and hard-boiled eggs. Matelot sauce is made from courbouillon, with red wine which has been used for cooking fish. This court bouillon, with the mushroom pairings added, is reduced by two-thirds and thickened with one pint of Lenten Espanol per pint of the reduced court bouillon. This sauce should be reduced by a third, strained through a tammy, and finished by means of two ounces of butter, and a little cayenne per pint of sauce. The red wine sauce resembles the two preceding ones in so far as it contains mirepoix browned in butter and diluted with red wine. The wine is reduced by half, thickened by a pint of Lenten Espanol per pint of the reduction, and the sauce is despumated for about twenty minutes. It is strained through a tammy and finished, when ready, by a few drops of anchovy essence, a little cayenne, and two ounces of butter per pint of sauce. 39. Grand Veneur Sauce Take one pint of poivrade sauce, number 49, and boil it, adding one pint of game stock to keep it light. Reduce the sauce by a good third. Remove it from the fire and add four tablespoonfuls of red currant jelly. When the latter is well dissolved, complete the sauce by one quarter pint of cream per pint of sauce. This sauce is the proper accompaniment for joints of venison. 40. Italian Sauce Ordinary Italian Sauce Put into a stew pan six tablespoonfuls of Ducelle, see number 223. 
2 ounces of very lean cooked ham, cut very finely, Bernoise fashion, and 1 pint of half-glazed tomate. Boil for 10 minutes, and complete, at the moment of dishing up, with 1 teaspoonful of parsley, chevril, and tarragon, minced and mixed. Lenten Italian sauce. Same preparation, only one, omit the ham, and two, substitute Lent Espanol, combined with fish fumé, made from the fish for which the sauce is intended, for half glaze with tomatoes. 41. Thickened gravy. Boil one pint of poultry or veal stock, according to the nature of the dish, the gravy is intended for. Thicken this sauce by means of three quarters ounce of fecula, diluted cold with a little water or gravy, and pour this leason into the boiling gravy, being careful to stir briskly. The thickened gravy with the veal stock base is used for choicest pieces of butcher's meat. That with the poultry stock base is for fillet of poultry. 42. Veal gravy tomate. Add to one pint of veal stock two ounces of puree and one quarter pint of tomato juice and reduce by a fifth. Strain the gravy through linen. This gravy is for butcher's meat. 43. Lyonnaise sauce. Finely mince two ounces of onions and brown them slightly in two ounces of butter. Moisten with one quarter pint of white wine and as much vinegar. Almost entirely reduce the liquid. Add one and a half pints of clear half glaze and set to cook slowly for half an hour. Rub the sauce through a tammy. Nota bene. The onion may be left in the sauce or not, according to the preparation for which it is intended and the taste of the consumer. 44. Madeira sauce. Put one and one third pints of half glaze into a saute pan and reduce it on a brisk fire to a stiff consistence. When it reaches this point, take it off the fire and add one-fifth pint of Madeira to it, which brings it back to its normal consistence. Rub through a tammy and keep it warm without allowing it to boil. 45. Marrow Sauce Follow the proportions as indicated under Sauce Bordelaise, number 32, for the necessary quantity of this sauce, the marrow sauce being only a variety of the Bordelaise. Finish it with six ounces per quart of beef marrow cut into cubes, poached and well drained, and one teaspoonful of chopped parsley, scalded for a second. If the sauce is to accompany vegetables, finish it away from the fire with three ounces of butter and then add the cubes of marrow and the parsley. 46. Pignon sauce. Take the necessary amount of poivrad sauce prepared according to formula number 49 and let it boil. Now for one pint of sauce, prepare an infusion of juniper berries with one quarter pint of water and two ounces of concast berries, one ounce of grilled fir apple kernels, and one ounce of raisins, stoned and washed, and left to soak in tepid water for about an hour. Finish the sauce when dishing up by adding the infusion of juniper berries strained through linen, the grilled kernels, the soaked raisins, and one-eighth pint of Madeira wine. The sauce is specially suited to joints of venison. 47. Perigueux sauce. 
Prepare a sauce madère, as explained in number 44, and add to the half glaze to be reduced half its volume of very strong veal stock and keep it a little denser than usual. Finish this sauce by adding one-sixth pint of truffle essence and three ounces of chopped truffles per quart of Madeira sauce. It is used for a numerous small entree, tambal, hot pâté, and so on. 48. Picante sauce. Put into a vegetable pan two ounces of minced shallots, one quarter pint of vinegar, and as much white wine. Reduce the liquid by a good half and add one pint of half glaze. Set the sauce to boil and despumate it for half an hour. At the last moment, finish it away from the fire with two ounces of gherkins, one ounce of capers, and a teaspoonful of chevril, parsley, and tarragon mixed. All the ingredients to be finely chopped. This sauce generally accompanies grilled or boiled pork and cold meat redished and minced, which needs spicy flavoring. 49. Ordinary Poivrade Sauce 1. Heat two ounces of butter in a stew pan and insert one pound of raw mirepoix, number 228. Fry the vegetables until they are well browned. Moisten with one quarter pint of vinegar and one half pint of marinade, formula 169. Reduce to two thirds. Add one pint of espagnole sauce and cook for three quarters of an hour. Ten minutes before straining the sauce, put in a few crushed peppercorns. If the pepper were put in the sauce earlier, it might make it bitter. 2. Pass the sauce through a strainer, pressing the aromatics. Add a further one-half pint of marinade and despumate for one quarter of an hour, keeping it simmering the while. Strain again through tammy and finish the sauce, when ready for dishing, with two ounces of butter. This sauce is suitable for joints marinated or not. 50. Poivre de sauce for venison. Fry with two ounces of butter and two ounces of oil, one pound of raw mirepoix, number 228, to which are added four pounds of well-broken bones and ground game trimmings. When the whole is well browned, drain the grease away and dilute with one pint of vinegar and one pint of white wine. Reduce this liquid by three quarters, then add three quarts of game stock and a quart of espagnole sauce. Boil, cover the saucepan, and put into a moderate oven where it should stay for at least three hours. At the end of this time, take out the saucepan and pour its contents into a fine sieve placed over a tureen. Press the remains so as to expel all the sauce they hold, and pour the sauce into a tall, thick saucepan. Add enough game stock and marinade. Mix in equal parts to produce three quarts in all of sauce, and gently reduce the latter while despumating it. As it diminishes in volume, it should be passed through muslin into smaller saucepans, and the reduction should be stopped when only a quart of sauce remains. Nota bene. This sauce, like red wine sauces, may be served as it stands. It is brilliant, clear and perhaps more slightly thus, but the addition of a certain quantity of butter, four ounces per quart, makes it perfectly mellow and admirably completes its fragrance. 51. Provençal Sauce 
peel, remove the seeds, press and concoct 12 medium tomatoes. Heat in a sauté pan one-fifth pint of oil until it begins to smoke a little. Insert the tomatoes, seasoned with pepper and salt. Add a crushed garlic clove, a pinch of powdered sugar, one teaspoonful of chopped parsley, and allow to melt gently for half an hour. In reality, true Provençal is nothing but a fine fondue of tomatoes with garlic. 52. Robert Sauce Finally mince a large onion and put it into a stew pan with butter. Fry the onion gently and without letting it acquire any color. Dilute with one-third pint of white wine, reduce the latter by one-third, add one pint of half-glaze, and leave to simmer for twenty minutes. When dishing up, finish the sauce with one tablespoonful of meat glaze, one teaspoonful of mustard, and one pinch of powdered sugar. If, when finished, the sauce has to wait, it should be kept warm in a bain-marie, as it must not boil again. This sauce, of a spicy flavor, is best suited to grilled and boiled pork. It may also be used for a mince of the same meat. 53. Escoffier Robert Sauce This sauce may be bought ready-made. It is used either hot or cold. It is especially suitable for pork, veal, poultry, and even fish, and is generally used hot with grills after the equivalent of its volume of excellent brown stock has been added to it. It may also be served cold to accompany cold meat. 54. Rouennaise sauce. Prepare a Bordelaise sauce according to formula number 32. The diluent of this sauce must be an excellent red wine. For one pint of sauce, pass four raw duck's livers through a sieve. Add the resulting puree to the Bordelaise and heat the latter for a few minutes in order to poach the liver. Be careful, however, not to heat the sauce too much nor too long, lest the liver be cooked. Serve this sauce with duckling a la Rouronnaise. 55. Salmi Sauce the base of this sauce, which rather resembles the coulis, is unchangeable. Its diluent only changes according to the kind of birds or game to be treated, and whether this game is to be considered ordinary or Lenten. Cut and gently brown in butter five ounces of mirepoix, formula 228. Add the skin detached from the limbs and the chopped carcass of the bird under treatment and moisten with one pint of white wine. Reduce the latter to two-thirds, add one-half pint of half-glaze, and boil gently for three-quarters of an hour. Pass through a strainer while pressing upon the carcass and the aromatics with the view of extracting their quintessence and thin the coulis thus obtained by means of one-half pint of game stock or mushroom liquor, if the game be Lenten. Now despumate for about one hour, finally reduce the sauce, bring it to its proper consistency with a little mushroom liquor and truffle essence, rub it through tammy, and butter it slightly at the last moment. 56. Tortue Sauce Boil one-half pint of veal stock, adding a small sprig of sage, sweet marjoram, rosemary, basil, thyme, and as much bay, two ounces of mushroom parings, and one ounce of parsley. Cover and allow to infuse for half an hour. Two minutes before straining the infusion, add four cod cast 
peppercorns. After straining through fine linen, add one half pint of half glaze and as much tomato sauce away from the fire with four tablespoonfuls of sherry, a little truffle essence, and a good pinch of cayenne. Nota bene. As this sauce must be spicy, the use of cayenne suggests itself, but great caution should be observed as there must be no excess of this condiment. 57. Venison Sauce Prepare a poivrade sauce for game, as explained in number 50. Finish the sauce with two tablespoonfuls of red currant jelly, previously dissolved, and mix with five tablespoonfuls of fresh cream per pint of sauce. This addition of cream and red currants must be made away from the fire. Serve this sauce with big ground game. Small white and compound sauces. 58. American sauce. This sauce consists of lobster prepared a l'Americaine. See number 939. As it generally accompanies a fish, the meat of the lobster or lobsters which have served in its preparation is sliced and used as the garnish of the fish. 59. Anchovy sauce. Put into a small stew pan one pint of unbuttered Normande sauce, number 99, and finish it away from the fire with three ounces of anchovy butter and one ounce of anchovy fillets, washed, well sponged, and cut into small pieces. 60. Aurore sauce. Into one half pint of boiling velouté, Put the same quantity of very red tomato puree, number 29, and mix the two. Let the sauce boil a little, pass it through a tammy, and finish away from the fire with three ounces of butter. 61. Lenten Aurora Sauce This sauce is made like the preceding one, that is, with the same quantities of velouté and tomato puree, replacing ordinary velouté by fish velouté. 62. Béarnaise sauce. Put into a small stew pan one teaspoonful of chopped shallots, two ounces of chopped tarragon stalks, three ounces of chevrel, some mignonette pepper, a pinch of salt, and four tablespoonfuls of vinegar. Reduce the vinegar by two-thirds, take off the fire, but let the stew pan cool a little, and add to this reduction uh, the yolks of five eggs. Now put the stew pan on a low fire and gradually combine with the yolks six ounces of melted butter. Whisk the sauce briskly so as to ensure the cooking of the yolks, which alone, by gradual cooking, affect the lesion of the sauce. When the butter is combined with the sauce, rub the latter through tammy and finish it with a teaspoonful of chevrel parings and chopped tarragon leaves. Complete the seasoning with a suspicion of cayenne. This sauce should not be served very hot, as it is really a mayonnaise with butter. It need only be tepid, for it would probably turn if it were overheated. Serve it with grilled butcher's meat and poultry. 63. Bayonnaise sauce with meat glaze, otherwise Valois sauce or foyou sauce. Prepare a bayonnaise sauce as explained in number 62. Combine it with three tablespoonfuls of dissolved pale meat glaze, which may be added in small quantities at a time. Serve it with butcher's meat. 64. Bayonnaise tomate sauce or chouron sauce. Proceed in exactly the same way as for bayonnaise number 62. When the sauce is made and rubbed through tammy, 
Finish it with one-third pint of very red tomato puree. In this case, the final addition of chevrel and tarragon should not be made. This is proper to tournados chorons, but it may accompany grilled poultry and white butcher's meat. 65. Bercy sauce. Heat two ounces of chopped shallots, moisten with one half pint of white wine, and as much fish fumet, or, when possible, the same quantity of fish liquor, the latter being, of course, that of a fish similar to the one the sauce is to accompany. Reduce to a good third, add one third pint of velouté, let the sauce boil some time, and finish it, away from the fire, with four ounces of butter, added by degrees, a few drops of fish glaze, half the juice of a lemon, and one ounce of chopped parsley, served with medium-sized poached fish. 66. Butter Sauce Mix two ounces of sifted flour with two ounces of melted butter, Dilute with one quart of boiling water, salted to the extent of one quarter ounce per quart. Stir briskly to ensure a perfect leason, and do not allow to boil. Add immediately the yolks of six eggs, mixed with one quarter pint of cream, and the juice of half a lemon. Rub through a tammy, and finish the sauce with five ounces of best fresh butter. Be careful that the sauce does not boil after it has been thickened. 67. Bonne foie sauce or white bordelaise sauce. Put in a stew pan two ounces of minced shallots and one half pint of graves, sauterne, or any other excellent white Bordeaux. Reduce the white wine almost entirely. Add one quarter pint of velouté. Let it simmer twenty minutes, and rub it through a tammy. Finish it away from the fire with six ounces of butter and a little chopped tarragon. Serve it with grilled fish and grilled white meat. 68. Caper Sauce This is a derivative of the butter sauce described under number 66, and there need only be added two tablespoonfuls of capers per pint of sauce. It frequently accompanies boiled fish of all kinds. End of section 4 Reading by Malone Section 5 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1, by Auguste Escoffier. Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 3, Part 2 the small compound sauces. 69. Cardinal sauce. Boil one pint of bechamel, to which add one half pint of fish fumet and a little truffle essence, and reduce by a quarter. Finish the sauce, when dishing up, with three tablespoonfuls of cream and three ounces of very red lobster butter. Number 149. This sauce is poured over the fish. 70. Mushroom sauce. If this be intended for poultry, add one-fifth pint of mushroom liquor and eight ounces of button mushroom heads, turned or channeled and cooked, to one pint of very stiff allemande sauce. If it be intended for fish, Take one pint of fish velouté, thickened with the yolks of four eggs, and finish it with mushroom liquor, as above. 
The sauce that I suggest for poultry may also be used for fish, after adding the necessary quantity of fish fumet. 71. Chateaubriand Sauce Put one ounce of chopped shallots, a sprig of thyme, and a bit of bay, one ounce of mushroom parings, and one quarter pint of white wine into a stew pan. Reduce the wine almost entirely. Add one half pint of veal gravy, and reduce again until the liquid only measures one quarter pint. Strain through muslin, and finish the sauce away from the fire with four ounces of butter, maître d'hôtel, number 150, to which may be added a little chopped tarragon. Serve with grilled filet of beef, otherwise Chateaubriand. 72. White Chaux-Froid Sauce Boil one pint of velouté in a stew pan, and add three quarters pint of melted white poultry jelly. Put the stew pan on an open fire, reduce the sauce by a third, stirring constantly the while, and gradually add one half pint of very fresh cream. When the sauce has reached the desired degree of consistency, rub it through a tammy and stir it frequently while it cools, for fear of a skin forming on its surface, for if this happened it would have to be strained again. When dishing up, this sauce should be cold, so that it may properly coat immersed solids, and yet be liquid enough to admit of the latter being easily steeped into it. 73. Ordinary Chaux-Froid Sauce Proceed exactly as above, substituting Allemande sauce for the velouté, and reducing the quantity of cream to one quarter pint. Observe the same precautions while cooling. 74. Chaux-Froid Sauce à l'aurore. Prepare a white chaux-froid, number 72. The same may be colored by the addition of fine red tomato puree, more or less to match the desired shade, or by an infusion of paprika, according to the use for which it is intended. This last product is preferable when not too deep a shade is required. 75. Chaux-froid sauce au vert pré. Add to the velouté of the white chaux-froid sauce, at the same time as the jelly, an infusion prepared thus. Boil one quarter pint of white wine, and add to it one pinch of chevreuse stocks, a similar quantity of tarragon leaves, chives, and parsley leaves cover, allow infusion to proceed away from the fire for ten minutes, and strain through linen. Treat the sauce as explained, and finish with spinach green, number 143. The shade of the sauce must not be too pronounced, but must retain a pale green. The coloring principle must therefore be added with caution, and in small quantities, until the correct shade is obtained. Use the sauce for chaux-froid of fowl, particularly that kind distinguished as printanier. 76. Long chaux-froid sauce. Proceed as for white chaux-froid, using the same quantities and taking note of the following modifications. 1. Substitute fish velouté for ordinary velouté. 2. Substitute white fish jelly for poultry jelly. Remarks. I have adopted the use of this ordinary chaux-froid sauce for the glazing of filet and escalope of fish and shellfish instead of cleared mayonnaise, formerly used, which had certain inconveniences not the least being the oozing away of the oil under the shrinkage of the gelatin. 
This difficulty does not obtain in any ordinary chaud froid, the definite and pronounced flavor of which is better than that of the cleared mayonnaise. 77. Escoffier Cherry Sauce This sauce may be bought ready-made. Like the Roberts sauce, it can be served hot or cold. It is an excellent adjunct to venison, and even to small ground game. Saddle of venison with this sauce constitutes one of the greatest dainties that an epicure could desire. 78. Chivry Sauce In one half pint of boiling poultry stock, put a large pinch of chevril pluche, tarragon, and parsley leaves, a head of young pimpernel, the qualification here is very important, for this aromatic plant grows bitter as it matures, and a good pinch of chives, cover up, and let infusion proceed for ten to twelve minutes. Then add the liquid, strained through linen, to one pint of velouté. Boil, reduce by a quarter, and complete it with two ounces of green butter, number 143. Chivry sauce is admirably suited to boiled or poached poultry. 79. Cream sauce. Boil one pint of bechamel sauce, and add one quarter pint of cream to it. Reduce on an open fire until the sauce has become very thick, then pass through tammy. Bring to its normal degree of consistency by gradually adding, away from the fire, one quarter pint of very fresh cream and a few drops of lemon juice. Serve this sauce with boiled fish, poultry, eggs, and various vegetables. 80. Shrimp Sauce Boil one pint of fish velouté, or failing this, bechamel sauce, and add to it one quarter pint of cream and one quarter pint of very clear fish fumé. Reduce to one pint and finish the sauce away from the fire with two ounces of shrimp butter, number 145, and two ounces of shelled shrimp's tails. 81. Curry Sauce Slightly brown the following vegetables in butter. 12 ounces of minced onions, 1 ounce of parsley roots, 4 ounces of minced celery, a small sprig of thyme, a bit of bay, and a little mace. Sprinkle with 2 ounces of flour and a teaspoonful of curry pepper. Cook the flour for some minutes without letting it acquire any color, and dilute with one and a half pints of white stock. Boil, cook, gently for three quarters of an hour, and rub through a tammy. Now heat the sauce, remove its grease, and keep it in the bain-marie. Serve the sauce with fish, shellfish, poultry, and various egg preparations. Nota bene, this sauce is sometimes flavored with coconut milk in the proportion of one quarter of the diluent. 82. Diplomat sauce. Take one pint of Normande sauce, prepared according to number 99, and finish it with two ounces of lobster butter and three tablespoonfuls of lobster meat and truffles cut into small regular tubes. 83. Herb Sauce Prepare one pint of white wine sauce, number 111. Finish it away from the fire with three ounces of shallot butter, a tablespoonful of parsley, chevril, tarragon, and chives, chopped and mixed. Serve the sauce with boiled or poached fish. 84. Gooseberry Sauce Prepare one pint of butter sauce, formula number 66. 
Meanwhile, put one pound of green gooseberries into a small copper saucepan containing boiling water. Boil for five minutes, then drain the gooseberries and put them in a little stew pan with one half pint of white wine and three ounces of powdered sugar. Gently cook the gooseberries, rub them through a tammy, and add the resulting pulp to the butter sauce. This sauce is excellent with grilled mackerel and the poached fillets of that fish. 85. Hungarian Sauce Gently fry in butter, without coloring, two tablespoonfuls of chopped onions seasoned with table salt and half a teaspoonful of paprika. Moisten with one quarter pint of white wine, add a small faggot, reduce the wine by two-thirds, and remove the herbs. Finish with one pint of ordinary or Lenten velouté, according to the use for which the sauce is intended, and boil moderately for five minutes. Then rub the sauce through a tammy, and complete it with two ounces of butter. Remember, this sauce should be of a tender pink shade, which it must owe to the paprika alone. It forms an ideal accompaniment to choice morsels of lamb and veal, eggs, poultry, and fish. 86. Oyster Sauce Take one point of Normande sauce, finish it as directed in that recipe, and complete it with one quarter pint of reduced oyster liquor, strained through linen, and twelve poached and trimmed oysters. 87. Ivory Sauce or Albufer Sauce Take the necessary quantity of supreme sauce, prepared as explained in number 105A. Add to this four tablespoonfuls of dissolved pale meat glaze per quart of sauce, in order to lend the latter that ivory-white tint which characterizes it. Serve this sauce chiefly with poultry and poached sweetbread. 88. Joinville Sauce Prepare one pint of Normande sauce, number 99, as given in the first part of its formula, and complete it with two ounces of shrimp butter and two ounces of crayfish butter. If this sauce is to accompany a fish a la Joinville, which includes a special garnish, it is served as it stands. If it is served with a large, boiled, ungarnished fish, one ounce of very black truffles, cut julienne fashion, should be added. As may be seen, the Joinville sauce differs from similar preparations in the final operation, where crayfish and shrimp butter are combined. 89. Maltese Sauce To the Hollandaise sauce given under number 30, add, when dishing up, the juice of two blood oranges, these late-season oranges being especially suitable for this sauce, and half a coffee spoonful of grated orange rind. Maltese sauce is the finest for asparagus. 90. Mariniere sauce. Take the necessary quantity of Bercy sauce, number 65, and add, per pint of sauce, one quarter pint of mussel liquor, and a leason composed of the yolks of three eggs. Serve this with small poached fish, and more particularly with mussels. 91. Mornay Sauce Boil one pint of bechamel sauce with one quarter pint of the fumet of that fish, which is to constitute the dish. Reduce by a good quarter, and add two ounces of gruyere and two ounces of grated parmesan. Put the sauce on the fire again for a few minutes, and ensure the melting of the cheese by stirring with a small whisk. Finish the sauce away from the fire, 
with two ounces of butter added by degrees. 92. Mousseline sauce. To a Hollandaise sauce, prepared as explained, number 30, add, just before dishing up, one half pint of stiffly whipped cream per pint of sauce. 93. Mousseuse sauce. Scald and wipe a small vegetable pan and put into it one half pound of stiffly mannied butter properly softened. Season this butter with table salt and a few drops of lemon juice and whisk it while gradually adding one third pint of cold water. Finish with two tablespoonfuls of very firm whipped cream. This preparation, though classified as a sauce, is really a compound butter, which is served with boiled fish. The heat of the fish alone suffices to melt it, and its appearance is infinitely more agreeable than that of plain melted butter. 94. Mustard Sauce Take the necessary quantity of butter sauce and complete it away from the fire with one tablespoonful of mustard per pint of sauce. Nota bene. If the sauce has to wait, it must be kept in a bain-marie, for it should not on any account boil. It is served with certain small grilled fish, especially fresh herrings. 95. Nantua sauce. Boil one pint of bechamel sauce, add one half pint of cream, and reduce by a third. Rub it through a tammy, and finish it with a further addition of two tablespoonfuls of cream, three ounces of very fine crayfish butter, and one tablespoonful of small shelled crayfish's tails. 96. Newburgh sauce. First method with raw lobsters. Divide a two pound lobster into four parts. Remove its creamy parts, pound them finely with two ounces of butter, and put them aside. Heat in a saute pan one and a half ounces of butter and as much oil, and insert the pieces of lobster, well seasoned with salt and cayenne. Fry until the pieces assume a fine red color. Entirely drain away the butter, and add two tablespoonfuls of burnt brandy and one-third pint of marsala or old sherry. Reduce the wine by two-thirds, and wet the lobster with one-third pint of cream and one-half pint of fish fumet. Now add a faggot, cover the sauté pan, and gently cook for 25 minutes. Then drain the lobster on a sieve, remove the meat and cut it into cubes, and finish the sauce by adding the creamy portions put aside from the first. Boil so as to ensure the cooking of these latter portions. Add the meat, cut into cubes, and verify the seasoning. Nota bene. The addition of the meat to the sauce is optional. Instead of cutting it into cubes, it may be stewed and displayed on the fish constituting the dish. 97. Second method with cooked lobster. The lobster, having been cooked in a court bouillon, shell the tail and slice it up. Arrange these slices in a sauté pan, liberally buttered at the bottom. Season them strongly with salt and cayenne, and heat them on both sides, so as to affect the reddening of the skin. Immerse, so as to cover, in a good sherry, and almost entirely reduce same. When dishing up, Pour on to the slices a leason composed of one-third pint of fresh cream and the yolks of two eggs. Gently stir, away from the fire, and roll the saucepan about until the leason is completed. Originally, these two sauces, like the American, were exclusively composed of and served with lobster. 
They were one with the two very excellent preparations of lobster, which bear their name. In its two forms, lobster may only be served at lunch, many people with delicate stomachs being unable to digest it at night. To obviate this serious difficulty, I have made it a practice to serve lobster sauce with filet or mousseline of sole, adding the lobster as a garnish only, and this innovation proved most welcome to the public. By using such condiments as curry and paprika, excellent varieties of this sauce may be obtained, which are particularly suited to sole and other white Lenten fish. In either of these cases, it is well to add a little rice a l'andienne to the fish. 98. Noisette Sauce Prepare a hollandaise sauce, according to the recipe, under number 30. Add two ounces of hazelnut butter at the last moment. Serve this with salmon, trout, and all boiled fish in general. 99. Normande Sauce Put in a sauté pan one pint of fish velouté, three tablespoonfuls of mushroom liquor, as much oyster liquor, and twice as much sole fumé, the yolks of three eggs, a few drops of lemon juice, and one quarter pint of cream. Reduce by a good third on an open fire. Season with a little cayenne, rub through a tammy, and finish with two ounces of butter and four tablespoonfuls of good cream. The sauce is proper to filet of sole a la Normande, but it is also frequently used as the base of other small sauces. 100. Oriental Sauce Take one pint of American sauce, season with curry, and reduce to a third. Then add, away from the fire, one quarter pint of cream per pint of sauce. Serve this sauce in the same way as American sauce. 101. Poulette Sauce Boil for a few minutes one pint of sauce allemande, and add six tablespoonfuls of mushroom liquor. Finish away from the fire with two ounces of butter, a few drops of lemon juice, and one teaspoonful of chopped parsley. Use this sauce with certain vegetables, but more generally with sheep's trotters. 102. Ravigot Sauce Reduce by half one quarter pint of white wine and half as much vinegar. Add one pint of ordinary volute. Boil gently for a few minutes, and finish with one and a half ounces of shallot butter and one teaspoonful of chevril, tarragon, and chopped chives. This sauce accompanies boiled poultry and certain white abba. 103. Regency Sauce If this sauce is to garnish poultry, Boil one pint of Allemande sauce with six tablespoonfuls of mushroom essence and two tablespoonfuls of truffle essence. Finish with four tablespoonfuls of poultry glaze. If it is to garnish fish, substitute for the Allemande sauce some fish velouté thickened with egg yolks, and the essences of mushroom and truffle as above, complete with some fish essence. 104. Soubise Sauce Stew in butter two pounds of finely minced onions, scalded for three minutes and well dried. This stewing of the onions in butter increases their flavor. Now add one half pint of thickened bechamel. Season with salt and a teaspoonful of powdered sugar. Cook gently for half an hour, rub through a tammy, and complete the sauce with some tablespoonfuls of cream and two ounces of butter. 105. Soubise Sauce with Rice the same quantity as above of minced onions, scalded and well-drained. 
garnished the bottom and the sides of a tall, medium stewpan with some thin rashers of fat bacon. Insert the onions, together with one quarter pound of Carolina rice, one pint of white consomme, a large pinch of powdered sugar, and the necessary salt. Cook gently in the front of the oven for three quarters of an hour. Then pound the onions and rice in a mortar. Rub the resulting puree through a tammy and finish with cream and butter as in the preceding case. Nota bene. This sauce, being more consistent than the former, is used as a garnish just as often as a sauce. 106. Soubise Sauce Tomate Prepare a soubise in accordance with the first of the two above formulae, and add to it one-third of its volume of very red tomato puree. Remarks 1. The soubise is rather a coulis than a sauce, that is, its consistence must be greater than that of a sauce. 2. The admixture of bechamel in soubise is preferable to that of rice, seeing that it makes it smoother. If, in certain cases, rice is used as a cohering element, it is in order to give the soubise more stiffness. 3. In accordance with the uses to which it may be put, the soubise tomate may be finely seasoned either with curry or paprika. 106a. Suprême Sauce The salient characteristics of Suprême Sauce are its perfect whiteness and consummate delicacy. It is generally prepared in small quantities only. Preparation Put one and a half pints of very clear poultry stock and one quarter pint of mushroom cooking liquor into a sauté pan. Reduce to two thirds. Add one pint of poultry velouté. Reduce on an open fire, stirring with the spatula the while, and combine one half pint of excellent cream with the sauce, this last ingredient being added little by little. When the sauce has reached the desired consistence, strain it through a sieve and add another one-quarter pint of cream and two ounces of best butter. Stir with a spoon from time to time, or keep the pan well covered. 107. Venetian Sauce Put into a stew pan one tablespoonful of chopped shallots, one tablespoonful of chevreuil, and one quarter pint of white wine and tarragon vinegar, mixed in equal quantities. Reduce the vinegar by two-thirds. Add one pint of white wine sauce, number 111. Boil for a few minutes, rub through a tammy, and finish the sauce with a sufficient quantity of herb juice, number 183 and one teaspoonful of chopped chevrel and tarragon. This sauce accompanies various fish. 108. Villeroy Sauce Put into a sauté pan one pint of Allemande sauce, to which have been added two tablespoonfuls of truffle essence and as much ham essence. Reduce on an open fire and constantly stir until the sauce is sufficiently stiff to coat immersed solids thickly. 109. Villois Soubise Sauce Put into a sauté pan two-thirds pint of Allemande sauce and one-third pint of Soubise Puree, Formula 105. Reduce, as in the preceding case, as the uses to which this is put are the same. Now, according to the circumstances and the nature of the solid it is intended for, a few teaspoonfuls of very black chopped truffles may be added to this sauce. 
110. Vilwa Tomate Sauce. Prepare the sauce as explained under number 108 and add to it the third of its volume of very fine tomato puree. Reduce in the same way. Remarks 1. Vilwa sauce of whatever kind is solely used for the coating of preparations said to be a la Vilwa. 2. The Vilwa tomate may be finely seasoned with curry or paprika according to the preparation for which it is intended. 111. White wine sauce. The three following methods are employed in making it. 1. Add one quarter pint of fish fume to one pint of thickened velouté and reduce by half. Finish the sauce away from the fire with four ounces of butter. Thus prepared, this white wine sauce is suitable for glazed fish. 2. Almost entirely reduce one quarter pint of fish fume. To this reduction, add the yolks of four eggs, mixing them well in it, and follow with one pound of butter, added by degrees, paying heed to the precautions indicated under Sauce Hollandaise number 30. 3. Put the yolks of five eggs into a small stew pan and mix them with one tablespoonful of cold fish stock. Put the stew pan in a bain-marie and finish the sauce with one pound of butter, meanwhile adding from time to time, and in small quantities, six tablespoonfuls of excellent fish fumé. The procedure in this sauce is, in short, exactly that of the Hollandaise, with this distinction, that here fish fumé takes the place of the water. Hot English Sauces 112. Apple Sauce Quarter, peel, core, and chop two pounds of medium-sized apples. Place these in a stew pan with one tablespoonful of powdered sugar and a bit of cinnamon and a few tablespoonfuls of water. Cook the whole gently with lid on and smooth the puree with a whisk when dishing up. Serve this sauce lukewarm with duck, goose, roast hare, and so on. 113. Bread Sauce Boil one pint of milk and add three ounces of fresh white bread crumb, a little salt, a small onion with a clove stuck in it, and one ounce of butter. Cook gently for about a quarter of an hour. Remove the onion, smooth the sauce with a whisk, and finish it with a few tablespoonfuls of cream. This sauce is served with roast fowl and roast feathered game. 114. Celery Sauce Clean six stalks of celery, only use the hearts. Put them in a sauté pan, wholly immerse in consomme, add a faggot and one onion, and a clove stuck in it, and cook gently. Drain the celery, pound it in a mortar, then rub it through a tammy and put the puree in a stew pan. Now thin the puree with an equal quantity of cream sauce and a little reduced celery liquor. Heat it moderately, and if it has to wait, put it in a bain-marie. This sauce is suited to boiled or braised poultry. It is excellent and has been adapted in French cookery. 115. Cranberry Sauce Cook one pint of cranberries with one quart of water in a stew pan and cover the stew pan. When the berries are cooked, drain them in a fine sieve through which they are strained. To the puree thus obtained, add the necessary quantity of their cooking liquor, so as to make a somewhat thick sauce. Sugar should be added according to the taste of the consumer. The sauce is mostly served with roast turkey. It is to be bought ready-made, and if this kind be used, it need only be heated with a little water. 
116 fennel sauce. Take one pint of butter sauce, number 66, and finish it with two tablespoonfuls of chopped fennel, scalded for a few seconds. This is principally used with mackerel. 117. Egg sauce with melted butter. Dissolve one quarter pound of butter and add to it the necessary salt, a little pepper, half the juice of a lemon, and three hard-boiled eggs, hot and cut into large cubes, also a teaspoonful of chopped and scalded parsley. 118. Scotch Egg Sauce Make a white roux with one and a half ounces of butter and one ounce of flour. Mix in one pint of boiling milk, season with salt, white pepper, and nutmeg, and boil gently for ten minutes. Then add three hot hard-boiled eggs cut into cubes, the whites and the yolks. This sauce usually accompanies boiled fish, especially fresh haddocks and fresh and salted cod. 119. Horseradish or Albert Sauce Rasp five ounces of horseradish and place them in a stew pan with one quarter pint of white consomme. Boil gently for twenty minutes and add a good one half pint of butter sauce, as much cream, and one half ounce of bread crumb. Thicken by reducing on a brisk fire and rub through tammy. Then thicken with the yolks of two eggs and complete the seasoning with a pinch of salt and pepper and a teaspoonful of mustard dissolved in a tablespoonful of vinegar. Serve this sauce with braised or roast beef, especially fillets. 119a. Parsley Sauce This is the butter sauce, number 66, to which is added, per pint, a heaped teaspoonful of freshly chopped parsley. 120. Reform Sauce Put into a small stew pan and boil one pint of half-glazed sauce and one half pint of ordinary poivrade sauce. Complete with a garnish composed of one half ounce of gherkins, one half ounce of hard-boiled white of an egg, one ounce of salted tongue, one ounce of truffles, and one ounce of mushrooms. All these to be cut julienne fashion and short. This sauce is for mutton cutlets when these are a la réforme. End of section 5 Reading by Malone Section 6 of A Guide to Modern Cookery Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanne Roshan A Guide to Modern Cookery Part 1 by Augusta Escoffier Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 4 Cold Sauces and Compound Butters 121 Aioli Sauce or Provence Butter Pound one ounce of garlic cloves as finely as possible in a mortar and add the yolk of one raw egg, a pinch of salt, and one half pint of oil, letting the latter gradually fall in a thread and wielding the pastel meanwhile, so as to effect a complete amalgamation. Add a few drops of lemon juice and cold water to the sauce as it thickens, these being to avoid its turning. Should it decompose while in the process of making, or when made, the only thing to be done is to begin again with the yolk of an egg. 122. Andalus Sauce Take the required quantity of mayonnaise sauce, number 126, and add it 
to the quarter of its volume of very red and concentrated tomato puree and finally add two ounces of capsicum cut finely julienne fashion per pint of sauce one twenty three bohemian sauce put in a bowl one quarter pint of cold bechamel the yolks of four eggs a little table salt and white pepper add a quart of oil and three tablespoonfuls of tarragon vinegar proceeding as for the mayonnaise finish the sauce with a tablespoonful of mustard one twenty four genoa sauce pound in a mortar and make into a smooth fine paste one ounce of pistachios and one ounce of fir apple kernels or if these are not available one ounce of sweet almonds add one half tablespoonful of cold bechamel put this paste into a bowl add the yolks of six eggs a little salt and pepper and finish the sauce with a quart of oil the juice of two lemons and proceed as for the mayonnaise complete with three tablespoonfuls of pure herbs prepared with equal quantities of chevrel parsley tarragon and fresh pimpernel scalded for one minute cool quickly press so as to expel the water and pass through a fine sieve serve this sauce with cold fish one twenty five grebici sauce crush in a basin the yolks of six hard-boiled eggs and work them into a smooth paste together with a large tablespoonful of french mustard the necessary salt a little pepper and make up the sauce with one pint of oil complete with one dessert spoonful of parsley chevrel and tarragon chopped and mixed as many capers and gherkins evenly mixed and the hard-boiled whites of three eggs cut short julienne fashion this sauce is chiefly used with cold fish one twenty six mayonnaise sauce put in a basin the yolks of six raw eggs after having removed the cores season them with one half ounce of table salt and a little cayenne pepper gradually pour one fifth pint of vinegar on the yolks while whisking them briskly when the vinegar is absorbed add one quart of oil letting the latter trickle down in a thread constantly stirring the sauce meanwhile the sauce is finished by the addition of the juice of a lemon and three tablespoonfuls of boiling water the purpose of the latter being to ensure the coherence of the sauce and to prevent its turning mayonnaise is prepared in this way is rather liquid but it need only be left to rest a few hours in order to thicken considerably unless it be exposed to too low a temperature the mayonnaise prepared as above never turns and may be kept for several days without the fear of anything happening to it merely cover it to keep the dust away remarks in the matter of sauces there exist endless prejudices which i must attempt to refute one if the sauce forms badly or not at all the reason is that the oil has been added too rapidly at first before the addition of the vinegar and that its assimilation by the yolks has not operated normally two it is quite an error to suppose that it is necessary to work over ice or in a cold room cold is rather deleterious to the mayonnaise and is invariably the cause of this sauce turning in winter in cold season the oil should be slightly warmed or at least kept at the temperature of the kitchen though it is best to make it in a moderately warm place three 
it is a further error to suppose that the seasoning interferes with the making of the sauce for salt in solution rather provokes the cohering force of the yolks causes of the disintegration of the mayonnaise one the too rapid addition of the oil at the start two the use of congealed or too cold an oil three excess of oil in proportion to the number of yolks the assimilating power of an egg being limited to two and one half ounce of oil if the sauce is to be made some time in advance and three ounces if it is to be used immediately means of bringing the turned mayonnaise back to its normal state put the yolk of an egg into a basin with a few drops of vinegar and mix the turned mayonnaise in it little by little if it be a matter of only a small quantity of mayonnaise one half a coffee spoonful of mustard can take the place of the egg yolk finally with regard to acid seasoning a whiter sauce is obtained by the use of lemon juice instead of vinegar 127 cleared mayonnaise sauce take the necessary quantity of mayonnaise and gradually add to it per one and one half pints of the sauce one half pint of cold and rather firm melting aspic jelly lenten or ordinary according to the nature of the products for which the sauce is intended remarks it is this very mayonnaise formerly used almost exclusively for coating entries and cold relieves of fish filleted fish escallops and common and spiny lobster and sea which i have allowed the lenten chaud froid see remarks number seventy six to supersede one twenty eight whisked mayonnaise put into a copper basin or other bowl three quarters pint of melted jelly two thirds pint of mayonnaise one tablespoonful of tarragon vinegar and as much rasped and finely chopped horseradish mix up the whole place the utensil on ice and whisk gently until the contents get very frothy stop whisking as soon as the sauce begins to solidify for it must remain almost fluid so as to enable it to mix with the products for which it is intended this sauce is used principally for vegetable salads 129 ravigote sauce or vinaigrette put into a bowl one pint of oil one third pint of vinegar a little salt and pepper two ounces of small capers three tablespoonfuls of fine herbs comprising some very finely chopped onion as much parsley and half as much chevrel tarragon and chives mix thoroughly the ravigote accompanies calves head or foot sheep's trotters and c two or three tablespoonfuls of the liqueur with which its accompanying solids have been cooked i e calves head or sheep's trotters liqueur and c are often added to this sauce when dishing up one thirty remoulade sauce to one pint of mayonnaise add one large tablespoonful of mustard another of gherkins and yet another of chopped and pressed capers one tablespoonful of fine herbs parsley chevrel and tarragon all chopped and mixed and a coffee spoonful of anchovy essence this sauce accompanies cold meat and poultry and more particularly common and spiny lobster one thirty one green sauce take the necessary quantity of thick mayonnaise and spicy seasoning 
and add to these per one pint of sauce one third pint of herb juice prepared as indicated hereafter number one thirty two this is suitable for cold fish and shellfish one thirty two vincent sauce prepare and carefully wash the following herbs one ounce each of parsley chevril tarragon chives sorrel leaves and fresh pimpernel two ounces of watercress and two ounces of spinach put all these herbs into a copper bowl containing salted boiling water boil for two minutes only then drain the herbs in a sieve and immerse them in a basin of fresh water when they are cold they are once more drained until quite dry then they must be finely pounded with the yolks of eight hard-boiled eggs rub the puree thus obtained through a sieve first then through tammy add one pint of very stiff mayonnaise to it and finish the sauce with the dessert spoonful of worcestershire sauce cold english sauces one thirty three cambridge sauce pound together the yolks of six hard-boiled eggs the washed and dried fillets of four anchovies a teaspoonful of capers a dessert spoonful of chevril tarragon and chives mixed when the whole forms a fine paste add one tablespoonful of mustard one fifth pint of oil one tablespoonful of vinegar and proceed as for a mayonnaise season with a little cayenne rub through tammy applying pressure with a spoon and place the sauce in a bowl stir it a while with a whisk to smooth it and finish it with one teaspoonful of chopped parsley it is suited to cold meats in general in fact it is an anglicized version of vincent sauce one thirty four cumberland sauce dissolve four tablespoonfuls of red currant jelly to which are added one fifth pint of port wine one teaspoonful of finely chopped shallots scalded for a few seconds and pressed one teaspoon of small pieces of orange rind and as much lemon rind cut finely julienne fashion scalded for two minutes well drained and cooled the juice of an orange and that of half a lemon one teaspoonful of mustard a little cayenne pepper and as much powdered ginger mix the whole well serve this sauce with cold venison one thirty five gloucester sauce take one pint of very thick mayonnaise and complete it with one fifth pint of sour cream with the juice of a lemon added and combine with the mayonnaise by degrees one teaspoonful of chopped fennel and as much worcester sauce serve this with all cold meats one thirty six mint sauce cut finely julienne fashion or chop two ounces of mint leaves put these in a bowl with a little less than one ounce of white cassonade or castor sugar one quarter pint of fresh vinegar and four tablespoonfuls of water special sauce for hot or cold lamb one thirty seven oxford sauce make a cumberland sauce according to number one thirty four with this difference that the julienne of orange and lemon rinds should be replaced by rasped or finely chopped rinds and that the quantities of the same should be less i e two-thirds of a teaspoonful of each one thirty eight horse radish sauce 
dilute one tablespoonful of mustard with two tablespoonfuls of vinegar in a basin and add one pound of finely rasped horseradish two ounces of powdered sugar a little salt one pint of cream and one pound of bread crumb steeped in milk and pressed serve this sauce very cold it accompanies boiled and roast joints of beef compound butters for grills and for the completion of sauces with the exception of those of the shellfish order the butters whose formula i am about to give are not greatly used in kitchens nevertheless in some cases as for instance in accentuating the savour of sauces they answer a real and useful purpose and i therefore recommend them since they enable one to give a flavour to the derivatives of the velut and bechamel sauces which these could not acquire by any other means with regard to shellfish butters and particularly those of the common and spiny lobster and the crayfish experience has shown that when they are prepared with heat that is to say by melting in a bain-marie a quantity of butter which has been previously pounded with the shellfish remains and afterwards strained through muslin into a basin of iced water where it is solidified they are of a finer colour than the other kind and quite free from shell particles but the heat besides dissipating a large proportion of their delicacy involves considerable risk for the slightest neglect gives the above preparation quite a disagreeable taste to obviate these difficulties i have adopted a system of two distinct butters one which is exclusively colorific and prepared with heat and the other which is prepared with all the creamy parts the trimmings and the remains of common and spiny lobsters without the shells pounded with the required quantity of fresh butter and passed through a sieve the latter is used to complete sauces particularly those with the bechamel base to which it lends a perfect savour i follow the same procedure with shrimp and crayfish butters sometimes substituting for the butter good cream which i find absorbs the aromatic principles perhaps better than the former with the above method it is advisable to pass the butter or the cream through a very fine sieve first and afterwards through tammy so as to avoid small particles of the pounded shell being present in the sauce 139 bursi butter put into a small stew pan one quarter pint of white wine and one ounce of finely chopped shallots scalded a moment reduce the wine by one half and add one half pound of butter softened into a cream one teaspoonful of chopped parsley two ounces of beef marrow cut into cubes poached in slightly salted water and well drained the necessary table salt and when dishing up a little ground pepper and a few drops of lemon juice this butter must not be completely melted and it's principally served with grilled beef 140 chivalry or ravigote butter put into a small saucepan of salted boiling water six ounces of chevrel parsley tarragon fresh pimpernel and chives in equal quantities and two ounces of chopped shallots boil quickly for two minutes drain cool in cold water press in a towel to completely remove the water and pound in a mortar now add one half pound of half melted butter 
mix well with the puree of herbs and pass through tammy this butter is used to complete chivalry sauce and other sauces that contain herb juices such as the venetian and c one forty a chateaubriand butter reduce by two-thirds four-fifths pint of white wine containing four chopped shallots fragments of thyme and bay and four ounces of mushroom parings add four-fifths pint of veal gravy reduce the whole to half rub it through tammy and finish it away from the fire with eight ounces of maitre d hotel butter number one fifty and a half tablespoon of chopped tarragon one forty one colbert butter take one pound of maitre d hotel butter number one fifty and add six tablespoonfuls of dissolved pale meat glaze and one teaspoonful of chopped tarragon serve this sauce with fish prepared a la colbert one forty two red coloring butter put on to a dish any available remains of shellfish and having thoroughly emptied and well dried them in the oven pound them until they form a fine powder and add their weight of butter put the whole into a saucepan and melt in a bain-marie stirring frequently the while when the butter is quite clarified strain it through muslin twisting the latter over a tureen of iced water in which the strained butter solidifies put the congealed butter in a towel press it heavily so as to expel the water and keep cool in a small bowl remarks a very fine and decided red color is obtained by using paprika as a condiment for sauces intended for poultry and certain butcher meats in accordance with the procedure i recommend for the hongroise but only the very best quality should be used that which is mild and at the same time produces a nice pink color without entailing any excess of the condiment among the various kinds of paprika on the market i can highly recommend that of messrs kotangi which i have invariably found satisfactory one forty three green coloring butter peel wash and thoroughly shake so as to get rid of every drop of water two pounds of spinach pound it raw and then press it in a strong towel twisting the latter so as to extract all the vegetable juice pour this juice into a saute pan let it coagulate in a bain-marie and pour it onto a serviette stretched over a bowl in order to drain away the water collect the remains of the coloring substance on the serviette making use of a palette knife for the purpose and put these into a mortar mix with half their weight of butter strain through a sieve or a tammy and put aside to cool this green butter should in all cases take the place of the green liquid found on the market 144 various coolesses finely pound shrimp and crayfish shells and combine these with the available creamy parts and spawn of the common and spiny lobsters add one quart pint of rich cream per pound of the above remains and strain first through a fine sieve and then through tammy the coolis is prepared just in time for dishing up and serves as a refining principle for certain fish sauces one forty five shrimp butter finely pound any available shrimp remains add to these their weight of butter and strain through tammy place in a bowl 
and put aside in the cool. 146. Shallot Butter Put eight ounces of roughly minced shallots in the corner of a clean towel, and wash them quickly in boiling water. Cool, and press them heavily. Then pound them finely with their own weight of fresh butter and strain through tammy. This butter accentuates the savor of certain sauces, such as bursi, ravigote, and c. 147. Crayfish Butter Pound, very finely, the remains and shells of crayfish cooked in mirepoix. Add their weight of butter and strain through a fine sieve and again through tammy, so as to avoid the presence of any shell particles. This latter precaution applies to all shellfish butters. 148. Tarragon Butter Quickly scald and cool eight ounces of fresh tarragon, drain, and press in a towel. Pound in a mortar, and add them to one pound of butter, strain through tammy, and put aside in the cool, if it's not to be used immediately. 149. Lobster Butter Reduce to a paste in the mortar the spawn, shell, and creamy parts of lobster. Add their equal in weight of butter and strain through tammy. 150. Butter a la Maitre d' Hotel First manny, then soften into a cream one half pound of butter. Add a tablespoonful of chopped parsley, a little salt and pepper, and a few drops of lemon juice. Serve this with grills in general. 151. Mannied Butter Mix until perfectly combined four ounces of butter and three ounces of sifted flour. This butter is made immediately before the time of dishing up and is used for quick leasons like the mate loats and see. The sauce to which mannied butter has been added should not boil if this can possibly be avoided, as it would thereby acquire a very disagreeable taste of raw flour. 151a. Melted Butter This preparation is used principally as a fish sauce, should consist of butter, only just melted, and combined with a little table salt and a few drops of lemon juice. It should, therefore, be prepared only at the last minute, for should it wait, and be allowed to clarify, besides losing its flavor, it will be found to disagree with certain people. 152. Butter a la menure. Put into a frying pan the necessary quantity of butter, and cook it gently until it has acquired a golden tint and excudes a slight smell of nut. Add a few drops of lemon juice, and pour on the fish under treatment, which should have been previously sprinkled with concoust parsley. This butter is proper to fish, a la menure, and is always served on the fish. 153. Montpellier Butter Put into a saucepan containing boiling water equal quantities of watercress, leaves, parsley, chevrel, chives, and tarragon, six ounces in all, one and one half ounce of chopped shallots, and one half ounce of spinach leaves. Boil for two minutes, then drain, cool, press in a towel to expel water, and pound in a mortar with one tablespoonful of pressed capers, four ounces of gherkins, a garlic clove, and the fillets of four anchovies, well washed. Mix this paste with one and one-half pounds of butter. Then add the yolks of three boiled eggs and two raw eggs. 
and finally pour in, by degrees, two-fifths pint of oil. Strain through a fine sieve, or through tammy. Put the butter into a basin, and stir it well with a wooden spoon, so as to make it smooth. Season with table salt and a little cayenne. Use this butter to deck large fish, such as salmon and trout, but it is also used for smaller pieces and slices of fish. Remarks. When this butter is specifically prepared to form a coat on fish, the oil and the egg yolks are omitted and only butter is used. 154. Black Butter. Put into a frying pan the necessary amount of butter and cook it until it is assumed a brown color and begins to smoke. At this moment, add a large pinch of concoosed parsley leaves and spread it immediately over the object to be treated. Hazelnut Butter Put eight ounces of shelled hazelnuts for a moment in the front of the oven in order to slightly grill their skins and make them more easily removable. Now crush the nuts in a mortar until they form a paste and add a few drops of cold water with a view to preventing their producing any oil. Add their equivalent in weight of butter and rub through tammy. 156. Pistachio Butter Put into boiling water eight ounces of pistachios and keep them on the side of the fire until the peel may be easily removed. Drain, cool in cold water, clean the pistachios, and finely pound while moistening them with a few drops of water. Add two ounces of butter and pass through tammy. 157. Printanier Butter These butters are made from all early season vegetables, such as carrots, French beans, peas, and asparagus heads. When dealing with green vegetables, cook quickly in boiling water, drain, dry, pound with their weight of butter, and rub through tammy. With carrots, mince, cook with consomme, sugar, and butter until the diluent is quite reduced. After cooling, they are pounded with their own weight of butter and rubbed through tammy. End of section 6 Recording by Joanne Roshan Section 7 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanne Roshan. Chapter 5. Savory Jellies or Aspics. Jellies are to cold cookery, what consommes and stock are to hot. If anything, the former are perhaps more important. For a cold entree, however, it may be in itself, is nothing without its accompanying jelly. In the recipes which I give hereafter, I have made a point of showing how melting jellies may be obtained, i.e., served in a sauce boat simultaneously with the cold comestible or actually poured over it when the latter lies in a deep dish, a common custom nowadays. This method of serving cold entrees, which I inaugurated at the Savoy Hotel with the Supreme Divolé Jeanette, is the only one which allows the serving of a jelly in a state of absolute perfection. Nevertheless, if a more solid jelly were required, either for the decking of cold dishes or for a moulded entree, there need only be added 
to the following formula a few gelatin leaves more or less according to the required firmness of the jelly but it should be not forgotten that the greater the viscosity of the jelly the less value will the same possess the various uses of jellies are dealt with in part two of this work where the formulas of their divers accompanying dishes will also appear 158 ordinary aspects stock for the ordinary aspic quantities for making four quarts four pounds of strung knuckle of veal three calves feet boned and blanched three pounds of strung knuckle of beef one pound of fresh pork rind blanched and with the fat removed three pounds of veal bones well broken up mode of procedure put the meats in a very clean and well tinned stock pot or stew pan add eight quarts of cold water boil and skim after the manner indicated under number one having well skimmed the stock add one ounce of salt put it on the side of the fire and let it boil gently for four hours then remove the meat taking care not to disturb the stock carefully remove the fat and garnish with one half pound of carrots six ounces of onions two ounces of leeks a stick of celery and a large faggot put the whole back onto the fire and cook gently for a further two hours strain through a sieve into a very clean basin and leave to cool clarification of aspic when the stock prepared according to the above directions has cooled the grease that is formed on its surface should be removed then pour off gently into a stew pan of convenient size in such a way as to prevent the deposit at the bottom of the basin from mixing with the clear liquor test the consistence of the aspic when it should be found that the quantities given above have proved sufficient to form a fairly firm jelly if however this be not the case a few leaves of gelatin steeped in cold water should be added being careful not to overdo the quantity now add to the stock two pounds of lean beef first minced then pounded together with the white of an egg a little chevrel and tarragon and a few drops of lemon juice place the saucepan on an open fire stir its contents with a spatula until the liquid begins to boil remove it from the fire and place it on the side of the stove where it may boil gently for half an hour at the end of this time take the saucepan off the fire and remove what little grease has formed on the aspic while cooking strain through a serviette stretched and fastened across the legs of an overturned stool and let the aspic fall into a basin placed between the legs ascertain whether the liquid is quite clear and if as frequently happens this be not the case what has already been strained should once more be passed through the serviette renewing the operation until the aspic becomes quite transparent flavoring the aspic the aspic obtained as above is limpid has an agreeable savor and is the color of fine amber it now only requires flavoring according to the tastes of the consumer and the purpose for which it is intended for this operation it should be allowed to become quite tepid and the following quantities of choice wine are added to it vis vis if the wine is of a liqueur kind such as sherry marsala madeira etc one fifth pint per quart if it is another kind of wine for example champagne hock etc one fourth pint per quart 
The wine used should be very clear, free from any deposit, and as perfect as possible in taste. 159. Chicken Aspic The quantities of meat are the same as for ordinary aspic. There need only be added to it either two oven-browned hens, or their equivalent in weight of roasted fowl, carcasses, and poultry giblets, if these are handy. It is always better, however, to prepare the stock with the hens and giblets, and to keep the carcasses for the clarification. This clarification follows the same rules as that of the ordinary aspic, except that a few roasted fowl carcasses, previously well freed from fat, are added to it. In the case of this particularly delicate aspic, it is more than ever necessary not to overdo the amount of gelatin. It should be easily soluble to the palate in order to be perfect. 160. Game Aspic Prepare this aspic stock in exactly the same way as that of ordinary aspic, only substitute game, such as deer, roebuck, doe, or hare, or wild rabbit, previously browned in the oven, for the beef. When possible, also add this to the stock a few old specimens of feathered game, such as partridges or pheasants, that are too tough for other purposes, and which suit admirably here. The clarification changes according to the different flavors which are given to the aspic. If it is not necessary to give it a special characteristic, it should be prepared with the meat of that ground game which happens to be the most available at the time, adding to the quantity used roast carcasses of feathered game, the respective amounts of both ingredients being the same as for ordinary aspic. If, on the other hand, the aspic is to have a well-defined flavor, the meat used for the clarification should naturally be that producing the flavor in question, i.e., either partridge or pheasant or hazel hen, etc., some aspects are greatly improved by being flavored with a small quantity of old brandy, rather than use an inferior kind of this ingredient. However, I should advise its total omission from the aspic. Without aromatization, the aspic, though imperfect, is passable, but aromatized with bad brandy, it is invariably spoiled. Lenten Aspects 161. Fish Aspic with White Wine The stock for this aspic is prepared in precisely the same manner as fish stock number one. The stew pan need not, however, be buttered previous to the insertion of the onions, parsley stalks, and fish bones. If the aspic is not required to be quite white, a little saffron may be added to it, as the aroma of this condiment blends so perfectly with that of the fish. When the stock is prepared, its consistence should be tested and rectified, if necessary, by means of gelatin. The quantity of this substance should on no account exceed eight leaves per quart of aspic, and, at the risk of repeating myself, I remind the reader that the less gelatin is used, the better the aspic will be. The clarification should be made with fresh caviar, if possible, but pressed caviar is also admirably suited to this purpose. The quantities are the same as for the clarification of fish consomme number 4. In flavoring white fish aspics, either dry champagne or a good Bordeaux or Burgundy may be used. Take care, however, 1. That the wine used be of unquestionably good quality. 2. 
that it be only added to the aspic when the latter is already cold and on the point of coagulating, as this is the only means of preserving all the aroma of the wine. Finally, in certain cases, a special flavor may be obtained by the use of crayfish, which are cooked as for bisque, then pounded and added to the fish stock number 11, ten minutes before straining it. A proportion of four little crayfish, bisque, per quart of aspic is sufficient to secure an excellent aroma. 162. Fish Aspic with Red Wine This aspic stock is the court bouillon with red wine number 165, which is served in cooking the fish for which the aspic is intended. This fish is generally either trout or salmon, sometimes also, but less commonly, a carp or a pike. This stock must first of all have its grease thoroughly removed. It should then be poured carefully away, reduced if necessary, and the required quantity of gelatin added. This cannot be easily determined, as all gelatins are not alike, and the stock may have contracted a certain consistence from its contact with the fish. One can, therefore, only be guided by testing small quantities cooled in ice, but care should be taken that the aspic be not too firm. The clarification of this aspic is generally made with white of an egg, in the proportion of one white per quart. The white, half whisked, is added to the cold stock, and the latter is put over an open fire and stirred with a spatula. As soon as it boils, the aspic is poured through a serviette fixed on the legs of an overturned stool. The first drippings of the fluid are put back onto the serviette. If they do not seem clear, and this operation is repeated until the required clearness is obtained. It almost invariably happens that either during cooking of the fish or during the clarification, the wine loses its color through the precipitation of the coloring elements derived from the tannin. The only way of overcoming this difficulty is to add a few drops of liquid carmine or vegetable red. But in any case, it is well to remember that the color of red wine aspic must never be deeper than somber pink. End of section 7 Recording by Joanne Roshan Section 8 of A Guide to Modern Cookery Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Joanne Roshan Chapter 6 The Court Bouillons and the Marinades 163. Court Bouillon with Vinegar Quantities required for 5 quarts 5 quarts of water 3 quarters pounds of carrots 1 half pint of vinegar 1 pound of onions 2 ounces of grey salt A little thyme and bay 1 half ounce of peppercorn 2 ounces of parsley stalks Preparation. Put into a saucepan the water, salt, and vinegar, the minced carrots and onions, and the parsley, thyme, and bay gathered into a bunch. Boil. Allow to simmer for one hour. Rub through tammy and put aside until wanted. Remarks. Put the peppercorns into the court bouillon only twelve minutes before straining the latter. If the pepper were in for too long a time, it would give a bitterness to the preparation. This rule applies to the formula, 
that follow, in which the use of peppercorns is also required. This court bouillon is principally used for cooking trout and salmon, as well as for various shellfish. 164. Court bouillon with white wine. Quantities required for two quarts. One quart of white wine, one large faggot, one quart of water, one half ounce of grey salt, three ounces of minced onions, a few peppercorns. Preparation. This is the same as for the quart bouillon with vinegar, except that it's boiled for half an hour and is strained through tammy. Remarks. If the court bouillon has to be reduced, the quantity of salt should be proportionately less. This preparation is principally used for poaching fresh water fish. 165. Court bouillon with red wine. Use the same quantities as for court bouillon with white wine, taking care. 1. To replace white wine by excellent red wine. 2. To add 4 ounces of minced carrots. 3. To apportion the wine and water in the ratio of two-thirds to one-third. Preparation. The same as that of the former, with the same time for boiling. Remarks. If the court bouillon is to be reduced, the salt should be less accordingly. When the court bouillon with red wine is to constitute an aspic stock, fish fumé, with enough gelatin, takes the place of the water. The use of court bouillon with red wine are similar to those of the white wine kind. 166. Plain court bouillon. The quantity of the court bouillon is determined by the size of the piece which it is to cover. It is composed of cold salt water, the salt amounting to a little less than one half ounce per quart of water, one quarter pint of milk per quart of water, and one thin slice of peeled lemon in the same proportion. The fish is immersed while the liqueur is cold. The latter is very slowly brought to the boil, and as soon as this is reached, the receptacle is moved to the side of the fire, where the cooking of the fish is completed. This court bouillon, which is used with larger pieces of turbot and brill, is never prepared beforehand. 167. Special court bouillon, or blanc. This preparation is a genuine court bouillon, though it's not used in cooking fish. The quantities required for five quarts of this court bouillon are a little less than two ounces of flour, the juice of three lemons or one-eighth pint of good vinegar, one and a half ounces of grey salt, five quarts of cold water. Gradually mix the flour and the water, add the salt and the lemon juice, and pass through a strainer. Set to boil, and stir the mixture the while, in order to prevent the flour from precipitating. As soon as the boil is reached, immerse the objects to be treated. These are usually calf's head or foot previously blanched, sheep's trotters, cocks, kidneys or combs, or such vegetables as salsify, cardoon, etc. Remarks upon the use of court bouillon. 1. Court bouillon must always be prepared in advance for all fish, the time for poaching, which is less than half an hour, except turbots and brills. 2. When a fish is of such a size as to need more than half an hour's poaching, proceed as follows. Place under the drainer of the fish kettle the minced carrots and onions and the faggot. Put the fish on the drainer and cover it with water and vinegar or white wine in accordance with the kind of court bouillon wanted and the quantity required. Add the salt, 
boil and keep the court bouillon gently simmering for a period of time fixed by the weight of the fish the time allowed for poaching the latter will be given in their respective formula three fish when whole should be immersed in cold court bouillon when sliced in the same liqueur boiling the exception to this rule are small trout a bleu and shellfish four if fish be cooked in short liqueur the aromatics are put under the drainer and the liquid elements of the selected court bouillons as for example that with red or white wine are so calculated as to cover only one third of the solid body fish cooked in this way should be frequently basted five court bouillon for ordinary and spiny lobsters should always be at full boiling pitch when these are immersed the case is the same for small or medium fish a bleu six fish which is to be served cold also shellfish should be cooled in the court bouillon itself the cooking period is consequently curtailed marinades and brines marinades play but a small part in english cookery venison or other ground game being generally preferred fresh however in the event of its being necessary to resort to these methods of preparation i shall give two formula for venison and two for mutton the use of the marinade for venison is very much debated certainly it is often desirable that the fibre of those meats that come from old specimens of the deer and boar species be softened but there is no doubt that what the meat gains in tenderness it loses in flavour on the whole therefore it would be best to use only those joints which come from young beasts in the case of the latter the marinade may well be dispensed with it would add nothing to the savour of a haunch of venison such as may be got in england while it would be equally ineffectual in the case of the roebuck or hare a summary treatment of these two with raw marinade may well be adopted as also for deer court bouillons and marinades sixty seven as for cooked marinade its real and only use lies in the fact that during stormy summer weather it enables one to pre-serve meat which would otherwise have to be wasted it may moreover be used for braised venison but this treatment of game is very uncommon nowadays one sixty eight cooked marinade for venison quantities required for five quarts one half pound of minced carrots one faggot including one ounce of parsley stalks one half pound of minced onions two sprigs of rosemary as much thyme and two bay leaves two ounces of minced shallots and one crushed garlic clove preparation heat one half pint of oil in a stew pan add the carrots and onions and fry them while stirring frequently when they begin to brown add the shallots the garlic and the faggot then one pint of vinegar two bottles of white wine and three quarts of water cook this marinade for twenty minutes and add a further two ounces of salt one half ounce of peppercorns and four ounces of brown sugar ten minutes afterwards pass it through a strainer and let it cool before inserting the meats n b in summer the marinade very often decomposes because of the blood contained by the meat under treatment in it the only means of averting this is to boil the marinade every two or three days at least one sixty nine raw marinade for butcher's meat or venison 
This marinade is prepared immediately before using. The meat to be treated is first salted and peppered on all sides. Then it's put in a receptacle, just large enough to hold it, and laid therein on a litter of aromatics, including minced carrots and onions, a few chopped shallots, parsley stalks, thyme, and bay, in proportion to the rest. Now, sprinkle the meat copiously with oil, and half as much vinegar, cover the dish with oil paper, and put it somewhere in the cool. Remember to turn the meat over three or four times a day, covering it each time with a layer of vegetables. This marinade is very active and is admirably suited to all butcher's meat and venison, provided these be not allowed to remain in it for too long a time. It's very difficult to say how long the meat must stay in these marinades. The time varies according to the size and quality of the joints, and the taste of the consumer, etc. All that can be said is that three hours should be sufficient to marinade a cutlet or a scallop of roebuck, F2, and that for big joints, such as saddle or leg, the time should not exceed four days. 170. Marinade for mutton, roebuck style. This is exactly the same as cooked marinade number 168. There need only be added one ounce of juniper berries, a few sprigs of rosemary, wild thyme and basil, two extra garlic cloves, and one quart less of water. 171. Marinade with red wine for mutton. By substituting red wine for white in the preceding formula, the quantity of the liquid equaling that of water, and by slightly increasing the quantity of aromatics, an excellent marinade for mutton is obtained, which in summer enables one to preserve meat otherwise perishable for some days. 172. Brine quantities required for 50 quarts. 56 pounds of grey salt, 6 pounds of saltpetre, 50 quarts of water, three and one half pounds of brown sugar mode of procedure put the salt and the water in a tinned copper pan and put it on an open fire when the water boils throw in a peeled potato and if the latter float add water until it begins to sink if on the contrary the potato should sink immediately reduce the liquid until it is able to boy the tuber up. At this stage, the sugar and saltpeter are added. Let them dissolve, and the brine is removed from the fire and allowed to cool. It is then poured into the receptacle intended for it, which must be either of slate, stone, cement, or well-jointed tiles. It is well to place in the bottom of this reservoir a wooden lattice, whereon the meats to be salted may be laid. For were the immersed objects to lie directly on the bottom of the receptacle, the under parts would be entirely shielded from the brine. If the meats to be salted are of an appreciable size, they should be inoculated with brine by means of a special syringe. Without this measure, it would be impossible to salt regularly, as the sides would already be oversaturated before the centre had been properly reached. Eight days should be allowed for salting a piece of beef, or what size soever, above eight or ten pounds, since the process of inoculation equalises the salting. Ox tongue intended for salting, besides having to be as court bouillons and marinades 69, fresh as possible, must be trimmed of almost all the cartilage of the throat and carefully beaten, either with a beater or roller, 
then it must be pricked on all sides with a string needle and immersed in the liquid where it should be slightly weighted by some means or other in order to prevent its rising to the surface a medium-sized tongue would need about seven days immersion in the brine although brine does not turn as easily as the cooked marinades it would be well especially in stormy weather to watch it and occasionally boil it but as the process of boiling invariably concentrates the brine a little water should be added to it every time it is so treated and the test of the potato described above should always be resorted to end of section eight section nine of a guide to modern cookery part one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand a guide to modern cookery part one by auguste escoffier translated by james b herndon jr chapter seven part one elementary preparations before broaching the question of the numerous preparations which constitute the various soup relevé and entree garnishes it will be necessary to give the formulae for the elementary preparations or what are technically called the mise en place if the various operations which go to make the mise en place were not at least summarily discussed here i should be compelled to repeat them in each formula for which they are required that is to say in almost every formula i should thus resemble those bad operators who having neglected their mise en place are obliged to make it in the course of their work and thereby not only run the risk of making it badly but also of losing valuable time which might be used to better advantage elementary preparations consist of those things whereof one is constantly in need which may be prepared in advance and which are kept available for use at a moment's notice one hundred seventy three anchovies fillets of whether they be for hors d'oeuvres or for culinary use it is always best to have these handy after having washed and well wiped them in order to remove the white powder resulting from the little scales with which they are covered they should be neatly trimmed to the shape of extended oblongs then detach the fillets from the bones by gentle pulling divide each fillet lengthwise into three or four smaller fillets put the latter into a small narrow dish or a little bowl and cover them with oil the fillets may also be kept whole with a view to rolling them into rings 174 anglais for egg and bread crumbing it is well to have this always ready for those dishes which are to be panes a anglais or as many of the recipes direct treated a l'anglaise it is made of well whisked eggs salt pepper and one dessert spoonful of oil per couple of eggs its uses the solids to be panes a l'anglais are dipped into the preparation described above taking care that the latter coats them thoroughly whereupon according to the requirements they are rolled either in bread crumbs or in fine raspings from this combination of egg with bread crumbs or raspings there results a kind of coat which at the moment of contact with the hot fat is immediately converted into a resisting crust in croquettes this crust checks the escape into the fat of the substance it encloses and this is more especially the case when the croquettes contain some reduced sauce or are composed of raw meats or fish whose juices are thereby entirely retained a solid prepared a l'anglais and cooked in fat should always be put into the latter when this is very hot so as to ensure the instantaneous solidification of the egg and bread crumbs n b objects to be treated a l'anglais are generally rolled in flour before being immersed in the anglais for the flour helps the foregoing to adhere to the object the crust formed over the solid thus acquires a density which is indispensable 174a aromatics aromatics play a very prominent part in cookery and their combination with the condiments constitutes as grenaud de la reyniere said the hidden soul of cooking their real object in fact is to throw the savor of dishes into relief to intensify that savor and to give each culinary preparation its particular stamp 
they are all derived from the vegetable kingdom but while some are used dry others are used fresh the first named should belong to the permanent kitchen stock they are sage basil rosemary sweet marjoram thyme and bay also to be included in the permanent stock are cinnamon ginger juniper berries nutmeg cloves mace and vanilla the last name comprise those aromatic herbs used fresh such as parsley chervil tarragon pimpernel and common savory while under this head there may be also included bits of common and seville orange rind and zests of lemon rind 17 b seasoning and condiments seasonings are divided into several classes which comprise one saline seasonings salt spice salt saltpeter two acid seasonings plain vinegar or the same aromatized with tarragon verjuice lemon juice and common or seville orange juices three hot seasonings peppercorns ground or concased pepper or mignonette paprika curry cayenne and compound spices four saccharine seasonings sugar and honey condiments likewise subdivided the three classes being one the pungents onions shallots garlic chives and horseradish two hot condiments mustard gherkins capers english sauces such as worcester harvey ketchup escoffier's sauces etc the wines used in reductions and braisings the finishing elements of sauces and soups three fatty substances most animal fats butter vegetable greases edible oils and coconut butter remarks in cookery it should be borne in mind that both excellence and eatableness depend entirely upon a judicious use and a rational blending of the aromatics seasonings and condiments and according as the latter have been used and apportioned their action will be either beneficial or injurious to the health of the consumer in the matter of seasoning there can be no question of approximation or half measures the quantities must be exact allowing only of slight elasticity in respect of the various tastes to be satisfied 175 clarified butter a certain quantity of clarified butter should always be kept ready and handy to prepare this butter put one pound to melt in a saucepan large enough to hold twice that amount place the saucepan on the side of the fire over moderate heat remove all the scum which rises to the surface and when the butter looks quite clear and all foreign substances have dropped to the bottom put the liquid carefully away and strain it through muslin 176 faggots bouquet garni the name faggot is given to those little bunches of aromatics which when the contrary is not stated are generally composed in order to weigh one ounce of eight tenths ounce of parsley stalks and roots one tenth ounce of bay leaves and one tenth ounce of thyme these various aromatics are put neatly together so that no sprig of the one sticks out beyond the others and they are properly strung together 177 chervil chopped chervil clean the chervil and remove the stalks wash dry it well while tossing it then chop it finely and put it aside on a plate in the cool if it is not for immediate use concast chervil proceed as above except that instead of chopping it compress it between the fingers and slice it after the manner of a chaff cutter concast and chopped chervil are if possible only prepared at the last moment chervil pluches the pluches are greatly used in the finishing off of soups they are practically the serrated portions only of the leaves which are torn away in such a manner as to show no trace of the veinings they are immersed in water and at the last moment withdrawn so as to be added raw to either soups or boiling consommes 178 raspings golden raspings are obtained by pounding and passing through a fine sieve bread crusts which have been previously well dried in the oven white raspings are similarly prepared except that very dry white crumb is used 179 peeled channeled and zested lemons lemons are greatly used in cookery as dish and comestible garnish when a whole lemon is used for marinades of fish for the blancs etc it is well to peel it to the pulp i e to remove the peel and the whole of the underlying white 
the lemon is then cut into more or less large slices according to the use for which it is attended the rind of a lemon thus peeled may be cut into bits and used in this form as the necessity arises when cutting it up flatten the rind inside uppermost on the table and with a very sharp and flexible knife remove all the white then slice the remaining peel which constitutes what is called zest into strips about one inch wide and cut these laterally in fine julienne fashion scald the resulting bits for five minutes cool them drain them carefully and put them aside until wanted sometimes instead of cutting julienne fashion the zest may be finely chopped but the rest of the process remains the same lemons are channeled by means of a little knife or a special instrument for the purpose which excises parallel ribbons from the surface of the rind and lays the white bare a lemon channeled in this way is cut in two lengthwise with the core its two extremities are removed and the two halves are cut laterally into thin regular slices to look like serrated half discs the lemon may also be cut at right angles to the core fried fish oysters and certain game are generally garnished with lemon slices fashioned according to the taste of the cook but the simplest and perhaps the best way is to cut the lemon through the centre after having trimmed the two ends quite straight and then to remove the rind roughly from the edge for whatever purpose the lemon be intended it should be as far as possible only prepared at the last moment if it must be prepared beforehand it would be well to keep it in a bowl of fresh water 180 shallots chopped shallots clean the shallots and by means of a very sharp knife cut them lengthwise into thin slices let these cling together by not allowing the knife to cut quite through them and this done turn them half round and proceed in the same way at right angles to the other cuts finally cut them laterally and this will be found to produce very fine and regular small cubes sizzled shallots the name sizzled shallots is often erroneously given to those shallots resulting from the above process but sizzled shallots are merely laterally sliced the result of which operation is a series of thin regular discs sizzled or chopped shallots should when possible only be prepared when required if however they must be treated in advance they should be kept somewhere in the cool until wanted eighty one spices strictly speaking spices include cinnamon nutmeg ginger mace and the many varieties of peppers and pimenta cayenne paprika etc these various condiments are found ready-made on the market and they need only be kept in dry airtight boxes in order to prevent the escape of their aroma but there is another kind of preparation in cookery to which the name of spice or allspice is more especially given nowadays several market varieties of this preparation exist and vie with each other for custom though in most cases they deserve it equally well formerly this was not so and every chef had his own formula the following is a recipe for the spice in question which would be found useful if it had to be prepared at a moment's notice obtain the following very dry five ounces of bay leaves three ounces of thyme half of it wild if possible three ounces of coriander four ounces of cinnamon six ounces of nutmeg four ounces of cloves three ounces of ginger root three ounces of mace ten ounces of mixed pepper half black and half white one ounce of cayenne put all these ingredients into a mortar and pound them until they are all able to pass through a very fine sieve put the resulting powder into an airtight box which must be kept dry before being used this spice is generally mixed with salt number 188 182 flour for whatever use the flour is intended it is always best to sift it this is more particularly necessary in the case of flour used for coating objects to be fried for the latter being first dipped into milk must of necessity let a few drops of that liquid fall into the flour they are rolled in lumps therefore form which might adhere to the objects to be fried if the flour were not sifted 183 herb juice this is to finish or intensify certain preparations to prepare it throw into a small saucepan of boiling water some parsley chervil and tarragon and chive leaves in equal quantities according to the amount of juice required set to boil for two minutes drain cool press the herbs in a towel twisting the latter pound very finely and extract the juice from the resulting paste by twisting a strong towel round it keep this juice in the cool 184 bread crumbs thoroughly rub in a closed towel some stale bread crumb previously well broken up 
pass it through a fine sieve or colander according as to whether it is required very fine or not and put it aside in a convenient receptacle 185 chopped onion cut the onion finely like the shallots but if it is to be minced with a view to making it even finer it should be freed of its pungent juice which would cause it to blacken with exposure to the air to accomplish this put the onion in the corner of a towel pour plenty of cold water over it and twist the towel in order to express the water by this means the onion remains quite white 186 turned or stoned olives there are special instruments for stoning olives but failing these cut the fruit spirally from the stone with the point of a small knife keep the olives in slightly salted water 187 parsley chopped parsley if parsley be properly chopped no juice should be produced if on the contrary the operation be performed badly it amounts to a process of pounding which perforce expresses the juice in the latter case the particles cohere and they are sprinkled with difficulty over an object to remedy this shortcoming wash the choppings in fresh water as in the case of the onion pressing in a similar manner so as to expel the water concast parsley is that kind which is roughly chopped when a culinary preparation is dressed with concast parsley the latter should be added to it a few moments before serving in order to undergo a slight cooking process whereas chopped parsley may be strewn over a dish at the last moment it should be remembered that parsley when quite fresh and used in moderation is an excellent thing but should it have remained too long in the heat it becomes quite insufferable i cannot therefore too strongly urge the advisability of using it in the freshest possible state and it would even be wiser to discard it entirely than to be forced to ignore this condition parsley sprays these are chiefly used in garnishing dishes and it is well for the purpose to make as much use as possible of the curled leaf kind after having removed the long stalks keep the sprays in fresh water until required fried parsley this consists of the sprays well drained of water after washing and immersed for an instant in very hot fat the moment it is fried carefully drain it salt it and place it in a clean towel where it may get rid of any superfluous grease it is used to dress fried viands 188 salt two kinds of salt are used in cooking viz gray or sea salt and rock salt gray salt is used more especially for brines and in the preparation of ices as its gray color does not allow of its being used indiscriminately be this as it may many prefer it to rock salt for the salting of stock pots roasts and grills for the last two purposes it is crushed with a roller without being pounded and the result should be such that every grain is distinctly perceptible to the touch this salt in melting over a roast or a grill certainly imparts a supplementary flavor to the latter which could not be got with the use of rock salt rock salt this is found on the market in the forms of cooking and table salt if the kitchen is only supplied with cooking salt the quantity required for several days should be dried pounded in the mortar and passed through a fine sieve and then put aside in a dry place for use when wanted even table salt as it reaches one from the purveyor sometimes needs drying and passing through a sieve before being used spiced salt this condiment which serves an important purpose in the preparation of pies and galatines is obtained from a mixture of one pound of table salt with three and one half ounce of spices number one hundred and eighty one this kind of salt should be carefully kept in a very dry place end of section nine Section 10 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1, by Auguste Escoffier. Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 7, Part 2 The Various Kinds of Garnishes for Soups, Relevé and Entrée Hot or Cold Stuffings and Forcemeats 189 Various Panadas for Stuffings Panadas are those preparations which go to make the leason of forcemeats and which ensure their proper consistence when they are cooked. 
They are not necessary for every force meat. For the mousseline kind, which are the finest and lightest, do not require them. Nevertheless, they are useful for varying the taste and the uses of force meats, and I thought it advisable to introduce them here. The reader will thus be able to use either force meats with a panada base or mousseline force meats in accordance with the requirements and his resources. 190a. Bread panada. Put one half pound of the crumb of bread and one half ounce of salt into one half pint of boiling milk. When the crumb has absorbed all the milk, place the saucepan over a brisk fire and stir with a spatula until the paste has become so thick as not to cling any longer to the end of the spatula. Turn the contents of the saucepan into a buttered platter and lightly butter the surface of the panada in order to avoid its drying while it cools. 191b. Flour Panada Put into a small saucepan one half pint of water, a little salt, and two ounces of butter. When the liquid boils, add five ounces of sifted flour thereto, stirring the while over a brisk fire until it reaches the consistence described in the case of bread panada. Use the same precautions with regard to cooling. 192C. Frangipan Panada. Put into a stew pan four ounces of sifted flour, the yolks of four eggs, a little salt, pepper, and nutmeg. Now add by degrees three ounces of melted butter and dilute with one half pint of boiled milk. Pass through a strainer. Stir over the fire until the boil is reached. Set to cook for five minutes while gently wielding the whisk, and cool as in the preceding cases. 193. Chicken Forcemeat with Panada and Butter Remove the tendons from, and cut into cubes, one pound of chicken meat. Pound and add one-third ounce of salt, a little pepper and nutmeg. When the meat is well pounded, remove it from the mortar and place in its stead one-half pound of very cold panada. See number 190. Finally pound this panada, and then add one-half pound of butter thereto, taking care that the two ingredients mix thoroughly. Now put in the chicken meat and wield the pestle vigorously until the whole mass is completely mixed. Finally, add consecutively two whole eggs and the yolks of four, stirring incessantly the while, and seeing that each egg is only inserted when the one preceding it has become perfectly incorporated with the mass Rub through a sieve, put the forcemeat into a basin, and smooth it with a wooden spoon. Test the forcemeat by poaching a small portion of it in salted boiling water. This test, which is indispensable, allows of rectifying the seasoning and the consistence, if necessary. If it be found that the forcemeat is too light, a little white of egg could be mingled with it. If, on the other hand, it should be too stiff, add a little softened butter. Nota bene. By substituting for chicken, veal, game, or fish, and so on, any kind of forcemeat may be made. For the quantities of the other ingredients remain the same, whatever the basic meat may be. 194 chicken force meat with panada and cream for fine quenelle. 
finely pound one pound of chicken meat after having removed the tendons, and seasoned with one quarter ounce of salt, a little pepper, and nutmeg. When the meat has been reduced to a fine paste, add, very gradually, two ounces of white of egg. Finish with seven ounces of frangipan panada, number 192, and work vigorously with the pestle until the whole is amalgamated. Strain through a fine sieve, put the force meat into a vegetable pan sufficiently large to allow of ultimately working it with ease, and place it on ice for a good hour. This done, stir the force meat, still on the ice, for a few seconds with a wooden spoon, then add in small quantities at a time one pint of raw cream. At this stage, complete the preparation by adding thereto one half pint of whipped cream. It should then be found to be very white, smooth, and mellow. Test as directed in the preceding recipe, and add a little white of egg if it be too light, and a little cream if it be too stiff. Nota bene. This force meat may be prepared from all butcher's meats, game, or fish. 195. Fine Chicken Force Meat, or Mousseline. Remove the tendons from trim and cut into cubes one pound of chicken meat season with one ounce of salt a little pepper and nutmeg finely pound and when it is reduced to a paste gradually add the whites of two eggs vigorously working with the pestle meanwhile strain through a fine sieve put the force meat into a vegetable pan Stir it once more with the wooden spoon for a moment or two, and combine with it, gradually, one pint of thick, fresh cream, working with great caution and keeping the receptacle on ice. Remarks relative to mousseline forcemeat. This, like the preceding forcemeats, may be prepared from any kind of meat. The addition of the white of egg is not essential if the meats used already possess a certain quantity of albumen, but without the white of egg the force meat absorbs much less cream. This force meat is particularly suited to preparations with a shellfish base. Incomparably delicate results are obtained by the process. While it also furnishes ideal quenelle for the purpose of garnishing soup. In a word, it may be said of mousseline forcemeat that, whereas it can replace all other kinds, none of these can replace it. Nota bene. Mousseline forcemeats of all kinds, with meat, poultry, game, fish, or shellfish, may be made according to the principles and quantities given above. 196. Pork forcemeat for diverse uses. Remove the tendons of, and cut into large cubes, two pounds of fillet of pork, and the same weight of fresh fat bacon. Season with one and three quarters ounce of spiced salt, number 188. Chop the fillet and bacon up together or separately, pound them finely in the mortar, and finish with two eggs and two tablespoonfuls of brandy. This forcemeat is used for ordinary pies and terrine. Strictly speaking, it is sausage meat. The inclusion of eggs in this forcemeat really only obtains when it is used to stuff joints that are to be braised, such as stuffed breast of veal, or in the case of pies and terrine. The addition of the egg in these cases prevents the grease from melting too quickly and thus averts the drying of the forcemeat. 197. 
force meat for galantine, pies, and terrine. Remove the tendons from, and cut into cubes, one pound of fillet of veal and as much fillet of pork. Add to these two pounds of fresh fat bacon, also cut into cubes. Season with three ounces of spiced salt. Chop the three ingredients together or apart, and then finely pound them. Finish with three eggs and three tablespoonsfuls of burnt brandy. Strain through a sieve and place in a basin. When about to serve this stuffing, add to it a little fumet corresponding with the meat that is to constitute the dish. For terrine, pies, and galantine of game, one quarter or one fifth of the force meat's weight of gratin stuffing proper to the game under treatment is added. 198. Veal force meat with fat or gaudy veau. Remove the tendons from and cut into cubes one pound of fillet of veal. Also pair, that is, detach skin and filaments from two pounds of the very dry fat of kidneys of beef. First, chop these up separately, then combine and pound them in the mortar. Season with one half ounce of salt, a little pepper, some nutmeg, and pound afresh until the veal and fat become a homogeneous mass. Now add four eggs consecutively and at intervals of a few minutes, without ceasing to pound, and taking care only to insert each egg after the preceding one has been properly mixed with the mass. Spread the force meat thus prepared on a dish, and put the latter on ice until the next day. The next day, pound once more and add little by little fourteen ounces of very clean ice in small pieces, or, instead, an equal weight of iced water, adding this also very gradually. When the gaudy veau is properly moistened, poach a small portion of it in boiling water in order to test its consistence. If it be too firm, add some more ice to it, if, on the other hand, it seemed too flimsy, add a little of the white of an egg. For the uses of Godivo and Cunel, see number 205. 199. Veal forcemeat with fat and cream. Chop finely and apart one pound of very white fillet of veal, with tendons removed cut into cubes, and one pound of the fat of paired kidney of beef. Combine the veal and the fat in the mortar, and pound until the two ingredients form a fine and even paste. Season with one half ounce of salt, a little pepper, and some nutmeg, and add consecutively two eggs and two yolks, after the manner of the preceding recipe and without ceasing to pound. Strain through a sieve. Spread the force meat on a dish and keep it on ice until the next day. Next day, pound the force meat again for a few minutes and add to it, little by little, one and a half pints of cream. Test as before and rectify if necessary, either by adding cream or by thickening with the white of an egg. 200. Chicken forcemeat for galantine, pies, and terrine. The exact weight of the chicken meat used as the base of this forcemeat determines the quantities of its other ingredients. Thus, the weight of meat afforded by a fowl weighing four pounds is estimated at twenty ounces. After deducting the fillets, which are always reserved, Hence, the quantities for the forcemeat are regulated thus. Chicken meat, 
20 ounces, lean pork, 8 ounces, filet of veal, 8 ounces, fresh fat bacon, 30 ounces, whole eggs, 5, spiced salt, 2 ounces, brandy, one fifth pint. Chop up, either together or apart, the chicken meat, the veal, the pork, and the bacon. Put all these into the mortar, pound them very finely with the seasoning, add the eggs consecutively, and last of all, pour in the brandy. Remarks 1. The quantity of spiced salt varies, a few grams either way, according as to whether the atmosphere be dry or damp. 2. According to the purpose of the force meat, and with a view to giving it a finer flavor, one may, subject to the resources at one's disposal, add a little raw trimmings of foie gras to it. But the latter must not in any case exceed one-fifth of the force meat in weight. 3. As a rule, force meat should always be rubbed through a sieve so as to ensure its being fine and even. 4. Whether the foie gras be added or not, chicken force meat may always be completed with two or three ounces of chopped truffles per pound of its volume. 201. Game force meat for pies and terrine. This follows the same principles as the chicken force meat, i.e., the weight of the game meat determines the quantities of the other ingredients. The proportions are precisely the same as above as regards the veal, the pork, the bacon, and the seasoning. The procedure is also the same while the appended remarks likewise apply. 202. Gratin force meat for ordinary hot raised pies. Put into a sauté pan containing one ounce of very hot butter, one half pound of fresh fat bacon, cut into large cubes, brown quickly and drain on a dish. Quickly brown in the same butter one half pound of filet of veal cut like the bacon and drain in the same way. Now rapidly brown one half pound of pale calf's liver also cut into large cubes. Put the veal and the bacon back into the sauté pan with the liver. Add the necessary quantity of salt and pepper, two ounces of mushroom parings, one ounce of truffle parings, raw if possible, chopped shallots, a sprig of thyme, and a fragment of bay. Put the whole on the fire for two minutes, drain the bacon, the veal, and the liver, and put the gravy aside. Swill the sauté pan with one quarter pint of Madeira. Pound the bacon, veal, and liver quickly, and finally, while adding consecutively six ounces of butter, the yolks of six eggs, the gravy that has been put aside, one-third pint of cold reduced espanol, and the Madeira used for swilling. Strain through a sieve, place in a tureen, and smooth with the wooden spoon. Nota bene. To make a gratin force meat with game, substitute for the veal that game meat which may happen to be required. 203. Pike force meat for quenelle à la Lyonnaise. Force meats prepared with the flesh of the pike are extremely delicate. Subject to circumstances, they may be prepared according to any one of the three formulae, numbers 193, 194, 195. There is another excellent method of preparing this force meat, which I shall submit here, as it is specially used for the preparation of pike force meat a la Lyonnaise. Pound in a mortar one pound of the meat of a pike, without the skin or bones. Combine with this one half pound of stiff frangipan. 
season with salt and nutmeg, passed through a sieve, and put back into the mortar. Vigorously work the force meat in order to make it cohere, and gradually add to it one half pound of melted beef fat. The whole half pound, however, need not necessarily be beef fat. Beef marrow or butter may form part of it in the proportion of half the weight of the beef fat. When the force meat is very fine and smooth, withdraw it from the mortar and place it in a bowl surrounded with ice until wanted. 204. Special Stuffings for Fish These preparations diverge slightly from the force meats given above, and they are of two kinds. They are used to stuff such fish as mackerel, herring, shad, and so on to which they lend a condimentary touch that makes these fish more agreeable to the taste and certainly more digestible. First method. Put into a bowl four ounces of raw chopped milk, two ounces of bread crumb, steeped in milk and well pressed, and one and a half ounce of the following fine herbs, mixed in equal quantities and finely chopped chives, parsley, chevreuil, shallots, sweet basil, half a garlic clove, crushed, then two whole eggs, salt, pepper, and nutmeg. Chop up all these ingredients together so as to mix them thoroughly. Second method. Put into a bowl four ounces of bread crumb, steeped in milk and well pressed, one half ounce of onion and one half ounce of chopped shallots slightly cooked in butter and cold one ounce of raw mushrooms chopped and well pressed in a towel a tablespoonful of chopped parsley a piece of garlic the size of a pea crushed salt pepper and nutmeg and two eggs mix it as above 205. Forcemeat Balls or Quenelle. Diverse ways of molding and poaching them. Whatever be the required size or shape of quenelle, there are four ways of making them. One, by rolling them. Two, by molding them with a spoon. Three, by forming them with a piping bag. Four, by molding them by hand into the shape of a kidney. 1. To roll quenelle, it is necessary to keep the force meat somewhat stiff, and therefore this process could not well apply to the mousseline force meats. Place one quarter pound of force meat, when ready, on a floured board, and, with hands covered in flour, roll the preparation until it has lengthened itself into the form of a sausage, the thickness of which depends upon the required size of the intended quenelle. Cut up the sausage of force meat laterally with a floured knife, and roll each section with the finger ends until the length it assumes is thrice that of its diameter. The balls should be put aside on a floured tray as soon as they are made. The Poaching of Rolled Quenelle When all the forcemeat has been used up, the balls are gently tilted into a saucepan containing boiling salted water, so calculated in quantity as to allow of their not being too tightly squeezed. The saucepan is covered and kept on the side of the fire until all the balls have risen to the surface and are almost out of the water. They are then removed with a skimmer and placed in a bowl of cold water. At last, when they have properly cooled, they are carefully drained on a cloth and put aside on a dish until required. When the canal are needed for immediate use, it would be better not to cool them. To mold canal with a spoon, this method may be applied to all forcemates, and allows of the balls being much softer, 
as the force meat need not be so stiff. First, butter the sauté pan or the tray, whereon the balls are to be laid by means of a brush and let the butter cool. Put the sauté pan on the table in front and a little to the right of one. On the left, place the sauté pan or bowl containing the force meat and on the further side of the buttered sauté pan there should be a receptacle containing hot water in which the spoon used for molding is inserted. For ordinary quenelle, two coffee spoons are used, one of which is kept in the hot water as stated above. Now, with the other held in the left hand, take up a little of the force meat, just enough to fill the spoon. Withdraw the second spoon from the hot water and place it, with its convex side uppermost, on the other spoon. This smoothens the upper surface of the force meat. Now, with the help of the second spoon, remove the whole of the contents of the first spoon and overturn the second spoon on the spot in the tray or sauté pan which the ball is intended to occupy. The second spoon, being at once moist and hot, allows the force meat to leave it quite easily in the shape of a large olive. Renew this operation until the whole of the force meat has been used. The Poaching of Spoon Molded Quenelle When all the balls have been molded, place the tray on the side of the stove and pour enough boiling salted water over them to moisten them abundantly. Leave them to poach, and from time to time remove the tray. Then, when they have swollen sufficiently and seem soft and firm to the touch, drain them. If they are to be used at once, they should be placed directly in the sauce. If they have been prepared in advance, it would be well to cool them as directed under rolled canal. To form canal with a piping bag. This process is especially recommended for small, fine, and light force meat balls intended for soup garnish. For, besides being extremely quick, it allows of making them in any desirable size or shape. Butter a tray or sauté pan and leave it to cool. Put the force meat into a bag fitted with a pipe at its narrowest end. The pipe may be grooved or smooth, and its size must be in accordance with that intended for the proposed balls. Now squeeze out the latter, proceeding in the usual way and laying them very closely. The poaching of quenelle made by the above process with ordinary or mousseline forcemeat. These quenelle are poached in exactly the same way as the spoon molded ones. The poaching of Godivo quenelle made with a piping bag. These quenelle or balls are laid on a piece of fine buttered paper, which in its turn is placed upon a buttered tray. The gaudy veau must not be too stiff, and the balls are laid by means of the piping bag, side by side, and slightly touching one another. When the tray is covered, push it into a very moderate oven for a few minutes. The balls are poached when a thin dew of grease may be seen to glisten on their surfaces. On the appearance of this dew, withdraw them from the oven and overturn the tray carefully upon a marble slab, taking care that the tray does not press at all upon the balls, lest it crush them. When the latter are nearly cold, the paper which covers them is taken off with caution, and all that remains to be done is to put them carefully away on a dish until they are wanted. To mold forcemeat with the fingers, this excellent process is as expedient as that of the bag, and it produces beautifully shaped balls. Place on the edge of a table 
in front of one a saucepan, three-quarters full of boiling salted water, the handle of the receptacle being turned to the far side. Now take a piece of string one yard in length, double it over, and tie the free ends to a weight of two pounds, letting the two strands twist around each other. This done, there should be a loop at the end of the string. Put this loop round the handle of the saucepan and draw the string diametrically across the latter, letting the weight pull the string slightly down on the side opposite to the handle. When this has been effected, the operator, with his left hand, takes some of the force meat, smoothening it with a spoon, and placing the spoon near the string with his right first finger, he removes from its extremity a portion of the preparation about equal to the intended size of the balls. This portion of the force meat remaining suspended on his first finger, the operator now scrapes the latter across the string, and the ball falls beneath into the saucepan containing the water. When all the stuffing has been molded in this way, the saucepan is placed on the fire to complete the poaching of the balls, and the precautions indicated in the preceding processes are observed. End of section 10. Reading by Malone. Section 11 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Servasi. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. By August Escoffier. Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 8. The Various Garnishes for Soups Royales 206 Ordinary Royale Put one ounce of chervelle into one pint of boiling consomme. Cover the saucepan and let infusion proceed away from the fire for twenty minutes. Now pour this infusion over two eggs and six yolks, beaten briskly in a basin, and mix with the whisk. Strain through muslin and carefully remove therefrom the froth that has formed. Pour into buttered molds, poach in a bain marie as in the case of cream, and take great care that the water in the bain marie does not boil. According to the way in which the royale is to be divided, it may be poached either in large or small charlotte molds, but the latter, large and small alike, must be well buttered. If the preparation be put into large molds, thirty-five or forty minutes should be allowed for poaching. If, on the other hand, the molds are small, about fifteen minutes would suffice. Always let the royale cool in the molds. 207. Deslignac or Cream Royal Boil one pint of thin cream and pour it little by little over one egg and six yolks, well whisked in a basin. Season with a little salt and nutmeg, strain through muslin, and for the poaching follow the directions given above. 208. Chicken Royale Finely pound three ounces of cooked white chicken meat and add thereto three tablespoonfuls of cold bechamel. Put this paste in a bowl Season with a little salt and a dash of nutmeg. Dilute with one-fifth pint of cream and strain through tammy. Thicken this preparation with one egg and the yolk of three and poach in small or large molds in accordance with the procedure already described. 209. Game Royale Finely pound three ounces of the cooked meat of that game which gives its name to the preparation, and add three tablespoonfuls of cold espagnole sauce and one-fifth pint of rich cream 
in small quantities at a time. Warm the seasoning with a very little cayenne, strain through tammy, thicken with one egg and three yolks, and poach as before. 210. Fish Royale Stew in butter four ounces of fillet of sole cut into cubes, or the same quantity of any other fish suited to the nature of the intended soup. Cool, pound finely, and add little by little two tablespoonfuls of cold bechamel and one quarter pint of cream. Season with salt and a pinch of nutmeg, and strain through tammy. Thicken by means of the yolks of five eggs and poach in large or small molds. 211. Carrot or Cressy Royale. Stew gently in butter five ounces of the red part only of carrots. Cool, crush in a mortar, and gradually add two tablespoonfuls of bechamel and one fifth pint of rich cream. Season with table salt and a pinch of castor sugar and deepen the tint of the royale with a few drops of vegetable red. Strain through tammy, thicken with one egg and four yolks, put into molds, and poach. 212. Fresh Peas or St. Germain Royale Cook one half pound of fresh small peas in boiling water with a bunch of chevelle and a few leaves of fresh mint. Pass through a sieve and dilute the resulting puree in a saucepan with two-fifths of its volume of the liquor it has been cooked in and one-fifth of cream. Add a little sugar, the necessary salt, one egg, and two yolks. Pass through a fine strainer and poach in well-buttered molds. 213. Various Royales Royales may also be made with leeks, celery, etc., the procedure being as follows. Finely mince six or seven ounces of the chosen vegetable. Stew the same gently and thoroughly in butter, and strain through tammy. Add to the resulting puree three tablespoonfuls of bechamel, one-fifth pint of cream, two eggs, and four yolks. Put into large or small molds and poach. Remarks in order that these royales may have the required delicacy, I should urge the reader not to exceed the prescribed quantities of eggs and yolks, these being so calculated as to exactly produce the density required. 214. The Dividing Up of Royales When the poaching is done, take the mold or molds out of water and leave the royale to cool in them. Do not turn out the molds whilst the preparation is hot, as it would surely scatter. It only assumes the necessary solidity for being divided up by means of the aggregation and contraction of its various constituents during the cooling process. If the royale has been poached in small molds, slightly trim the cylinders of the royale, divide them up laterally into discs, and stamp them uniformly with a plain or indented fancy cutter. If the royale has been poached in large molds, withdraw it from these and place it on a serviette. Trim the tops, cut into half-inch slices, and stamp with small fancy cutters of different shapes. These little divisions of royale must always be stamped very neatly and quite regularly. 215 chiffonade the name chiffonade is given to a mince of sorrel or lettuce intended as a complement for such soups as potage de saute or le germany etc or various clear consommes like julienne to prepare chiffonade first carefully shred the sorrel or lettuce and remove therefrom all the leaf ribs carefully wash the leaves and squeeze the latter tightly between the fingers of the left hand and the table. Now cut them into fine strips with a sharp knife. If the chiffonade be intended for a consomme, add it to the latter half an hour before dishing up. It is thus actually cooked in the soup itself. If, as in most often the case, it be intended for a thick soup, it is better to let it melt well into butter, 
to moisten it with a little consomme and to let it boil for ten minutes before adding it to the soup. Whatever the purpose be for which it is made, chiffonade should always be prepared with very tender sorrel or lettuce. 216. Directions for Soup with Pastes Vermicelli and the various Italian pastes should measure about three ounces per quart of consomme. They should first be thrown into boiling salted water, where they are left to poach for three minutes, whereupon they are drained, cooled, and their cooking is completed in the consomme. The parboiling of these pastes is necessary in order to get rid of the little agglomerations of flour which adhere to them and which would otherwise make the consomme cloudy. Tapioca, sago, celop, etc., should also be apportioned at about three ounces per quart. But this is only an average, for the quality of this kind of products varies greatly, and it is best to choose the goods of an excellent maker, and in order to avoid surprises, to abide by that choice. These products need no parboiling. They are merely sprinkled into the boiling consomme while stirring the latter, and they are left to cook until the soup is quite clear. The boiling should be gentle, and the scum should be removed as often as it forms. The time allowed for cooking naturally varies in accordance with the quality of the goods, but the absolute transparency of the consomme is an infallible sign of its having been completed. Brazilian, Japanese, and other pearls are used in the same quantities, but they should poach for thirty minutes if required to be very transparent. 217. Threaded Eggs Beat up three eggs in a bowl, season with salt and pepper, and strain through a sieve. Now pour the eggs into a fine strainer, hold same over a saucepan containing some boiling consomme, and shift it about in such a wise as to let the egg fall in threads into the boiling liquid beneath, and thus immediately coagulate. Drain the egg threads very carefully, lest they break. 218. Profiteroles for Soups These consist of little choux about the size of a large hazelnut, stuffed with some kinds of puree, such as that of foie gras with cream, or of chicken, or of vegetables, etc. Four profiteroles should be allowed for each person. To make profiteroles, put a few tablespoonfuls of pâté au chaud without sugar, number 2374, into a piping bag fitted with a smooth pipe, whose orifice should be about one quarter inch in diameter. Squeeze out portions of the preparation onto a tray so as to form balls about the size of a small hazelnut. Gild by means of beaten egg applied with a fine brush and cook in a moderate oven. Do not take the profiteroles from the oven until they are quite dry. End of section 11 Recording by Marian Servasi Section 12 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marian Servasi A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1 By Auguste Escoffier Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 9 Garnishing Preparations for Relevés and Entrees 219. Potato Croquettes Cook quickly in salted water two pounds of peeled and quartered potatoes. As soon as they seem soft to the finger, drain them, place them in the front of the oven for a few minutes in order to dry them, and then tilt them into a sieve lying on a cloth and press them through the former without rubbing. Place the puree in a sauté pan, season with salt, pepper, and nutmeg. Add one ounce of butter and dry, i.e., stir over a brisk fire until the puree becomes a consistent paste. Take off the fire, 
complete with the yolks of three eggs well mixed with the rest and turn the paste out onto a buttered dish taking care to spread it in a rather thin layer so as to precipitate its cooling butter the surface to prevent the preparations drying to make croquettes equal portions of this paste i e portions weighing about one and one half ounce of it are rolled on a flour dusted board into the shape of a cork a ball or a croix these are now dipped into an anglaise number one seven four and rolled in bread crumbs or raspings the latter being well padded on to the surface of the croquettes lest they should fall into the frying fat let the padding also avail for finishing off the selected shape of the objects these are then plunged into hot fat where they should remain until they have acquired a fine golden color two twenty dauphine potatoes prepare as above the required quantity of paste and add thereto per pound six ounces of pate a chaud without sugar number two three seven four mix the two constituents thoroughly dauphine potatoes are molded in the shape of small cylinders and they are treated a l'anglaise like the croquettes two twenty one duchess potatoes these are the same as the croquettes though they are differently treated they are made on a floured board in the shape of diminutive cottage loaves little shuttle-shaped loaves small quats and lozenges or rectangles they are gilded with beaten egg and when their shape is that of quats rectangles or lozenges they are streaked by means of a small knife after this operation which is to prevent the gilding from blistering they are baked in the oven for a few minutes previous to being used in dressing the dishes they accompany two twenty two marquise potatoes take one pound of croquette paste and add thereto six ounces of very red reduced tomato puree pour this mixture into a bag fitted with a large grooved pipe and squeeze it out upon a baking tray in shapes resembling large meringues slightly gild their surfaces with beaten egg and put them into the oven for a few minutes before using them to dress the dish two twenty three ordinary or dry duxel the uses of duxel are legend and it is prepared thus slightly fry one teaspoonful of onions in one tablespoonful of butter and oil mixed add to this four tablespoons full of mushroom stalks and parings chopped and well pressed in a towel with the view of expelling their vegetable moisture stir over a brisk fire until the latter has completely evaporated season with salt pepper and nutmeg and one coffee spoonful of well chopped parsley mixing the whole thoroughly transfer to a bowl cover with a piece of white buttered paper and put aside until wanted two twenty four duxel for stuffed vegetables tomatoes mushrooms etc put six tablespoonfuls of dry duxel into a small stewpan and add thereto three tablespoonfuls of half glazed sauce containing plenty of tomato crushed garlic the size of a pea and two tablespoonfuls of white wine set to simmer until the required degree of consistence is reached note well a tablespoonful of fine fresh bread crumbs may be added to the duxel in order to thicken it two twenty five duxel for garnishing small pies onions cucumbers etc to four tablespoonfuls of dried duxel add four tablespoonfuls of ordinary pork forced meat number one nine six two twenty six maintenon preparation used in stuffing preparations a la maintenon put one pint of becmel into a vegetable pan with one half pint of soubies number one zero four and reduce to one half while stirring over a brisk fire thicken away from the fire by means of the yolks of five eggs and add four tablespoonfuls of minced mushrooms either cooked in the ordinary way or stewed in butter two twenty seven 
Mantignon. This preparation serves chiefly for covering certain large joints of butcher's meat or fowl, to which it imparts an appropriate flavor. It is made as follows. Finely mince two medium carrots, the red part only, two onions, and two sticks of celery taken from the heart. Add one tablespoonful of raw lean ham, cut paysan fashion, a sprig of thyme, and half a leaf of bay crushed. Stew in butter, and finally swill the saucepan with two tablespoonfuls of Madeira. 228. Mirepoix. The purpose of Mirepoix in culinary preparations is the same as that of Matignon, but its mode of use is different. Its constituents are the same as those of the Matignon, but instead of being minced, they are cut up into more or less fine dice, in accordance with the use for which the preparation is intended. Instead of the ham, fresh and slightly salted breast of pork may be used, while both the ham and the bacon may be excluded under certain circumstances. 229. Fine or Bordelais Mirepoix Coarse mirepoix, which are added to certain preparations in order to lend these the proper flavor, are generally made immediately before being used, but this is not so in the case of the finer mirepoix, which chiefly serves as an adjunct to crayfish and lobster. This is made in advance, and as follows. Cut into dice four ounces of the red part only of carrots, the same quantity of onion, and one ounce of parsley stalks. In order that the mirepoix may be still finer, these ingredients may now be chopped, but in this case it is advisable to thoroughly press them in a corner of a towel so as to squeeze out their vegetable moisture, the mere process of stewing not being sufficient for this purpose. Should this water be allowed to remain in the mirepoix, more particularly if the latter must be kept some time, it would probably give rise to mustiness or fermentation. Put the ingredients into a small stew pan with one and one half ounce of butter and a little powdered thyme and bay, and stew until all are well cooked. This done, turn the preparation out into a small bowl, heap it together with the back of a fork, cover it with a piece of white buttered paper, and put aside until wanted. 230. Various Salpicons. This term stands for a certain preparatory method applied to a series of preparations. Salpicons are simple or compound. Simple if they only contain one product, such as the meat of a fowl, or of game, butcher's meat, foie gras, various fish, ham or tongue, mushrooms, truffles, etc. Compound, if they consist of two or more of the above-mentioned ingredients, which may happen to combine suitably. The preparation method consists of cutting the various ingredients into dice. The series of preparations arises from the many possible combinations of the products, each particular combination bearing its own name. Thus, salpicons may be royal, financier, chasseur, parisien, montglau, etc., of whichever kind, however, salpicons are always incorporated with a vehicular sauce which is in accordance with their constituents. 231. Batter for Various Fritters Put into a bowl one pound of sifted flour, one quarter ounce of salt, one tablespoonful of oil or melted butter, and the necessary quantity of barely lukewarm water. If the batter is to be used at once, mix the ingredients by turning them over and over without stirring with the spoon, for this would give the preparation an elasticity which would prevent its adhering to immersed solids. Should the batter be prepared beforehand, however, it may be stirred since it loses its elasticity when left to stand any length of time. Before using it, add the whites of two eggs whisked to a froth. 232. Batter for Vegetables Salsify, celery, etc. Put one pound of sifted flour into a bowl with one quarter ounce of salt and two tablespoonfuls of oil or melted butter. Dilute with one egg and the necessary quantity of cold water. Keep this batter somewhat thin, do not stir it, 
and let it rest for a few hours before using. 233. Batter for Fruit and Flour Fritters Put one pound of flour into a bowl with one quarter ounce of salt and two tablespoonfuls of oil or melted butter. Dilute gradually with one quarter pint of beer and a little tempered water. When about to use the batter, mix therewith the whites of two eggs whisked to a froth. Note well, keep this batter thin, if anything, and above all, do not stir over much. 234. Batter for Oven Glazed Fruit Fritters Mix one pound of flour with two tablespoonfuls of oil, a grain of salt, two eggs, added one after the other, the necessary quantity of water, and one ounce of sugar. Keep this preparation in a lukewarm place to let it ferment, and stir it with a wooden spoon before using it to immerse the solids. Remarks Batter for fruit fritters may contain a few tablespoonfuls of brandy, in which case an equal quantity of the water must be suppressed. 235. Provençal Preparation for Stuffing Cutlets a la Provençal Put one pint of bechamel into a vegetable pan and reduce it until it has become quite dense. Thicken it with the yolks of four eggs and finish it away from the fire with a crushed piece of garlic as large as a pea and one quarter pound of grated cheese. End of section 12. Recording by Marion Servasi. Section 13 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1 by Auguste Escoffier. Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 10, Part 1, Leading Culinary Operations 236. The Preparation of Soups The nutritious liquids, known under the name of soups, are of comparatively recent origin. Indeed, as they are now served, they do not date any further back than the early years of the 19th century. The soups of old cookery were, really, complete dishes, wherein the meats and vegetables used in their preparation were assembled. They, moreover, suffered from the effects of the general confusion which reigned in the menus of those days. These menus seemed to have depended in no wise for their items upon the progressive satisfaction of the consumer's appetites and a long procession of dishes was far more characteristic of the meal than their judicious order and diversity. In this respect, as in so many others, Carême was the reformer, and if he were not, strictly speaking, the actual initiator of the changes which ushered in our present methods, he certainly had a large share in the establishment of the new theories. Nevertheless, it took his followers almost a century to bring soups to the perfection of today, for modern cookery has replaced those stodgy dishes of yore by comparatively simple and savory preparations which are veritable wonders of delicacy and taste. Now, my attention has been called to the desirability of drawing up some sort of classification of soups, if only with the view of obviating the absurdity of placing such preparations as are indiscriminately called bisque, puree, coulis, or cream under the same head. Logically, each preparation should have its own special formula, and it is impossible to admit that one and the same can apply to all. It is generally admitted that the terms velouté and creams, whose introduction into the vocabulary of cookery is comparatively recent, 
are peculiarly well suited to supplant those of bisque and culi, which are steadily becoming obsolete, as well as that too vulgar term, puree. Considerations of this kind naturally led me to a new classification of soups, and this I shall disclose later. I shall not make any lengthy attempt here to refute the arguments of certain autocrats of the dinner table, who, not so many years ago, urged the total abolition of soups. I shall only submit to their notice the following quotation from Grimaud de la Reyniere, one of our most illustrious gastronomistes. Soup is to a dinner what the porch or gateway is to a building. That is to say, it must not only form the first portion thereof, but it must be so devised as to convey some idea of the whole to which it belongs, or, after the manner of an overture in a light opera, it should divulge what is to be the dominant phrase of the melody throughout. I am at one with Grimaud in this, and believe that soups have come to stay. Of all the items on a menu, soup is that which exacts the most delicate perfection and the strictest attention for upon the first impression it gives to the diner, the success of the latter part of the meal largely depends. Soups should be served as hot as possible in very warm plates, especially in the case of consommé, when these have been preceded by cold hors d'oeuvre. Hors d'oeuvre are pointless in a dinner, and even when oysters stand as such, they should only be allowed at meals which include no soup. Those hors d'oeuvres, which consist of various fish, smoked or in oil, and strongly seasoned salads, leave a disagreeable taste on the consumer's palate, and make the soup which follows seem flat and insipid if the latter be not served boiling hot. Classification of Soups this includes 1. Clear soups, 2. Thick soups, 3. Special soups of various kinds, 4. Classical vegetable soups, including some local preparations, 237. Clear soups. Clear soups, of whatever nature the base thereof may be, whether butcher's meat, poultry, game, fish, shellfish, or turtle, and so on, are made according to one method only. They are always clear consommé, to which has been added a slight garnish, in keeping with the nature of the consommé. 238. Thick Soups These are divided into three leading classes as follows. 1. The puree coulis or bisque, two, various velouté, three, various creams. Remarks. Though the three preparations of the first class are practically the same, and generally speaking, the coulis and the bisque may be considered as puree of fowl, game, or shellfish, it is advisable to distinguish one from another by giving each a special name of its own. Thus the word puree is most suitably applied to any preparation with a vegetable base. The term culi is best fitted to preparations having either poultry, game, or fish for a base, while bisque in spite of the fact that in former days it was applied indiscriminately to puree of shellfish, poultry, pigeons, etc., distinctly denotes a puree of shellfish, either lobster, crayfish, or shrimp, and so on. In short, it is imperative to avoid all ambiguities and to give everything its proper name, or, at least, that name which identifies it most correctly. 
239. Puree. Farinaceous vegetables, such as haricot beans and lentils, and the floury ones, such as the potato, need no additional thickening ingredient, since the flour or fecula which they contain amply suffices for the leason of their puree. On the other hand, aqueous vegetables like carrots, pumpkins, turnips, celery, and herbs cannot dispense with a thickening ingredient, as their puree of themselves do not cohere in the least. Cohering or thickening elements, their quantities. In order to affect the coherence of vegetable puree, either rice, potato, or breadcrumb cut into dice and fried in butter may be used. The proportion of these per pound of vegetables should be respectively 3 ounces, 10 ounces, and 10 ounces. Breadcrumb dice, prepared as described above, were generally used in old cookery, and they lend a mellowness to a puree which is quite peculiar to them. The dilution of puree. Generally, this is done by means of ordinary white consomme though in certain cases, as for instance if the soup is a Lenten one, milk is used. The Finishing When the puree have been strained and brought to the required consistence, they should be boiled and stirred. Then they are placed on the side of the fire to simmer for twenty-five or thirty minutes. It is at this stage that they are purified by means of the careful removal of all the scum that forms on their surface. When dishing up, complete them away from the fire with three ounces of butter per quart of soup, and pass them once more through a strainer. Puree garnishes. These are usually either small fried crusts, small dice of potato fried in butter, a chiffonade, some kind of little brunoise, or, more generally, chevril pluche. 240. Coulis. Coulis have for their base either poultry, game, or fish. The thickening ingredients used are for fowl, two or three ounces of rice, or three-quarters pint of poultry volute per pound of fowl. For game, three or four ounces of lentils, or three-quarters pint of game espagnol per pound of game. For fish, a clear panada made up of French bread soaked in boiling salted milk. Use five ounces of bread and one good pint of milk per pound of fish. Having strained and made up the coulis, boil them while stirring, except in the case of fish coulis, which must not boil and must be served as soon as they are made. Then place them in a bain-marie and butter their surfaces lest a skin should form. At the last moment, complete them with two or three ounces of butter per quart. The garnish of poultry or game coulis consists of either small dice of game or fowl fillets, which should be kept aside for the purpose. A fine julienne of these fillets, or small quenelle, made from the latter, raw. The garnish of fish coulis is generally fish fillets poached in butter and cut up into small dice or in julienne fashion. 241. Bisque. The invariable base of bisque is shellfish cooked in mirepoix. Their thickening ingredients are, or may be, rice, fish velouté, or crusts of bread fried in butter, the proportion being three ounces of rice, ten ounces of bread crusts, or three-quarters pint of fish velouté per pound of shellfish cooked in mirepoix, number 228. 
When the soup is strained, treat it in precisely the same way as the coulis. The garnish consists of small dice of the meat from the shellfish used. These pieces should have been put aside from the first. 242. The Volute These differ from the puree, coulis, and bisque in that their invariable thickening element is a volute whose preparation is in harmony with the nature of the ingredients of the soup, these being either vegetables, poultry, game, fish, or shellfish. The preparation of the volute. Allow three and one-half ounces of white roux per quart of diluent. This diluent should be ordinary consomme for a volute of vegetables or herbs, chicken consomme for a poultry volute, or very clear fish fume for a fish or shellfish volute. The procedure is exactly the same as that described under number 26 of the leading sauces. The Apportionment of the Ingredients in general, the quantities of each constituent are in the following proportion. Volute, one-half. The puree of the substance which characterizes the soup, one-quarter. The consomme used to bring the soup to its proper consistence, one-quarter. In respect of finishing ingredients, use, for thickening, the yolks of three eggs, and one-fifth pint of cream per quart of soup. Thus, for four quarts of poultry volute, we arrive at the following quantities. Poultry volute, three pints. Puree of fowl obtained from a cleaned and drawn hen, weighing about three pounds, one quart. Consomme for regulating consistence, one quart. Leason, twelve yolks, and four-fifths pint of cream. Rules relative to the preparation. If the volute is to be of lettuce, chicory, celery, or mixed herbs, these ingredients are scalded for five minutes, drained, gently stewed in butter, and added to the prepared volute in which their cooking is completed. If carrots, turnips, onions, and so on are to be treated, finely mince them, stew them in butter without allowing them to acquire any color, and add them to the volute. If fowl be the base, cook it in the volute. This done, withdraw it, remove the meat finely pound same, and add it to the volute, which is then rubbed through tammy. In the case of fish, the procedure is the same as for fowl. For game, roast or sauté the selected piece, bone it, finely pound the meat, and combine the latter with the volute, which should then be rubbed through tammy. For shellfish, cook these in a mirepoix, finely pound them together with the latter, add to the volute, and pass the whole through tammy. The Completing of Volute Having passed the soup through tammy, bring it to its proper degree of consistence with the necessary quantity of consommé. Boil while stirring and place in a bain-marie. At the last moment, finish the soup with the leason and two ounces of butter per quart of liquid. Garnish for Volute In the case of vegetables, chiffonade, fine printanier, or brunoise. For fowl and game, the fillets of one or the other, poached and cut into small dice, or in julienne fashion. Add quenelle made with the raw fillets, or either fowl or game royal. For fish, Small dice or fine julienne of fish fillets poached in butter. For shellfish, small dice of cooked shellfish meat put aside for the purpose. Remarks. In certain circumstances, these garnishes are increased by means of three tablespoonfuls 
of poached rice per quart of the soup. 243. The creams. Practically speaking, the preparation of the creams is the same as that of the volute, but for the following exceptions. 1. In all circumstances, that is, whatever be the nature of the soup, volute is substituted for clear bechamel. 2. The correct consistence of the soup is got by means of milk instead of consomme. 3. Creams do not require egg yolk lesions. 4. They are not buttered, but they are finished with one-fifth or two-fifths pint of fresh cream per quart. Creams allow of the same garnishes as the volute. 244. Special Soups and Thickened Consomme These are of different kinds, though their preparation remains the same, and they do not lend themselves to the requirements of volute or creams. I should quote as types of this class the Ambassador, à l'Américaine, Darblay, Fulbun, and so on. The same holds good with thickened consommé, such as Germini, Coquelin, and so on. 245. Vegetable Soups These soups, of which the Paysan is the radical type, do not demand very great precision in the apportionment of the vegetables of which they are composed, but they need great care and attention notwithstanding. The vegetables, in the majority of cases, must undergo a long stewing in butter, an operation the object of which is to expel their vegetable moisture and to saturate them with butter. In respect of others which have a local character, the vegetables should be cooked with the diluent, without a preparatory stewing. 246. Foreign Soups In the course of Part 2 of this work, I shall allude to certain soups which have a foreign origin, and whose use, although it may not be general, is yet sufficiently common. If only for the sake of novelty or variety, it is occasionally permissible to poach upon the preserves of foreign nations. But apart from this, there exist among the recipes of foreigners many which can but enrich their adopter, besides being generally appreciated. End of section 13. Reading by Malone. Section 14 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1, by Auguste Escoffier. Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 10, Part 2, Leading Culinary Operations Braising, Poaching, Sauté, and Poiling Except for the roasts, grills, and fryings, which will be discussed later, all culinary operations dealing with meat are related to one of the four following methods braising, poiling, poaching, and sauté. These four methods of cooking belong, however, to the sauces, and this explains how it is that the latter hold such a preeminent position in French cookery. Before devoting any attention to particular formulae, which will be given in the second part of this work, it seemed desirable to me to recapitulate in a general way the theory of each of these cooking methods. These theories are of paramount importance, since it is only with the complete knowledge of them that good results may be obtained by the culinary operator. 247. 
ordinary brazings. Of all the various culinary operations, brazings are the most expensive and the most difficult. Long and assiduous practice alone can teach the many difficulties that this mode of procedure entails, for it is one which demands extraordinary care and the most constant attention. Over and above the question of care and that of the quality of meat used, which latter consideration is neither more nor less important here than in any other cooking operation, there are also these conditions to be fulfilled in order that a good brazing may be obtained, namely, that excellent stock should be used in moistening and that the brazing base be well prepared. Meats that are braised. Mutton and beef are braised in the ordinary way, but veal, lamb, and poultry are braised in a manner which I shall treat of later. Meat intended for braising need not, as in the case of roasts, be that of young beasts. The best for the purpose is that derived from an animal of three to six years of age, in the case of beef, and one to two years in the case of mutton. Good meat is rarely procured from animals more advanced than these in years, and even so, should it be used, it would not only be necessary to protract the time of cooking inordinately, but the resulting food would probably be fibrous and dry. Properly speaking, meat derived from old or ill-nourished beasts only answers two purposes in cookery, namely, the preparation of consomme and that of various kinds of stock. THE LARDING OF MEATS FOR BRAZING When the meat to be braised is ribs or fillet of beef, it is always interlarded, and consequently never dry if of decent quality. But this is not the case with the meat of the rumps or the leg of mutton. These meats are not sufficiently fat of themselves to allow of prolonged cooking without their becoming dry. For this reason, they are larded with square strips of bacon fat, which should be as long as the meat under treatment, and about half an inch thick. These strips of fat are first seasoned with pepper, nutmeg, and spices, besprinkled with chopped parsley, and then marinated for two hours in a little brandy. They should be inserted into the meat equidistantly by means of special larding needles. The proportion of fat to the meat should be about three ounces per pound. To marinade braisings. Larded or not, the meats intended for braising gain considerably from being marinated for a few hours in the wines which are to supply their moistening and the aromatics constituting the base of their liquor. Before doing this, season them with salt, pepper, and spices, rolling them over and over in these in order that they may absorb the seasoning thoroughly. Then place them in a receptacle just large enough to contain them between two litters of aromatics which will be detailed hereafter. Cover them with the wine which forms part of their braising liquor, and which is generally a white or red vin ordinaire. In the proportion of one quarter pint per pound of meat, and leave them to marinade for about six hours, taking care to turn them over three or four times during that period. The aromatics or base of the braising. These are thickly sliced and fried carrots and onions in the proportion of one ounce per pound of meat, one faggot, including one garlic clove, and one and one half ounce of fresh blanched bacon rind. To fry, prepare, and cook braised meat. 
Having sufficiently marinated the meat, drain it on a sieve for half an hour and wipe it dry with a clean piece of linen. Heat some clarified fat of white consomme in a thick saucepan of convenient size or a braising pan, and when it is sufficiently hot, put the meat in the saucepan and let it acquire color on all sides. The object of this operation is to cause a contraction of the pores of the meat, thereby surrounding the latter with a species of cuirass, which prevents the inner juices from escaping too soon and converting the braising into a boiling process. The frying should therefore be a short or lengthy process according as to whether the amount of meat to be braised be small or large. Having properly fried the meat, withdraw it from the braising pan, cover it with slices of larding bacon, if it be lean, and string it. In the case of fillets and ribs of beef, this treatment may be dispensed with, as they are sufficiently well supplied with their own fat. Now pour the marinade prepared for the meat into the braising pan, and place the meat on a litter composed of the vegetables the marinade contained. Cover the pan and rapidly reduce the wine therein. When this has assumed the consistency of syrup, add sufficient brown stock to cover the meat, it being understood that the latter only just conveniently fills the pan. Cover the braising pan, set to boil, and then put it in a moderate oven. Let the meat cook until it may be deeply pricked with a braiding needle without any blood being drawn. At this stage, the first phase of braising, whereof the theory shall be given hereafter, comes to an end, and the meat is transferred to another clean utensil, just large enough to hold it. With respect to the cooking liquor, either of the two following modes of procedure may now be adopted. 1. If the liquor is required to be clear, it need only be strained over the meat, through muslin, while the braising pan should be placed in the oven, where the cooking may go on until completed, interrupting it only from time to time in order to baste the meat. This done, thicken the liquor with arrowroot, after the manner of an ordinary thickened gravy. Number 41. 2. If, on the contrary, a sauce be required, the liquor should be reduced to half before being put back on the meat, and it is restored to its former volume by means of two-thirds of its quantity of espagnol sauce, and one-third of tomato puree, or an equivalent quantity of fresh tomatoes. The cooking of the meat is completed in this sauce, and the basting should be carried on as before. When it is cooked, that is to say, when the point of a knife may be easily thrust into it without meeting with any resistance whatsoever, it should be carefully withdrawn from the sauce. The latter should be again strained through muslin, and then left to rest, with a view to letting the grease settle on the surface. Carefully remove this grease, and rectify the sauce with a little excellent stock, if it is too thick, or by reduction, if it is too thin. The Glazing of Braised Meat Braised meat is glazed in order to make it more sightly but this operation is by no means essential, and it is quite useless when the meat is cut up previous to being served. To glaze meat, place it as soon as cooked in the front of the oven. Sprinkle it slightly with its cooking liquor, gravy or sauce, and push it into the oven so that this liquor may dry. Being very gelatinous, the latter adheres to the meat while its superfluous water evaporates, and thus coats the solid with a thin film of meat glaze. 
This operation is renewed eight or ten times, whereupon the meat is withdrawn from the oven, placed on a dish, and covered until it is served. Various Remarks Relative to Braising When a braised meat is to be accompanied by vegetables, as in the case of beef a la mode, these vegetables may either be cooked with the meat during the second braising phase, after they have been duly colored in butter with a little salt and sugar, or they may be cooked separately with a portion of the braising liquor. The first procedure is the better, but it lends itself less to a correct final dressing. It is therefore the operator's business to decide, according to the circumstances, which is the more suitable of the two. I pointed out above that the cooking of braised meat consists of two phases, and I shall now proceed to discuss each of these, so that the reader may thoroughly understand their processes. It has been seen that meat, to be braised, must in the first place be fried all over, and this more particularly when it is very thick. The object of this operation is to hold in the meat's juices, which would otherwise escape from the cut surfaces. Now this frying produces a kind of cuirass around the flesh, which gradually thickens during the cooking process until it reaches the center. Under the influence of the heat of the surrounding liquor, the meat fibers contract and steadily drive the contained juices towards the center. Soon the heat reaches the center, where, after having effected a decomposition of the juices therein collected, the latter release the superfluous water they contain. This water quickly vaporizes, and by so doing distends and separates the tissues surrounding it. Thus, during this first phase, a concentration of juices takes place in the center of the meat. It will now be seen that they undergo an absolutely different process in the second. As shown, the disaggregation of the muscular tissue begins in the center of the meat, as soon as the temperature which reaches there is sufficiently intense to vaporize the collected juices. The tension of the vapor given off by the latter perforce increases by dint of finding no issue. It therefore exerts considerable pressure upon the tissues, though now its direction is the reverse of what it was in the first place, that is, from the center to the periphery. Gradually the tissues relax under the pressure, and the effects of cooking, and the work of disaggregation having gradually reached the fried surface, the latter also relaxes in its turn, and allows the constrained juices to escape and to mix with the sauce. At the same time, however, the latter begins to filter through the meat, and this it does in accordance with a well-known physical law namely, capillarity. This stage of the braising demands the most attentive care. The braising liquor is found to be considerably reduced and no longer covers the meat, for the operation is nearing its end. The bared meat would therefore dry very quickly if care were not taken to baste it constantly and to turn it over and over so that the whole of the muscular tissue is moistened and thoroughly saturated with the sauce. By this means, the meat acquires that mellowness which is typical of braisings and distinguishes them from other preparations. I should be loath to dismiss this subject before pointing out two practices in the cooking of braisings which are as common as they are absolutely wrong. The first of these is the uh, passage of the braising base. Instead of laying the fried meat on a litter of aromatics, likewise fried beforehand, many operators place the meat, which they often omit to fry, on raw aromatics at the bottom of the braising pan. The whole is sprinkled with a little melted fat, and the aromatics are left to fry, on one side only, 
until they begin to burn on the bottom of the receptacle. If this operation were properly conducted, it might be tolerated, even though aromatics, which are only fried on one side, cannot exude the same savor as those which are fried all over. But nine times out of ten, the frying is too lengthy a process. From neglect or absent-mindedness, the aromatics are left to burn on the bottom of the pan, and there results a bitterness which pervades and spoils the whole sauce. As a matter of fact, this process of passage is an absurd caricature of a method of preparing brazings which was very common in old cookery the custom of which was not to prepare the brazing liquor in advance, but to cook it and its ingredients simultaneously with the meat to be braised. This method, though excellent, was very expensive, the meats forming the base of the brazing liquor, consisting of thick slices of raw ham or veal. The observance of economy, therefore, long ago compelled cooks to abandon this procedure. But routine has perpetuated the form of the latter without insisting upon the use of its constituents, which were undoubtedly its essential part. Routine has even, in certain cases, aggravated the first error by instituting a habit consisting of substituting bones for the meats formerly employed an obviously ridiculous practice. In the production of ordinary consomme, number one, we saw that bones, even when taken from veal, as is customary in the case of brazing liquor, require at the very least ten to twelve hours of cooking before they can yield all their soluble properties. As a proof of this, it is interesting to note that if bones undergo only five or six hours of cooking and are moistened afresh and cooked for a further six hours, the liquor of the second cooking yields more meat glaze than that of the first, though it must be admitted that, while the latter is more gelatinous, it has less savor. But this gelatinous property of bones is no less useful to braisings than is their savor, since it is the former that supplies the mellowness, which nothing can replace, and without which the sauce can have no quality. Since, therefore, the longest time that a brazing can cook is from four to six hours, it follows that if bones be added therein, their properties will scarcely have begun disaggregating when the meat is cooked. They will, in fact, have yielded but an infinitesimal portion of these properties. Wherefore, their addition to the brazing is, to say the least, quite useless. It now remains to be proved that the above method is bad from another point of view. I suppose I need not fear contradiction when I assert that, in order that a brazing may be good, its sauce should be short and correspondingly substantial. Also, that the sauce obtained from a piece of meat moistened with a quart of liquid cannot be so good as that resulting from the moistening of a pint only. It is more particularly on this account that I advise a brazing utensil which can only just hold the meat, for since, in the first stage, the meat is only moistened with the brazing liquor, the smaller the receptacle may be, the less liquor will it require, and the latter will, in consequence, be the tastier. Hence, if bones be added to the brazing, the utensil must necessarily be larger, and a greater quantity of brazing liquor must be used. But this liquor will not be nearly so savory as that obtained from the process I recommend. In fact, it will be but a rather strong broth, quite unfit for the impregnation of the meat, and the final result will be a tasteless lump of fiber instead of a succulent brazing. I must apologize to the reader for my insistence with regard to these questions, 
but their importance is such that success is beyond reach in the matter of brown sauces and braisings unless the above details have been thoroughly grasped. Moreover, the explanations given will afford considerable help in the understanding of operations which I shall give later. Therefore, it is to be hoped that the examination of the theories involved, however long this has been, will prove of use and assistance. 248. Braising of White Meats The braising of white meats, as it is now effected in modern cookery, is, strictly speaking, not braising at all, inasmuch as the cooking is stopped at the close of the first of the two phases which I mentioned when discussing brown braisings. True, old cookery did not understand braising in the way that the modern school does, and under the ancient regime large pieces, especially of veal, were frequently cooked until they could almost be scooped with a spoon. This practice has been generally, though mistakenly, eschewed, but its name survives. While braisings are made with the neck, the saddle, the loin, the fillets, the fricandeau, and the sweetbread of veal, young turkeys and fat pullets, and sometimes, though less frequently, relevé of lamb, hindquarters, or saddle. The procedure is the same for all these meats. The time of cooking alone varies in accordance with their size. The aromatics are the same as those of the brown braisings, but the frying of them is optional. The moistening liquor is brown veal stock, number nine. Mode of procedure. Except for the veal sweetbread, which is always blanched before being braised, the meats or poultry to be treated may always be slightly stiffened and browned in butter on all sides. This is not essential in all cases, but I think that when they do undergo something of the kind, they dry less quickly. Now place them in a utensil just large enough to hold them and deep enough to keep the lid from touching them. Place the aromatics under them and moisten with a little veal stock. Set to boil on a moderate fire, and reduce the veal stock with the lid on. When this stock has assumed the consistence of a glaze, add a further similar quantity of fresh stock, and reduce as before. The third time, moisten the veal until it is half covered, and push the pan into a moderate oven. The meat needs constant basting while it cooks, in order to avoid its drying, and, as the stock is very gelatinous, it forms a coating on the surface which resists the evaporation of the contained juices. For these, being insufficiently constrained by the slight frying the meat has undergone, tend to vaporize under the influence of the heat. It is for this reason that the stock must be reduced to a glaze before finally moistening. If the moistening were all done at once, the liquor would not be sufficiently dense to form the coating mentioned above, and the meat would consequently dry on being set to cook. Braised white meat is known to be cooked when, after having deeply pricked it with a braiding needle, it exudes an absolutely colorless liquid. This liquid denotes that the piece is cooked to the center, and as a result thereof, the blood has decomposed. There lies the great difference between brown braisings and white meat braisings. The latter are practically roasts, and they should not be made with any but young poultry or meats, very fat and tender for they cannot go beyond their correct time of cooking, which equals that of roasts, without immediately losing all their quality. 
a quarter of an hour too much in the cooking of a kernel of veal weighing about six pounds is enough to make the meat dry and unpalatable and to thoroughly spoil it, whereas a brown braising cannot be overcooked provided it do not burn. White braised meats are generally glazed, and this process is especially recommended for larded pieces, which, though less common nowadays than formerly, can still claim many votaries. End of section 14. Reading by Malone. Section 15 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1, by Auguste Escoffier. Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 10, Part 3, Leading Culinary Operations 249, Poachings However nonsensical it may sound, the best possible definition of a poaching is a boiling that does not boil. The term poach is extended to all slow processes of cooking which involve the use of a liquor, however small. Thus the term poach applies to the cooking of court bouillon of large pieces of turbot and salmon, as well as to fillets of sole cooked with a little fish fumet, to hot mousseline and mousse cooked in moulds, to quenelles which are cooked in salted water, to eggs announced as poached, to creams, various royales, and so on. It will readily be seen that among so many different products, the time allowed for the cooking, in each case, must differ sometimes widely from the rest. The treatment of them all, however, is subject to this unalterable principle, namely, that the poaching liquor must not boil, though it should reach a degree of heat as approximate as possible to boiling point. Another principle is that large pieces of fish or poultry be set to boil in cold liquor, after which the latter is brought to the required temperature as rapidly as possible. The case may be the same with fillet of sole or poultry, which are poached almost dry but all other preparations whose mode of cooking is poaching gain by being immersed in liquor which has reached the required temperature beforehand. Having regard to the multitudinous forms and kinds of products that are poached, it would be somewhat difficult to state here the details and peculiarities proper to each in the matter of poaching. I think, therefore, I should do better to leave these details to the respective recipes of each product, though it will now be necessary to disclose the way of poaching poultry, if only with a view to thoroughly acquainting the reader with the theory propounded above. Properly prepare the piece of poultry to be poached, and truss it with its feet folded back alongside of the breast. If it is to be stuffed, this should be done before trussing. If it is to be larded or studded, either with truffles, ham, or tongue, rub it when trussed on the fillet and legs with half a lemon, and dip the same portions of its body, namely those to be larded or studded, for a few moments in boiling white stock. The object of this operation is to slightly stiffen the skin, thus facilitating the larding or studding. The Cooking of the Piece of Poultry Having stuffed, larded, or studded it, if necessary, and having in any case trussed it, place it in a receptacle just large enough to hold it and moisten with some excellent white stock previously prepared. 
Set to boil, skim, put the lid on, and continue the cooking at a low simmer. It is useless to work too quickly, as the operation would not be shortened a second by so doing. The only results would be, one, too violent evaporation, which would reduce the liquor and disturb its limpidness. Two, the running of a considerable risk of bursting the piece of poultry, especially when the latter is stuffed. The fowl, or whatever it may be, is known to be cooked when, after pricking the thick of the leg close to the drumstick, the issuing liquid is white. Remarks A. The need of poaching poultry in a receptacle just large enough to hold the piece is accounted for as follows. 1. The piece must be wholly immersed in the stock during the cooking process. 2. As the liquor used is afterwards served as an accompanying sauce to the dish, the less there is of it, the more saturated does it become with the juices of the meat, and consequently, the better it is. B. 1. The white stock used in poaching should be prepared beforehand, and be very clear. 2. If the piece of poultry were set to cook with the products constituting the stock, even if these were more than liberally apportioned, the result would be bad, for inasmuch as a fowl, for example, can only take one and one-half hours at the most to cook, and the time required for extracting the nutritious and aromatic principles from the constituents of the stock would be at least six hours, it follows that the fowl would be cooking in little more than hot water, and the resulting sauce would be quite devoid of savor. 250. Poellings. Poellings are, practically speaking, roasts, for the cooking periods of each are the same, except that the former are cooked entirely or almost entirely with butter. They represent a simplified process of old cookery, which consisted in enveloping the object to be treated, after frying it, in a thick coating of matignon. It was then wrapped with thin slices of pork fat, covered with buttered paper, placed in the oven or on a spit, and basted with melted butter while it cooked. This done, its grease was drained away, and the vegetables of the matignon were inserted in the braising pan wherein the piece had cooked, or in a saucepan, and were moistened with excellent Madeira or highly seasoned stock. Then, when the liquor had thoroughly absorbed the aroma of the vegetables, it was strained, and its grease was removed just before dishing up. This excellent method is worthy of continued use in the case of large pieces of poultry. Preparation of Poelled Meats Place in the bottom of a deep and thick receptacle, just large enough to hold the piece to be poelled, a layer of raw matignon, number 227. The meat or piece of poultry is placed on the vegetables after it has been well seasoned and is copiously sprinkled with melted butter. Cover the utensil and push it into an oven whose heat is not too fierce. Set it to cook gently in this way after the manner of a stew and frequently sprinkle with melted butter. When the meats or the pieces of poultry are cooked, the utensil is uncovered, so that the former may acquire a fine color. When they are transferred to a dish which should be kept covered until taken to the table. Now add to the vegetables, which must not be burned, a sufficient quantity of brown veal stock, number nine, transparent and highly seasoned. Set the whole to boil gently for ten minutes. Strain through a serviette. Carefully remove all grease from the poelling stock, 
and send it to the table in a sauce boat at the same time as the meat or poultry, which, by the by, is generally garnished. Remarks on Puellings It is of paramount importance that these be not moistened during the process of cooking, for in that case their savor would be the same as that of braised white meats. Nevertheless, an exception may be made in the case of such feathered game as pheasants, partridges, and quails, to which is added, when nearly cooked, a small quantity of burnt brandy. It is also very important that the vegetables should not have their grease removed before their moistening stock is added to them. The butter used in the cooking absorbs a large proportion of the savor of both the vegetables and the meat under treatment, and to make good this loss, it is essential that the moistening stock remain at least ten minutes in contact with the butter. At the end of this time it may be removed without in the least impairing the aroma of the stock. Special boilings, known as en casserole or en cocotte, the preparations of butcher's meats, of poultry or game, known as en casserole or en cocotte, are actually poellings cooked in special earthenware utensils and served in the same. Generally, preparations known as en casserole are simply cooked in butter without the addition of vegetables. When the cooking is done, the piece under treatment is withdrawn for a moment, and some excellent brown veal stock, number nine, is poured into the utensil. This is left to simmer for a few minutes. The superfluous butter is then removed, the piece is returned to the earthenware utensil, and it is kept hot, without being allowed to boil, until it is dished up. For preparations termed en cocotte, the procedure is the same, except that the piece is garnished with such vegetables as mushrooms, the bottoms of artichokes, small onions, carrots, turnips, and so on, which are either turned or regularly pared, and half cooked in butter before being used. One should endeavor to use only fresh vegetables, and these should be added to the piece constituting the dish in such wise as to complete their cooking with it. The earthenware utensils used for this purpose improve with use, provided they be cleaned with clean fresh water, without any soda or soap. If new utensils have to be used, these should be filled with water, which is set to boil, and they should then undergo at least twelve hours soaking. For the prescribed time, this water should be kept gently boiling, and then the utensils should be well wiped and soaked anew in fresh water before being used. 251. The Sauté What characterizes the process we call sauté is that the object treated is cooked dry, that is to say, solely by means of a fatty substance such as butter, oil, or grease. Sauté are made with cut-up fowl or game, or with butcher's meat suitably divided up for the purpose. All products treated in this way must be frizzled, that is to say, they must be put into the fat when it is very hot, in order that a hardened coating may form around them, which will keep their juices within. This is more particularly desirable for red meats such as beef and mutton. The cooking of fowl sauté must, after the meats have been frizzled, be completed on the stove or, with lid off, in the oven where they should be basted with butter, after the manner of a roast. The pieces are withdrawn from the utensil with a view to swilling the latter, after which, 
if they be put back into the sauce or accompanying garnish, they should only remain therein a few moments or just sufficiently long to become properly warm. The procedure is the same for game sauté. Sautés of butcher's meats, red meats, such as tournado, kernels, cutlets, fillets, and noisettes, are always affected on the stove. The meats are frizzled and cooked with a small quantity of clarified butter. The thinner and smaller they are, the more rapidly should the frizzling process be affected. When blood appears on the surface of their raw side, they should be turned over. When drops of blood begin to bedew the other side, they are known to be cooked. The swelling of the utensil obtains in all sauté. After having withdrawn the treated product from the saucepan, remove the grease and pour the condimentary liquid, a wine, that forms part of the accompanying sauce, into the saucepan. Set to boil, so that the solidified gravy lying on the bottom may dissolve, and add the sauce, or simply add the swilling liquid to the prepared sauce or accompanying garnish of the sauté. The utensil used must always be just large enough to hold the objects to be treated. If it is too large, the parts left uncovered by the treated meats burn, and swilling is then impossible. Whence there results a loss of the solidified gravy, which is an important constituent in the sauce. Sautés of white butcher's meats, such as veal and lamb, must also be frizzled in hot fat, but their cooking must be completed gently on the other side of the fire, and in many cases with lid on. Preparations of a mixed nature, which partly resemble sauté and partly braisings, are also called sauté. Stews, however, is their most suitable name. These dishes are made from beef, veal, lamb, game, and so on, and they are to be found in Part 2, under the headings Estufade, Goula, Sauté, Chausseur, Marengo, Bourgeoise, Navarin, Civet, and so on. In the first stage of their preparation, these meats are cut up small and fried like those of the sauté. In the second, slow cooking with sauce or garnish makes them akin to the braised meats. End of section 15 Reading by Malone Section 16 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1, by Auguste Escoffier. Translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 10, Part 4, Leading Culinary Operations 3. Roasts, Grills, Fryings Roasts Of the two usual methods of roasting, the spit will always be used in preference to the oven if only on account of the conditions under which the operation is effected, and whatever be the kind of fuel used, wood, coal, or gas. The reason of this preference is clear if it be remembered that, in spite of every possible precaution during the progress of an oven roast, it is impossible to avoid an accumulation of vapor around the cooking object in a closed oven and this steam is more particularly objectionable inasmuch as it is excessive in the case of delicately flavored meats which latter are almost if not entirely impaired thereby 
The spitted roast, on the contrary, cooks in the oven in a dry atmosphere, and by this means retains its own peculiar flavor. Hence the unquestionable superiority of spitted roasts over the oven kind, especially in respect of small feathered game. In certain circumstances and places there is no choice of means, and, no lanes woolens, the oven has to be used. But in this case, at least, all possible precautions should be observed in order to counteract the effects of the steam above mentioned. 252. Larding Bacon for Roasts Poultry and game to be roasted ought generally to be partly covered with a large, thin slice of larding bacon, especially those pieces of game which, in special cases, are larded. The object and use of these slices are not only to shield the fillet of fowl and game from the severe heat of the fire, but also to prevent these from drying while the legs, which the heat takes much longer to penetrate than the other parts, are cooking. The slices of bacon should therefore completely cover the breasts of fowl and game, and they should be tied on to the latter by means of string. In some cases, roasts of butcher's meat are covered with layers of veal or beef fat, the object of which is similar to that of the bacon prescribed above. 253. Spitted Roasts The whole theory of roasts on the spit might be condensed as follows. In the case of butcher's meat, calculate the intensity of the heat used according to the piece to be roasted, the latter's size and quality, and the time it has hung. Experience, however, is the best guide for any theory, whatever be its exactness, can only give the leading principles and general rules, and cannot pretend to supply the place of the practiced eye and the accuracy which are the result of experience alone. Nevertheless, I do not say with Bria Savarin that a roaster is born and not made. I merely state that one may become a good roaster with application, observation, care, and a little aptitude. The three following rules will be found to cover all the necessary directions for spitted roasts. 1. All red meats containing a large quantity of juice should be properly set, and then, according to their size, may do undergo the action of a fire capable of radiating a very penetrating heat with little or no flame. 2. In the case of white meats, whose cooking should be thorough, the fire ought to be so regulated as to allow the roast to cook and color simultaneously. 3. With small game, the fuel should be wood, but whatever fuel be used, the fire ought to be made up in such wise as to produce more flame than glowing embers. 254. Oven Roasts The degree of heat used for each roast must be regulated according to the nature and size of the latter, after the manner of spitted roasts. An oven roast, in the first place, should always be placed on a meat stand, and this should be of such a height that at no given moment during the cooking process the meat may come into contact with the juices and fat which have drained from it into the utensil beneath. Failing a proper stand, a spit resting upon the edges of the utensil may be used. No liquid of any kind, gravy or water, need be put in the baking pan. The addition of any liquid is rather prejudicial than otherwise, since by producing vapor which hangs over the roast, it transforms the latter into a stew. 
remarks. Whether spitted or in the oven, a roast must always be frequently basted with a fatty substance, but never with any other liquid. 255. The Gravy of Roasts The real and most natural gravy for roasts is made from the swilling of the baking or dripping pan, even if water be used as the diluent since the contents of these utensils represent a portion of the essential principles of the roast followed from it in the process of cooking. But to obtain this result, neither the utensils nor the gravy ought to have burned. The latter should merely have solidified, and for this reason a roast cooked in a very fierce oven ought to be laid on a pan only just large enough to hold it so that the fat may not burn. The swilling can, in any case, only produce a very small quantity of gravy. Consequently, when it happens that a greater quantity is required, the need is met beforehand by preparing a stock made from bones and trimmings of a similar nature to the roast for which the gravy is required. The procedure for this is as follows. Place the bones and trimmings in a pan with a little fat, and literally roast them. Then transfer them to a saucepan, moisten so as to cover with a tepid, slightly salted water, and add thereto the swillings of the pan wherein they were roasted. Boil, skim, and set to cook gently for three or four hours, according to the nature of the products used. This done, Almost entirely remove the grease, strain through muslin, and put aside for the purpose of swelling the dripping or baking pan of the roast. Swelling Having removed the roast from the spit or oven, take off a portion of the grease from the baking or dripping pan, and pour into it the required quantity of prepared gravy. Reduce the whole by half, strain through muslin, and almost entirely remove grease. It is a mistake to remove all the grease from, and to clarify, the gravy of roasts. Treated thus, they are certainly clearer and more sightly, but a large proportion of their savor is lost, and it should be borne in mind that the gravy of a roast is not a consomme. In the matter of roast feathered game, the accompanying gravy is supplied by the swilling of the utensil, either with water or a small quantity of brandy. This is a certain means of obtaining a gravy whose savor is precisely that of the game, but occasionally veal gravy is used as its flavor is neutral and it therefore cannot impair the particular flavor of the reduced game gravy lying on the bottom of the utensil. The use of stock prepared from the bones and trimmings of game similar to that constituting the dish is also common. 256. The Dressing and Accompaniments of Roasts As a rule, a roast ought not to wait it ought only to leave the spit or oven in order to be served. All roasts should be placed on very hot dishes, slightly besprinkled with fresh butter, and surrounded by bunches of watercress. This is optional. The gravy is invariably served separately. Roasts of butcher's meat and poultry are dished up as simply as possible. Small roasted game may be dished up on fried slices of bread crumb mashed with a gratin stuffing, number 202. When lemons accompany a roast, they should be served separately. Pieces of lemon that have once served to garnish a dish must not be used, for they have mostly been tainted by grease. The medieval custom of dishing game with the plumage has been abandoned. Roast feathered game a l'anglaise is dished up with or without potato chips, and the three adjuncts are gravy, breadcrumbs, and bread sauce. 
In northern countries, game roasts are always accompanied either by slightly sugared stewed apples or by cherry or apricot jam. 257. Grills Those culinary preparations effected by means of grilling belong to the order called cooking by concentration. And indeed, in almost all cases, the great object of these operations, I might even say the greatest object, is the concentration in the center of the juices and essences which represent most essentially the nutritive principles of the products cooked. A grill, which is in short but a roast on an open fire, stands, in my opinion, as the remote starting point, the very genesis of our art. It was the primeval notion of our forefathers' infantile brains. It was progress born of an instinctive desire to eat with greater pleasure, and it was the first culinary method ever employed. A little later, and following naturally, as it were, upon this first attempt, the spit was born of the grill. Gradually, intelligence supplanted rude instinct. Reason began to deduce effects from supposed causes, and thus cooking was launched forth upon that high road along which it has not yet ceased steadily to advance. Fuel for Grills That mostly used, and certainly the best for the purpose, is live coal or small pieces of charcoal. Whatever fuel be used, however, it is essential that it produce no smoke, even though the grill fire be ventilated by powerful blowers which draw the smoke off. More especially is this necessary, though I admit the contingency is rare, when artificial ventilation has to be effected owing to the fires burning in the open without the usual help of systematic drafts. For if smoke occasioned by foreign substances, or by the falling of the fat itself on to the glowing embers, were not immediately carried away, either artificially or by a convenient draught, the grills would most surely acquire a very disagreeable taste therefrom. The Bed of Charcoal the arrangement of the bed of charcoal under the grill is of some importance, and it must not only be regulated according to the size and kind of the products to be grilled, but also in such wise as to allow of the production of more or less heat under given circumstances. The bed should therefore be set in equal layers in the center but varying in thickness according as to whether the fire has to be more or less fierce. It should also be slightly raised on those sides which are in contact with the air, in order that the whole burning surface may radiate equal degrees of heat. The grill must always be placed over the glowing fuel in advance and it should be very hot when the objects to be grilled are placed upon it. Otherwise, they would stick to the bars and would probably be spoiled when turned. Grills Classified Grills may be divided into four classes, of which each demands particular care. They are 1. Red meat grills, beef and mutton. 2. White meat grills, veal, lamb, poultry, three, fish, four, grills coated with butter and bread crumbs, 258, red meat grills. I submit as a principle that the golden rule in grills is to strictly observe the correct degree of heat which is proper to each treated object never forgetting that the larger and richer in nutrition the piece of meat, the quicker and more thorough must be its initial setting. I have already explained, under brazings, the part played by, and the use of, bristling or setting. 
but it is necessary to revert to this question and its bearing upon grills. If large pieces of meat, beef or mutton, are in question, the better their quality and the richer they are in juices, the more resisting must be the rissoled coating they receive. The pressure of the contained juices upon the rissoled coating of this meat will be proportionately great or small according to whether the latter be rich or poor, and this pressure will gradually increase with the waxing heat. If the grill fire be so regulated as to ensure the progressive penetration of heat into the cooking object, this is what happens. The heat, striking that surface of the meat which is in direct communication with the fire, penetrates the tissues and spreads stratiformly through the body, driving the latter's juices in front of it. When these reach the opposite rissoled or set side of the meat, they are checked, and thereupon, absorbing the incoming heat, affect the cooking of the inner parts. Of course, if the piece of meat under treatment is very thick, the fierceness of the fire should be proportionately abated the moment the initial process of rissoling or setting of the meat's surface has been effected, the object being to allow the heat to penetrate the cooking body more regularly. If the fierceness of the fire were maintained, the rissoled coating on the meat would probably char, and the resulting thickness of carbon would so successfully resist the passage of any heat into the interior that, in the end, while the meat would probably be found to be completely burnt on the outside, the inside would be quite raw. If somewhat thinner pieces are in question, a quick rissling of their surfaces over a fierce fire and a few minutes of subsequent cooking will be all they need. No alteration in the intensity of the fire need be sought in this case. Examples A rump steak or chateaubriand, in order to be properly cooked, should first have its outsides rissoled on a very fierce fire with a view to preserving its juices, after which cooking may proceed over a moderate fire so as to allow of the gradual penetration of the heat into the center of the body. Small pieces, such as tournado, small fillets, noisette, chops, may, after the preliminary process of outside rissling, be cooked over the same degree of heat as affected the latter, because the thickness of meat to be penetrated is less. The care of grills while cooking. Before placing the meats on the grill, baste them slightly with clarified butter, and repeat this operation frequently during the cooking process, so as to avoid the possible drying of the resold surfaces. Grilled red meat should always be turned by means of special tongs, and great care should be observed that its surface be not torn or pierced, lest the object of the preliminary precautions be defeated and the contained juices escape. Time of Cooking This, in the case of red meats, is arrived at by the following test. If, on touching the meat with one's finger, the former resist any pressure, it is sufficiently cooked. If it give, it is clear that, in the center, at least, the reverse is the case. The most certain sign, however, that cooking has been completed is the appearance of little beads of blood upon the rissole surface of the meat. 259 white meat grills. That superficial rissling, which is so necessary in the case of red meats, is not at all so in the case of white, for in the latter there can be no question of the concentration of juices, since these are only present in the form of albumen, 
that is to say, in the form of juices, in the making, so to speak, which is peculiar to veal and lamb. For this kind of grills, keep a moderate fire, so that the cooking and coloring of the meat may take place simultaneously. White meat grills should be fairly often basted by means of a brush with clarified butter while cooking, lest their outsides dry. They are known to be cooked when the juice issuing from them is quite white. 260. Fish Grills Use a moderate fire with these, and only grill after having copiously sprinkled them with clarified butter or oil. Sprinkle them similarly while cooking. A grilled fish is cooked when the bones are easily separated from the meat, except for the fatty kind, such as mackerel, red mullet, or herrings, always roll fish to be grilled in flour before sprinkling them with melted butter. The object of so doing is to give them a golden external crust, which, besides making them more sightly, keeps them from drying. 261. The grilling of products coated with butter and breadcrumbs. These grills generally consist of only small objects. They must be affected on a very moderate fire, with the view of enabling them to cook and acquire color simultaneously. They should also be frequently besprinkled with clarified butter, and turned with care, so as not to break their coating, the object of which is to withhold their contained juices. End of section 16, reading by Malone. Section 17 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1, by Auguste Escoffier, translated by James B. Herndon, Jr. Chapter 10, Part 5, Leading Culinary Operations 262. Fryings Frying is one of the principal cooking processes, for the number of preparations that are accomplished by its means is very considerable. Its procedure is governed by stringent laws and rules which it is best not to break, lest the double danger of failure and impairment of material be incurred. The former is easily averted if one is familiar with the process and pays proper attention to it, while the latter is obviated by precautions which have every raison d'etre and the neglect of which only leads to trouble. The question of the kind of utensil to employ is not so immaterial as some would think, for very often accidents result from the mere disregard of the importance of this matter. Very often, imprudence and bluster on the part of the operator may be the cause of imperfections, the greatest care being needed in the handling of utensils containing overheated fat. Utensils used in frying should be made of copper or other resisting material. They should be in one piece, oval or round in shape, and sufficiently large and deep to allow, while only half filled with fat, of the objects being properly affected by the latter. The necessity of this condition is obvious, seeing that if the utensil contains too much fat, the slightest jerking of it on the stove would spill some of the liquid and the operator would probably be badly burnt. Finally, utensils with vertical sides are preferable to those with the slanting kind. More especially is this so in large kitchens where, the work involving much frying, capacious receptacles are required. 263. Frying Fat, Its Preparation Any animal or vegetable grease is suitable for frying, provided it be quite pure and possess a resisting force allowing it to reach a very high temperature without burning. But for frying on a large scale, the use of cooked and clarified fats, such as the fat of potafu and roasts, should be avoided. A frying medium is only perfect when it is able to meet the demands of a protracted operation and consists of fresh or raw fats, chosen with care and thoroughly purified by cooking. 
under no circumstance may butter be used for frying on a large scale seeing that even when thoroughly purified it can only reach a comparatively low degree of heat it may be used only for small occasional fryings the fat of kidney of beef generally forms the base of the grease intended for frying on a large scale it is preferable to all others on account of its cheapness and the great length of time it can be worked provided it receives the proper care veal fat yields a finer frying medium but its resistance is small and it must moreover always be strengthened with the fat of beef mutton fat should be deliberately discarded for if it happen to be that of an old beast it smells of tallow and if it be that of a young one it causes the hot grease to foam and to overflow down the sides of the utensil this leading to serious accidents pork fat is also used for frying either alone or combined with some other kind in brief the fat of kidney of beef is that which is best suited to fryings on a large scale ordinary household frying which does not demand a very resisting grease may well be effected by means of the above combined with an equal quantity of veal fat or a mixture composed of the fat of kidney of beef veal and pork in the proportions of one half one quarter and one quarter respectively the grease used for frying ought not only to be melted down but also thoroughly cooked so that it may be quite pure if insufficiently cooked it foams on first being used and so demands all kinds of extra precautions which only cease to be necessary when constant heating at last rectifies it moreover if it be not quite pure it easily penetrates immersed solids and makes them indigestible all grease used in frying should first be cut into pieces and then put in the saucepan with one pint of water per every ten pounds the object of the water is to assist in the melting and this it does by filtering into the grease vaporizing and thereby causing the latter to swell so long as the water has not completely evaporated the grease only undergoes the action of liquefaction i e the dissolution of its molecules but its thorough cooking process ending with its purification only begins when all the water is gone the grease is cooked when one the membranes which enveloped it alone remain intact and are converted into greaves two it gives off smoke which has a distinct smell at this stage it has reached such a high temperature that it is best to remove it from the fire for about ten minutes so that it may cool then it must be strained through a sieve or a coarse towel which must be tightly twisted 264 the varying degrees of heat reached by the frying medium and their application the temperature reached by a frying medium depends upon the latter's constituents and its purity the various degrees may be classified as moderately hot hot very hot the expression boiling hot is unsuitable seeing that fat never boils butter an occasional frying medium cannot overreach 248 degrees fahrenheit without burning whereas if it be thoroughly purified it can attain from 269 degrees to 275 degrees fahrenheit a temperature which is clearly below what would be needed for work on a large scale animal greases used in ordinary frying reach from 275 degrees to 284 degrees fahrenheit when moderately hot 320 degrees fahrenheit when hot and 356 degrees fahrenheit when very hot in the last case they smoke slightly pork fat lard when used alone reaches 392 degrees fahrenheit without burning very pure goose dripping withstands 428 degrees fahrenheit and finally vegetable fats may reach without burning 482 degrees fahrenheit in the case of coconut butter 518 degrees Fahrenheit with ordinary oils and 554 degrees in the case of olive oil the temperature of ordinary frying fat may be tested thus it is moderately hot when after throwing a sprig of parsley or a crust of bread into it it begins to bubble immediately it is hot if it crackles when a slightly moist object is thrust into it it is very hot when it gives off a thin white smoke perceptible to the smell the first temperature moderately hot is used one for all products containing vegetable water the complete evaporation of which is necessary two 
for fish whose volume exacts a cooking process by means of penetration previous to that with concentration in the first degree of heat with which it is used the frying fat therefore only effects a kind of preparatory operation the second temperature hot is used for all products which have previously undergone an initial cooking process in the first temperature either for evaporation or penetration and its object is either to finish them or to cover them with a crimped coating it is also applicable to these products upon which the frying fat must act immediately by concentration that is to say by forming a set coating around them which prevents the escape of the contained substances objects treated with this temperature are all those paniers à l'anglais or covered with batter such as various croquettes cromequis cutlets and crullups à la vie roy fritters of all kinds fried creams etc in this case the frying medium acts by a setting which in certain cases is exceedingly necessary one if the objects in question are pane à l'anglais i e dipped into beaten eggs and rolled in bread crumbs the sudden contact of the hot grease converts this coating of egg and bread crumbs into a resisting crust which prevents the escape of the substances and the liquefied sauce contained within if these objects were plunged in a fat that was not sufficiently hot the coating of eggs and bread crumbs would not only imbibe the frying medium but it would run the risk of breaking thereby allowing the escape of the very substances it was intended to withhold two the same holds with objects treated with batter hence the absolute necessity of ensuring that setting which means that the covering of batter solidifies immediately as the substance constituting these various dishes are cooked in advance it follows that their second heating and the coloring of the coating egg and bread crumbs or batter take place at the same time and in a few minutes the third temperature very hot is used one for all objects that need a sharp and firm setting two for all small objects the setting of which is of supreme importance and whose cooking is effected in a few minutes as in the case of white bait 265 frying medium for fish every frying medium used for work on a large scale which has acquired a too decided coloring through repeated use may serve in the preparation of fish even until its whole strength is exhausted oil is best suited to the frying of fish especially the very small kind owing to the tremendous heat it can withstand without burning for this heat guarantees that setting which is so indispensable except in this case however the temperature of the frying medium should be regulated strictly in accordance with the size of the fish to be fried in order that its cooking and coloring may be effected simultaneous except nonance and white bait which are simply rolled in flour fish to be fried are previously steeped in a slightly salted milk then rolled in flour from this combination of milk and flour there results a crisp coating which withholds the particular principles that the fish exudes while cooking when finished fried fish are drained dried slightly salted and dished on a serviette or on paper with a garnish of fried parsley sprays and the sections of channeled lemon 266 the quantity of the frying medium this should always be in proportion to the quantity or size of the objects to be fried bearing in mind that these must always be entirely submerged without necessarily exaggerating the quantity should invariably be rather in excess of the requirements and for this reason viz the greater amount of the fat the higher will be the temperature reached and the less need one fear of sudden cooling of the fat when the objects to be treated are immersed this sudden cooling is often the cause of great trouble unless one be working over a fire of such fierceness that the fat can be returned in a few seconds to the temperature it was at before the objects were immersed 267 the care of the frying medium every time a frying fat is used it should after having been melted be strained through a towel for the majority of objects which it has served to cook must have left some particles behind them which might prove prejudicial to the objects that are to follow objects that are panier always leave some raspings for instance which in time assume the form of black powder while those that have been treated with flour likewise drop some of their coating which in accumulating produces a muddy precipitate on the bottom of the utensil 
not only do these foreign substances disturb the clearness of the fat and render it liable to burn but they are exceedingly detrimental to the objects that are treated later therefore always strain the fat whenever it is used in the first place because the proper treatment of the objects demands it and secondly because its very existence as a serviceable medium depends upon this measure 268 gratins this culinary operation plays a sufficiently important part in the work to warrant my detailing at least its leading points the various kinds of the order gratins are the one complete gratin two the rapid gratin three the light gratin four glazing which is a form of rapid gratin 269 complete gratin this is the first example of the series it is that whose preparation is the longest and most tiresome for its principal constituent whatever this is must be completely cooked its cooking must moreover be coincident with the reduction of the sauce which is the base of the gratin and with the formation of the gratin proper i e the crimped crust which forms on the surface and is the result of the combination of the sauce with the raspings and the butter under the direct influence of the heat in the preparation of complete gratin two things must be taken into account one the nature and size of the object to be treated and two the degree of heat which must be used in order that the cooking of the object the reduction of the sauce and the formation of the gratin may be effected simultaneously the base of complete gratin is most invariably ordinary or latin duxel sauce number 223 in accordance with the requirements the object to be treated with the gratin is laid on a buttered dish surrounded with slices of raw mushrooms and chopped shallots and covered with the duxel sauce the surface is then sprinkled with raspings and copiously moistened with melted butter should the piece be large the amount of sauce used will be proportionally greater and the reverse of course applies to medium or smaller sizes take note of the following remarks in the making of complete gratins one if too much sauce were used in proportion to the size of the object the latter would cook in the gratin form before the sauce could reach the correct degree of consistence by means of reduction hence it would be necessary to reduce the sauce still further on the stove and thereby give rise to steam which would soften the coating of the gratin two if the sauce used were insufficient it would be reduced before the cooking of the object had been effected and more sauce having to be added the resulting gratin would be uneven three the larger the piece and consequently the longer it takes to cook the more moderate should be the heat used conversely the smaller it is the fiercer the fire should be when withdrawing the gratin from the oven squeeze a few drops of lemon juice over it and besprinkle it with chopped parsley 270 rapid gratin proceed as above with duxel sauce but the products treated with it viz meat fish or vegetable are always cooked and warmed in advance all that is required therefore is to effect the formation of the gratin as quickly as possible to do this cover the object under treatment with the necessary quantity of salt be sprinkled with raspings and butter and set the gratin to form in a fierce oven 271 light gratin this is proper to farinaceous products such as macaroni lasagnas noodles gnocchi etc and consists of a combination of grated cheese raspings and butter in this case again the only end in view is the formation of the gratin coating which must be evenly colored and is the result of the cheese melting a moderate heat is all that is wanted for this kind of gratin also considered as light gratins are those which serve as the complement of stuffed vegetables such as tomatoes mushrooms eggplant and cucumber with these the gratin is composed of raspings sprinkled with butter or oil and it is placed in more or less fierce heat according to whether the vegetables have already been cooked or partially cooked or are quite raw 273 glazings these are of two kinds they either consist of a heavily buttered sauce or they form from the sprinkling of cheese upon the sauce with which the object to be glazed is covered in the first case after having poured sauce over the object to be treated place the dish on another dish containing a little water this is to prevent the sauce decomposing and boiling the greater the quantity of butter used the more intense will be the heat required in order that a slight golden film may form almost instantaneously 
in the second case the sauce used is always a mornay number 91 cover the object under treatment with the sauce besprinkle with grated cheese and melted butter and place in fairly intense heat so that a slight golden crust may form almost immediately this crust being the result of the combined cheese and butter 273 blanchings the essentially unsuitable term blanchings is applied in the culinary technology of france to three classes of operations which entirely differ one from the other in the end they have in view one the blanching of meats two the blanching or better the parboiling of certain vegetables three the blanching of certain other vegetables which in reality amounts to a process of cooking the blanching of meats obtained mostly in the case of calf's head and foot and the sweet bread of veal sheep's and lamb's trotters and lamb's sweet bread these meats are first set to soak in cold running water until they have quite got rid of the blood with which they are naturally saturated they are then placed on the fire in a saucepan containing enough cold water to abundantly cover them and the water is gradually brought to a boil for calf's head or feet boiling may last for fifteen or twenty minutes veal sweet bread must not boil for more than ten or twelve minutes while lamb sweet bread is withdrawn the moment boil is reached as soon as blanched the meats are cooled in plenty of fresh water before undergoing their final treatment the blanching of cock's combs is exceptional in this namely that after the combs have been cleansed of blood that is to say soaked in cold water they are placed on the fire in cold water the temperature of which must be carefully kept below 113 degrees fahrenheit when this degree is approached take the saucepan off the fire and rub each comb with a cloth dusted with table salt in order to remove the skins then cool the combs with fresh water before cooking them many people use the blanching process with means intended for blanquette or fricassee i regard this procedure as quite erroneous as also the preliminary soaking in cold water if the meats or pieces of poultry intended for the above mentioned preparations be of good quality and no others should be used they need only be set to cook in cold water or cold stock and gradually brought to the boil being stirred repeatedly the while the scum formed should be carefully removed and in this way perfectly white meats and stock with all their savour are obtained as to meats or pieces of poultry of an inferior quality no soaking and no blanching can make good their defects whichever way they are treated they remain dry gray and savorless it is therefore simpler and better to use only the finest quality goods an excellent proof of the futility of soaking and blanching meats intended for fricassees and blanquettes lies in the fact that these very meats if of good quality are always perfectly white when they are braised poilled or roasted notwithstanding the fact that these three operations are less calculated to preserve their whiteness than the kind of treatment they are subjected to in the case of blanquettes and fricassees mere routine alone can account for this practice of soaking and blanching meats a practice that is absolutely condemned by common sense the term blanching is wrongly applied to cooking of green vegetables such as french beans green beans brussels sprouts spinach and etc the cooking of these which is effected by means of boiling salt water thought really to be termed a l'anglais all the details of the procedure however will be given when i deal with the vegetables to which the latter apply lastly under the name of blanching there exists another operation which consists in partly cooking certain vegetables in plenty of water in order to rid them of any bitter or pungent flavor they may possess the time allowed for this blanching varies according to the age of the vegetables but when the latter are young and in season it amounts to little more than a mere scalding blanching is chiefly resorted to for lettuce chicory endives celery artichokes cabbages and the green vegetables carrots turnips and small onions when they are out of season in respect of vegetable marrows cucumbers and chow chow blanching is often left to the definite cooking process which should then come under the head of the a l'anglais cooking after the process of blanching the vegetables i have just enumerated are always cooled that is to say steeped in cold water until they are barely lukewarm they are then left to drain on a sieve previous to undergoing the final cooking process to which they are best suited this generally being braising end of section 17
Section 18 of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Meilinger. A Guide to Modern Cookery, Part 1, by August Escoffier. Translated by James B. Herdron, Jr. Chapter 10. Leading Culinary Operations, Part 6 vegetables and garnishes various preparations 274 the treatment of dry vegetables it is wrong to soak dry vegetables if they are of good quality and the produce of the year they need only be put into a saucepan with enough cold water to completely cover them and with one ounce of salt per five quarts of water set to boil gently skim Add the aromatic garnish, quartered carrots, onions, with or without garlic cloves, and the faggots, and set to cook gently with lid on. Remarks If the vegetables used are old or inferior in quality, they might be put to soak in soft water, but this only long enough to swell them slightly, that is, about one and one half hours. A prolonged soaking of dry vegetables may give rise to incipient germination, and this, by impairing the principles of the vegetables, depreciates the value of the food, and may even cause some harm to the consumer. 275. Braised Vegetables Vegetables to be braised must be first blanched, cooled, pared, and strung. Garnish the bottom of a saucepan with blanched pork rind, sliced carrots and onions, and a faggot, and cover the sides of the utensil with thin slices of bacon. Lay the vegetables upon the prepared litter, and leave them to sweat in the oven for about ten minutes with lid on. The object of this over-sweating is to expel the water. Now, moisten enough to cover with white stock, and set to cook gently. This done, drain, remove string, and cut to the shape required. Lay them in a sauté pan, and, if they are to be served soon, cover them with their reduced stock from which the grease has been removed. If they are prepared in advance, simply put them aside in suitable basins, cover them with their cooking liquor, which should be strained over them, boiling, and without its grease removed, and cover with buttered paper. Adjunct to braised vegetables According to the case, the adjunct is either the braising liquor, reduced and with all grease removed, or the same completed by means of an addition of meat glaze. Occasionally, it may be the braising liquor slightly thickened with half glaze and finished with butter and the juice of a lemon. 276. Leason of green vegetables with butter. First, thoroughly drain the vegetables and toss them over the fire for a few minutes in order to completely rid them of their moisture. Season according to the kind of vegetable, add the butter away from the fire, and slightly toss, rolling the saucepan meanwhile on the stove, with the view of effecting the leason by means of the mixing of the butter with the treated vegetables. 277. Leason of Vegetables with Cream Vegetables to be treated in this way must be kept somewhat firm. After having thoroughly drained them, Put them into a saucepan with enough boiling fresh cream to well moisten without covering them. Finish their cooking process in the cream, stirring occasionally the while. When the cream is almost entirely reduced, finish, away from the fire, with a little butter. The leason may be slightly stiffened, if necessary, by means of a few tablespoonfuls of cream sauce. 278. Vegetable Cream and Purees Purees of dry and farinaceous vegetables may be obtained by rubbing the latter through a sieve. Put the puree into a sauté pan, and dry it over a brisk fire, adding one and one half ounce of butter per pint of puree. Then add milk or cream in small quantities at a time, until the puree has reached the required degree of consistence. For purees of aqueous vegetables, such as French beans, cauliflowers, celery, etc., a quarter of their volume of mashed potatoes should be added to them in order to effect their leason. In the case of vegetable creams, 
substitute for the thickening of mashed potatoes an equivalent quality of succulent and stiff bechamel sauce. 279. Garnishes In cookery, although garnishes only play a minor part, they are nevertheless very important, for, besides being the principal accompaniments to dishes, they are very often the adornment thereof, while it frequently happens that their harmonious arrangement considerably helps to throw the beauty of a fine joint or bird into relief. A garnish may consist of one or more products. Be this as it may, its name, as a rule, distinctly denotes in a word what it is and how it is made. In any case, it should always bear some relation to the piece it accompanies, either in the constituents of its preparation, or with regard to the size of the piece constituting the dish. I merely add that, since the constituents of garnishes are strictly denoted by the name the letter bear, any addition of products foreign to their nature would be a grave mistake. Likewise, the omission of any constituent is to be avoided, as the garnish would thereby be out of keeping with its specified character. Only in very exceptional circumstances should any change of this kind be allowed to take place. The constituents of garnishes are supplied by vegetables, farinaceous products, quenelles of all kinds, coxcombs and kidneys, truffles and mushrooms, plain or stuffed olives, mollusks, mussels or oysters, shellfish, crayfish, shrimps, lobster, etc., butcher's supplies, such as lamb's sweetbread, calf's brains, and calf's spine marrow. As a rule, garnishes are independent of the dish itself. That is to say, they are prepared entirely apart. At other times, they are mixed with it, playing the double part of garnish and condimentary principle, as in the case of metalodes, compotes, civets, etc., Vegetables for garnishing are fashioned and treated in accordance with the use and shape implied by the name of the dish, which should be always the operator's guide in this respect. The farinaceous ones, the mollusks and shellfish, undergo the customary preparation. I have already described, chapter 10, the preparation of quenelles and forcemeats for garnishing. Other recipes which have the same purpose will be treated in their respective order. End of section 18. End of A Guide to Modern Cookery, Le Guide Culinaire, Part 1, by August Escoffier. Translated by James B. Herdron, Jr.